and we will coordinate this and pass out all these responsibilities uh, sometime after the meeting. All right, on to approval of the minutes. Let's start with item 12.1. Any updates or corrections? Seeing none, we will adopt those. Item 12.2, the December 10th meeting minutes. Any additions, corrections, adjustments? Seeing none, we'll adopt those. December 17th meeting minutes. Any additions, corrections? Seeing none, we'll adopt those. And then the special meeting minutes of December 20th. Any additions, corrections? Seeing none, we will adopt those also. Interesting uh, challenge here. Um, you know what I'm gonna do is we're gonna take a five minute recess. We'll take public comment. Uh, let the public comment on non-agenda items speak first and then we'll go right to the climate emergency resolution item 15.1, five minute recess.
Okay, we'll reconvene the Santa Rosa City Council meeting. We'll be on item 14, public comment on non-agenda matters. Again, we have more than 10 cards, so only the first 10 uh, will be making comments. And again, you have options of either space up there or down below here, we now have a live mic. So up first will be Dwayne DeWitt, followed by Brian Guerrero. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt, I'm from Roseland. I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Basically, it's about my concern that the Open Government Task Force recommendations from years ago have not really been adopted by you folks, and that the draft for the Sunshine Ordinance has been sitting languishing, if you will, for years, while we here in the community have been trying to make sure we can get as much information as we can to make sure and be a part of a deliberate public policy decision-making process where we in the community who are the taxpayers and are the residents affected by these decisions actually get to have a choice and be a part of what is occurring. I bring this up because I had wanted to do some other items that are on the agenda later. And when we came in to try to get information, it wasn't in files. We couldn't find it. It was difficult. And then, near the ending of the time when things needed to be turned in, City Hall was closed on Friday. It used to be that you had 72 hours before an item to be heard on Tuesday, in which you could come in on Friday, get the information, find out what was occurring, and be able to put your statements in in a timely manner. People found that when they wanted to put statements in, they had to wait until Monday, and when they came in on Monday, they were told things need to be turned in earlier. Well, then open up on Friday, or even better, make it like the Open Government Task Force had stated, have things available even earlier, a week to 10 days earlier, so that people can actually be a part of what is occurring. Right now, it seems like this is a bit of a pro forma activity. You just check off a box and say, okay, someone was here, we heard that, that's done. That's not what it's about, especially under the California Environmental Quality Act. For that, you need to have us be a part of the process with you. It's called authentic community engagement. You bring the people into the process. They do participatory democracy. I'd like to see you actually do participatory budgeting so that we get to be a part of how the money is spent. You take the tax dollars, you say to a community, we have these needs. How would you in the community like these needs to be addressed? Participatory budgeting has been happening all over the nation and close by here in Vallejo. People from that city came here in the past to discuss that process and said it could be possible here, but you folks have sat on it. You haven't let it go forward. So I'm asking you to tonight to let us participate, not just in these meetings, but in participatory budgeting in the future for the future of our youth, not us old guys, for the young people and what they need in their future and also participatory, authentic community engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Guerrero followed by Vanessa Andrade. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Brian Reyes Guerrero and I come from Rosalind University Prep. And I would first like to thank you for taking the time to listen to ideas me and my classmates present. Today I will be talking about how less school hours can improve students' efficiency in school. And let's say you were in our position, having to juggle work, family matters, relationships, and to top it all off, school. Barely getting enough sleep because of stress and time consumption. If you had the opportunity, to choose your own school hours, wouldn't you want to have shorter hours to get enough sleep and have time in the day for these other important things? Uh, today, I will talk about how less school hours can actually help improve students' work and effectiveness greatly. According to kqed.org, students have shown that middle and high school students with adequate amounts of sleep, which is eight to 10 hours, have better test scores, meaning students will achieve better test scores if they get enough sleep and they connect cannot get enough sleep if students' school hours start as early as seven. 
Uh, not just hours should be shortened though. While it will improve students' performance greatly, they will still be working many hours. School days should also be limited to shorter weeks like four day school days instead of five. This will give students more time to rest and recharge for the next time they have to go to school and their performance will be significantly higher. According to a study by Georgia State University, there's little evidence that moving to a four day week compromises student academic achievement. An important finding for US school districts seeking ways to cut costs without hampering student achievement, which means that by moving in a four day school week will not only give students more time to rest, but will actually cut costs for school districts, which means more money distributed to the staff and student events. So if the four day school week improves student school performance and cut costs, there's really no reason to implement this new and improved system as soon as possible. Students' lives don't just revolve around school, as we all probably know. We have jobs, chores to do, and we need to take care of brothers and sisters. We barely have enough time to complete all of that, and even less time to actually enjoy all our hard work. Other countries know this too, like China and India, and according to the insider.com, a Pew Research poll found that the U.S. still falls behind other countries in terms of reading, math, and science course. And these countries have lots of hours left for other important things to recharge for the next time they have to go to school. While there may be some repercussions when it comes to shorter school hours and weeks, it is ultimately better um, for the students to get adequate amounts of sleep and learn more than to lose sleep and learn less. I, for one, would definitely welcome shorter hours as I have to take care of my two little brothers and work during the rest of the day. Once again, I thank you for your time and I hope you consider the positives of shorter school hours. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Vanessa Andrade, followed by Daniel Ruiz. There's a little switch on the side if you want to lower the podium a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Vanessa Mendoza, and I'm gonna be talking about why college should be free. I believe that college should be free for all students because everyone has the right to an education. Free college will increase college's enrollment, persistent, and completion rates, which is a positive aspect. Unfortunately, students with the best grades and test scores with a low income are the ones who aren't able to, go to afford to go to the best schools because of the cost. The average cost to attend an in-state public college is over $10,000 per year, and for a private college is $36,000 to, to, $36, to $50,000 or more a year. In fact, the cost of going to a four-year university has increased by 1,122% 1 since 1978. According to Student Debt Relief.us, in 1978, a student at a four-year public university could earn a enough in a minimum wage summer job to pay tuition. In 1988, the average cost was $3,190. In today's society, it would take more than a year to make enough money to pay back their debt. If students were in such a massive debt, once they graduate, they could be contributing more to the economy by buying houses and buying cars, etc. Having free college will allow students to focus on their education rather than worrying about whether they would be able to pay for the next year of school or if they would be able to just pay off all their tuition. The New York Times.com says that 44 million Americans hold $1.5 trillion in debt and that the students who graduated last year borrowed an average of $29,000. One of the reasons why students tend to drop out of college is out of college is because they're afraid of their debt, and even after they drop out, they still aren't able to pay it off. Students' debt is an average of $30,000, $30,000, and even sometimes of $100,000. Students who are stuck at taking loans and working in a part-time or full-time job is more likely that they wouldn't get their degree because of the amount of stress from balancing work and school. I believe that it is unfair that a student graduates with debt when they most likely haven't even had the chance to get their life and job started. Having free college would even allow the students to try to and explore different majors and figure out what profession, profession 
they would enjoy doing without being stressed on whether if they don't like a certain major they're taking, the money wouldn't go straight to the trash. Free college would open up more opportunities for others, especially those who are less fortunate, and give them the chance they deserve to a great education, as well as allowing students who graduate the chance to start their future slowly without stress. Thank you. Daniel Rees, followed by Ann Seeley. All right. Well, my name is Daniel Rees, and I am a student at RUP, and I'm here to talk about why a speech class should be one of a common one, a common core class for throughout school. And throughout my life, I've been terrified of public speaking, and right now, my heart is racing just talking to you guys. And studies have actually shown that people are more afraid of public speaking than death. And if I'm being honest, death doesn't sound like a bad idea right now. <laughs> I know public speaking isn't going to go any anywhere anytime soon, and I know when I go off to college, I'm gonna public speak. And I also know I'm not the only one with these kinds of thoughts and fears. But I also know that I'm able, that me and everyone else are capable of adapting to public speaking. And that's why I believe that, I, that's why I believe public speaking should be a part of a common core class starting since fourth grade. Throughout your school years, you don't really engage in public speaking. And so that's why you're not really used to it. And there are many jobs that require you to public speak, like being a council member or being a lawyer or giving a presentation to the office for your new big idea. Some jobs might not even have public speaking, but you have or will encounter those kinds of situations in your life. And when you do, it is going to be frightening. If we add speech as a common core class, that fear of us going to give a presentation won't affect us as much as it does right now. And if we engage on public speaking to the students at an early age, public speaking to them will be as easy as talking to one of their friends. Many jobs that require one to public speak won't find them as much anymore because they'll have an understanding and will gain confidence to defend their clients, talk in front of the people of the city, or win over their bosses with their new ideas. And finally, people won't have to imagine the audience naked to get through the presentations anymore. Thank you. Nice job, Daniel, thank you. Ann Seeley, followed by Teresa Bruner. Council members, this is a delightful addition. Thank you for doing this. I'm here to speak to you about something unexpected. I work in an eye doctor's office, and the critical discussion often gets down to, can you read street signs? And I have, over the years, uh, I'm aging, like everybody, and I, my vision's really good, but I still have great difficulty reading some of our street signs. There's no reason why a street sign has to be limited to being 10 inches long and three inches tall. I think it would be a great benefit to a lot of people and maybe allow for fewer traffic accidents when people are slowing to look for street signs and, and get rear-ended. If they could be increased somewhat, uh, it adds a little bit of metal. It, you know, it requires changing a standard, but I think it would be an extremely helpful thing for our city to do. Thank you. Thank you. Teresa Bruner followed by Alyssa Garcia. Hi everyone, my name is Teresa Bruner and I am a new resident to Santa Rosa. Uh, I, I've lived here about two years now. And I'm here to just address some questions I have on our homeless situation. I wanna know who's going to run the houses that will be purchased? Uh, how is that going to be put in place 
when is it going to get put in place? Are the, the tenants, will there be protection for the tenants who live in these homes? Because it sounds to me like it's co-housing. And in co-housing situations, who's to determine who those residents are? And how do we get to that step? There's, there's other bills that we need to think about in this housing situation. Utilities, property taxes, food, um, just common daily things that, that an individual needs to live their life. Has anyone on this panel gone down to the homeless communities and asked who's gonna take advantage of these services that, that will be provided? What's the percentage of that? Are we putting all of our eggs in one basket? M one of my major concerns, especially with the housing, being in neighborhoods, uh, will there be, um, uh, because it was broadcast that, that the drug and alcohol situation would be an issue. Well, if it's an issue, do the residents in the, in, in the co-housing situation, do they get to continue to abuse drugs and alcohol? I know that, I know that there are plans to help with drug addiction and, and alcoholism, but when is that gonna be put in place? These things have to happen all together. Um, and, and one last thing, uh, um, the Barbie Robinson um, seems exhausted. She probably needs a little help with allocating and, and while I'm not that person, someone should step up. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. And just to clarify for everyone in the chamber and listening, um, the city of Santa Rosa is not purchasing any homes or running any homes um, that is being discussed at the County of Sonoma <laughs> regarding some properties within the city limits of Santa Rosa, but not being run by the city of Santa Rosa or purchased by the city of Santa Rosa. So we have Alyssa Garcia followed by Stephanie Guzman. Well, my name is Alyssa Garcia. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I don't have a script today because I just would like to basically say how I feel. Um, I am 16 years old and if I can see this, I hope that all of you can. Um, our community here in Santa Rosa is like a family. We all like love each other and we try to help each other. So I would think that for those who aren't as fortunate enough to be able to have a house or buy food, that we can all consider them as one of us because we could be in their shoes at some point. Um, I understand that there are shelters being made and that we are trying, or you are trying your best to help, but it's overpopulated. Homelessness is not, you can't create one shelter to house the many that are homeless. And I feel that we need to step up and really advocate for them because they need, they need their voices to be heard. Um, if maybe this, the trash that they leave behind is a problem, then there should be um, access to like being able to pay them or a little like just a little bit so that they can get off their feet so they can understand that we really are there to help them and that they are being heard. Like, I feel like when people walk by them, they just walk by and ignore them. Like, they, they don't exist, and they really do. Like, I, if I can see it, I know many other people can see it, and I know that we're in our own lives and we're busy and we have school and we have work and we have families, but they're like, their lives matter, and I just, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie Guzman, followed by Raul Gallardo.
Hi, my name is Stephanie Guzman, and I'm here to talk about homelessness today. Um, in California alone, there are about 13,000 homeless in the United States. Um, there are about 550,000 homeless. Homeless um, occurs from the lack of employment, affordable housing, and needed services such as benefits for those in need. I feel like so we can um, help the homeless um, get off their feet and just do something and be active if we were to like take them to clean a park and like under like circ under supervision and pay them a little so they can start making somewhat of money they don't have to be asking people and scaring people away and asking them for money or for food I also for example by Stony Point Road on the walk space there there's a good variety of homeless and homeless shelters so I feel like there should be more homeless shelters for pe for the homeless and they should be able to get a chance and be heard and have a voice in what they want to be um, said. And I feel like we should just try and make a change for that and help the homeless out. Thank you. Thank you. Raul Gallardo followed by Esa Casse. Uh, do I start? Go ahead. My name is Raul Gallardo, and I'm here today to discuss about a topic that I think is of high importance because of its effects upon the Santa Rosa people and the city itself. The problem I came here to discuss is homelessness. You might think it's, that homelessness is not much of a problem, and your assumptions might be correct if it did not reach the sheer size that it is at now. California is, has one of the highest concentration of homeless people in the United States. Think of that. We're one of the richest, richest country, states in the, in the world. Yeah, we can't tackle a problem this like this. It just it's kind of shameful. Like for example, the Joe Road and Trail, a place where that we're all familiar with, just being west of Stony Point Road, is a main example of the homeless how homeless how homelessness can affect the city and its people. Over the few weeks, the trial has grown up to more than 100 tents, making a small little town of people with no homes. This causes problems almost instantly, as the unsanctioned camps is rift with health and safety issues, including the spread of untreated human waste and garbage stirred, stirred around the area. This also has an effect on nearby business, nearby business, businesses, as homeless people have been seen doing drugs in broad daylight and even throwing bottles of urine in people's backyards. This, respect, this reflects badly on our community that we have worked so hard to keep beautiful. It scares people, that were ra scares people away rather, rather than walking through that trail and they just avoid it entirely. It doesn't show the passion behind our city and people who rely on that trail to get to their jobs have no choice but to find a different way. This also causes an increase in cost to the police department as people have seen more drug use, obstinate behavior and unsanitary conditions in the camp. And in addition, it has gone, gone there's been a spike in reported conflicts between homeless people and trail users. But how did homelessness get this bad in the first place. Homelessness has always been a complex problem, but it became even worse problem with the rampant spread of fires, destroying more than 5,300 5, homes, leaving people without houses and unable to buy new ones because of the high cost of, of, high cost of homes. Some solutions to this homeless problem could be like making the fairgrounds into a temporary shelter so we can keep a close eye on them and try to keep them back on their feet, or implementing permanent supportive housing that has shown, been shown to not only resolve homelessness and increase housing stability, but also improve health and lower public costs by reducing the use of public fund crisis services, including shelters, hospitals, psychiatric centers, jails, and prisons. This crisis won't be an instant process. It's not something that we can that can be dealt dealt with overnight, as it will need immediate and long-term strategies to combat it. It's going to be a hard task, but if we get the help of community organizations, county, it does. Okay. Thanks, Raul. Uh, Esa Kase. Hi, my name is Esa Kase, and I'm a student at Roseland University Prep, and I came here today to talk about global warming. Global warming is a term almost everyone is familiar with but its meaning is still not clear to most of us. Global warming refers to the gradual rise in the overall temperature of the atmosphere of the Earth. 
There are various activities taking place which have been increasing the temperature gradually. Global warming is melting our ice glaciers rapidly. This is extremely harmful to the earth as well as human beings ourselves. It is quite challenging to control global warming. However, it isn't unmanageable. The first, step, the first step in solving any problem is identifying the cause of the problem. Therefore, we need to first understand the causes of global warming that will help us proceed further in solving it. Global warming has become a grave problem which needs undivided attention. It isn't happening because of a single cause, but several causes. These causes are both natural as well as man-made. The natural causes include the release of greenhouse gases, which are not able to escape from Earth, causing the temperature to increase. Furthermore, volcanic eruptions are more also responsible for global warming. That is to say, these eruptions release tons of carbon dioxide, which contributes to global warming. Similarly, methane is also one big issue responsible for global warming. After that, the excessive use of automobiles and fossil fuels results in increased levels of carbon dioxide. Activities like mining and cattle rearing are very harmful for the environment. One of the most common issues that are taking place rapidly now is deforestation. Global warming can be stopped when combined efforts are put in. For that, individuals and governments both have to take steps forwards towards achieving it. We must begin with the reduction of greenhouse gas. Furthermore, they need to monitor the consumption of gasoline, switch to a hybrid car, and reduce the release of carbon dioxide. Moreover, citizens can choose public transport or carpool together. Subsequently, recycling must also be encouraged. In short, all of us must realize the fact that our earth is not well. It needs, to, it needs treatment and we can help it heal. The present generation must take up the responsibility of stopping global warming in order to prevent the suffering of future generations. Therefore, every little step, no matter how small, carries a lot of weight and is quite significant in stopping global warming. Thank you. All right, those are the first 10 uh, cars on non-agenda items. Uh, we'll resume this if there are folks that want to make con uh, comments once we hit item 18 on tonight's agenda. So Mr. McGlynn, item 15.1. Item 15.1, report climate emergency resolution. David Guin, Assistant City Manager, presenting. Good evening, David Guin, Assistant City Manager, as the City Manager mentioned. And tonight we are bringing forward a climate emergency resolution. And with me is Amy Nicholson, who is our Senior Planner with the Planning and Economic Development Department, who's gonna co-present with me. So a little bit of background on this item. Uh, this, this resolution was brought forth, uh, the, con the issue about uh, climate emergency resolution was brought forth to our Climate Action Subcommittee. Um, and that was, it was recommended from that subcommittee to bring to this body. And I'll talk a little bit about how that happened. Uh, but first, back in February of 2019, the council recognized uh, the climate action plan as a tier one priority and set that as a tier one goal. Um, for, first thing that happened was a subcommittee was formed from that, uh, that uh, has three council members on that subcommittee. That subcommittee has met multiple times over the past year. Um, the subcommittee's goal was to provide guidance and oversight to the implementation of the city's municipal climate action plan and the community climate action plan that we have in place. Uh, just to, uh, for the people in the audience and people listening, um, the next subcommittee meeting that we'll talk about uh, many of these items um, are, is on January 29th at 4 p.m. in this chamber. Um, so those are regular scheduled meetings and information on the subcommittees uh, can be found at src.org slash CAS for Climate Action Subcommittee. Uh, since that subcommittee was formed, uh, the, the subcommittee talked about a number of issues. The all electric reach code which, that was brought forward to this body and approved unanimously. Uh, the other two items that were discussed were looking at evergreen, uh, moving to a, um, a reducing greenhouse gases through energy purchase, um, and zero waste initiatives. And both those items are coming forth to the city council on January 28th. That's the next council meeting um, here to have that conversation, but the subcommittee had that conversation in this room in a public setting and, and is recommending that to the full council. So the item tonight before you uh, was talked about on September 3rd. Uh, the subcommittee um, heard about the different approaches to create a climate action or a climate resolution. Uh, one of the things that happened was that there was the RCPA, Regional Climate Protection Agency, was in the process of creating a regional template to take a regional approach to this issue. Uh, that was happening actually two days after our meeting. And so what came out of that subcommittee was to see how the Regional Climate Protection Agency voted on that item 
was there a regional approach that could be agreed upon? And if a template was to, um, created to bring that template back, uh, fill it out, bring that template back to this full council to act on. And so that's what we brought for you, forward to you tonight. And I'm gonna turn it over to Amy to walk through what that uh, resolution looks like. Thank you. So I'd just like to go into a little bit of background um, about the Regional Climate Protection Authority, uh, or RCPA. They were formed in 2009 to coordinate countywide action on climate protection. RCPA's mission is up on the screen, but essentially it's to coordinate local governments in their effort to address climate change so that um, we can be efficient and, and bold in fighting um, the climate crisis. As David mentioned, RCPA identified continuing areas of concern uh, at their board meeting back in September, and those items are listed in their resolution that was adopted by the RCPA board uh, during that meeting. So that resolution includes input from the board members themselves and also uh, members of the public. And the resolution that is before you this evening is built off of that template. So specifically, the resolution before you would commit the city to um, the four bulleted items on the screen. First is to work with RCPA on the 2030 Climate Emergency Mobilization Strategy. Uh, this is envisioned to be a set of policies which would reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, just to clarify, the city's climate action plan is a separate and distinct document from this strategy. In addition, the proposed resolution would commit the city to reevaluating policies through the lens of a climate emergency, to educate employees and residents about the climate crisis, and also to identify a climate emergency liaison, which uh, is described in the staff report as potentially an existing city employee. In addition, adopting the resolution would call for ongoing efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emission reduction through implementation, continued implementation of the Climate Action Subcommittee and the work of all city departments in implementing our existing climate action plans. The resolution also specifies that any commitment of additional funds or staffing would be considered through the City Council's priority setting and budget process later this year. And uh, just for everyone's information, um, Petaluma, Windsor, Cloverdale, Sebastopol, Healdsburg, Katahdi, and the County of Sonoma have recently adopted climate emergency resolutions. The proposed action before you is exempt from the provisions of the California Environmental Quality Act, uh, pursuant to the two sections uh, listed up there on the slide in that implementation of this action wouldn't have a significant detrimental effect on the environment. Um, city staff members have received a number of public comments related to this item, um, many in support of the city adopting a climate emergency resolution um, and and quite a few comments um, addressed having some additional points put into the climate emergency resolution and, and they included those as an attachment to the written correspondence. Um, so with that, it is recommended by the Climate Action Subcommittee that the council by resolution declare a climate emergency and endorse the mobilization to restore a safe climate. And we are happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks for the presentation. Council, questions for staff? See none, do we have any cards on this item? Okay, uh, first up would be Dwayne DeWitt, followed by Jane Bender. It's okay. Can you put up the clock, please? Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland, where we do believe in urban forestry. And in your packet tonight, number 21, in the big uh, pre-produced statements that are in there, is an idea of urban forestry, and they use the city of Minneapolis, Minnesota, to point out that a variety of studies have shown 
that by having trees by a building or in a neighborhood, you get less crime and you also get better greenhouse gas sequestration. They have found in their city that by having those trees, the investment is doubled on the return. So one of the things that's really important is here in Santa Rosa, we used to be a tree city, but we've been cutting trees down with abandon and not replacing them. We've been cutting down the trees that do the best carbon sequestration, which are redwood trees and valley oak trees. I tried to save a valley oak the other day. I didn't have the hundred bucks that it takes to appeal. The planner said it's okay to cut it down because it touched a building rather than just taking off one of the branches. I think if you folks are gonna be so serious that you're gonna pass a climate emergency resolution, you need to put it here on the ground in our town. Walk your talk, not just pass something and then say later days and not get back to it. Right here in Santa Rosa right now, you could be making an effect by saving our trees and putting down less concrete, less pavement, have you noticed when you go along a sidewalk, you'll see a tree well where a tree's gone and they fill it with concrete. That's not the way it's supposed to be for a tree city or for anyone that's paying attention to a climate emergency. So I'm hoping that you won't be contradictory in your actions, that you'll actually walk your talk, you'll embrace this climate emergency resolution, which you brought forward. Others have advocated for it, but you brought it forward, so now stand by it here locally get started, especially with saving trees. Money is supposed to be put aside to replant trees and I have found that there's never, at least in the last decade, been a refusal for a tree removal permit. Everybody gets to cut down and lots of people cut them down without asking for permits and guess what? Nobody replaces the trees they cut down. I've been looking and watching for years now and it hasn't been happening. So I'm asking you as my elected officials who are passing a resolution on your own volition to please stand up and embrace the climate emergency that you say exists and do what's right here in our town. Trees, please, and less concrete. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Wayne. Gene Bender followed by Richard Canini. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think I know a bit about the sense of responsibility all of you feel for the city having sat behind that dais of 10 years ago. Thank you. Um, I, and I know the homeless issue and the housing crunch must weigh very heavily on you today, but difficult as those issues are, climate change has to be the number one issue, not only for this city, but for all cities, states, and countries. Our policies have to reflect the reality that we are actually destroying life as we know it, not only today, but even more into the future. So I am asking you, I appreciate what RCPA has done, but I am asking you to look at the community issued proclamation and resolution and take the stronger points from that one to put into place. It, our policy has to reflect the reality of climate change today and what it's doing to the future. Unfortunately, governments all over the world give lip service to climate change, but then get swamped by homelessness, housing, immigration, you name it, the problems, and climate change continually gets short shrift. As a result, we are falling farther and farther behind. If you toughen the one that's before you with the ones from the, given by the community, you will be doing three things. You'll be telling your children and grandchildren how important their future is. You'll be, be giving voice to those millions of young people throughout the world who are in the streets pleading for a safe future. And you will be telling Sacramento that a city of over 160,000 is willing to do the tough things to help save this future. And believe me, Sacramento needs to hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Canini followed by Christine Hu. Uh, greetings. Lots of talk about greenhouse gases. 
it is possible to cause the greenhouse effect without gases. In Santa Rosa, a number of sites are afflicted with the greenhouse gas effect because of the way Santa Rosa allows its architects to design buildings. Specifically, glass exposed to sunlight. The earlier understanding of greenhouse was glass houses, like at the uh, Luther, Luther Burbank home. That's a greenhouse where glass is exposed to the sun. Architects are causing this problem intentionally. I doubt it's with malice or forethought, but it is intentional and it's either a result of ignorance or apathy. Ignorance, apathy, don't know, don't care. And if they don't care, I think this city should adopt a regulation that will eliminate these greenhouse <laughs> effects that are, can be seen all over the city by poor environmental design of our buildings. I brought this up to the Design Review Board and they recorded my comments as I'm in favor of solar panels. I brought this point to the city years ago and you still haven't done anything with it. It's kind of like talking to my cat. Here's the point, if you can see this. It was nice when we had the overhead projector down there. I don't know if you can get this any better. What this shows is a south-facing glass known as the south elevation in design world. And if you put an overhang on the window of about a foot for a bedroom window, two foot for a glass patio, in the summer, that glass will be in shade. In the winter, that glass will be in sun. Now that's an amazing thing, and that's about as primal as it gets with the sun. This is only the result because the Earth's orbit of rotation is skewed to the plane of its orbit around the Earth. And that's either an intelligent design or most fortunate opportunity. You should require this south-facing glass to be shaded. Sometimes you'll see awnings like on the Crest Building downtown. The other thing that would be helpful is peaked roofs. We have an attic space with air, well ventilated. You're building a lot of flat roofed houses and these gain heat in the summer and lose heat in the winter. This should be part of your design code. This will go a long way to reducing greenhouse gases, greenhouse effect that's gonna be solved by using air conditioning. You can eliminate the need of air conditioning if you design a building properly. Thank you. Christine notes followed by Mark Mortensen. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Christine Hooks and I am with 350 Sonoma, 350 Bay Area. We're a climate action group. Uh, so I wanna, speaking to the um, agenda item about the climate emergency resolution, the RCPA plan is good, but Santa Rosa needs a better plan. Um, so I'm here today to ask you to adopt a climate emergency resolution <clears throat> that has the strongest possible language in this emergency resolution. Uh, it, it, <clears throat> most importantly, the language needs to hold us all accountable by setting specific goals of net zero emissions by 2030. That's net zero emissions by 2030, specific in the writing of the plan, <clears throat> of the emergency resolution. And it needs to have annual tracking and public reports to, uh, to, to get us to these zero emission goals and to hold us all accountable. So it's really important to get that specific language in there so and to track it so we know where we're all at. Otherwise, it's just kind of, just kind of out there. So it's an emergency resolution and thank you very much. Thank you. Mark Mortensen followed by Elaine Wellen. 209 West 8th Street. I'm a member of the Santa Rosa Climate Emergency Resolution Team here and I'm also a fourth grade teacher, so those little 10 year olds that I'm working with um, every day are gonna be dealing with, and are dealing with, 
the situation for, for a long time. Um, I'm here to urge you to vote for a stronger climate emergency resolution. The RCPA plan resolution is, is a great start, but it follows the state's recommendation of getting, um, of reducing emissions by 40% by 2030, and that's not gonna be enough. The science tells us that we need to go much further than that, getting to net zero by 2030. Um, if, we, if we do that, we can avoid the 1.5 degrees C rise in average Earth temperature that's gonna exacerbate the climate situation that we have right now. Um, by tightening the language that we currently have right now, we can take the lead in this and go for net zero by 2030 and start taking the actions and continue taking the actions that are necessary. The um, Santa Rosa CER group that I belong to has put forth just such a, a climate emergency resolution along with a list of actions, ideas, some of which the, the council already knows about and things are, things are already happening. Um, many of these ideas or actions are no regrets actions that, have, that can be implemented immediately and would save money and also reduce greenhouse gas emissions at the same time. No regrets. A um, Couple other quick items. I asked the staff to continue um, to review the CER, the Santa Rosa Community CER resolution and its list of actions. And then once, once we do pass something, the city should set a clear goal for z net zero emissions and track that annually. I'd also like to remind the council that there are a lot of community members, some in this room, who offer their assistance to the council and staff when it comes to climate change research and in providing information and taking, in, uh, and taking actions and implementing the solutions. Got a lot of interested people in this, in this area interested in climate change, a lot of great resources. Thank you. Thank you. Elaine Wellen, followed by Ann Jacko Petty. Good evening. The Creating Climate Solutions Committee of the Unitarian of the Unitarian Congregation of Santa Rosa is very gratified to see the council consider a climate emergency resolution this evening. This is a desperately needed step to take immediate action to slow the climate crises all around us. However, we would like to encourage the Council to support the CERs proposed by the Friends of Climate Action Plan or the Community Climate Action Plan. Since the crisis is upon us and getting rapidly worse, and since we have delayed action for too long, we need to move to zero emissions worldwide, starting here by 2030. A reduction of seven to 10% annually from here on out. The community CER of which you've received several copies is much more specific and reflects the urgency of our time. It is too late for slow and methodical planning. We have an emergency. We urge you to adopt the community list of actions as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. And Jacopetti followed by Woody Hastings. Anne's gone, okay. And folks, if I could just remind you, the custom in this uh, chamber, if you agree with the speaker, do your hands versus clapping because it tends to slow down the meeting a little bit. And um, I appreciate the support, but the way we do it here in this chamber um, is by waving the hands. I'd, be I'd very much appreciate that. Woody Hastings followed by Abigail Zoger. Good evening. My name is Woody Hastings. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I, and I know uh, many of you know that my day job is at the Climate Center. I just want to make it clear that I'm not speaking on behalf of the Climate Center this evening, speaking as a concerned resident of Sonoma County. I'm here tonight to speak in support of the City Council adopting the cl Climate Emergency Resolution, would support you to uh, adopt as strong uh, of an emergency resolution as possible. Um, we are indeed in the midst of a climate emergency, so that's why you should do it. 
in an emergency, what does what does one do? Well, one pulls the emergency brake. And so what, what would that mean in this case? I think for me in this case, one of the items you had up there was look through all of your policies through the climate emergency lens. Um, and so, um, you know, I, so that means, you know, making an assessment of all the things that the city is doing. Uh, and I think a big part of that is what are, the, what are the things that the city is doing that may be contributing to the problem? A climate emergency resolution might mean doing a lot of proactive things, planting trees, bike paths, whatever, but what about the things that need to be stopped to stop contributing to the problem? And a case in point I will just point to is that currently the city of Santa Rosa under obsolete 20th century permitting rules is permitting two, in the process of permitting two new gas stations. Each of them have uh, over 10 operating gas stations within a five mile radius. Those, the permitting rules around fossil fuel infrastructure need to be updated to the 21st century through that climate emergency lens that you had up there on the screen earlier. Um, so I urge you to adopt the resolution, make it meaningful by actually stopping the things that the city is doing uh, that contribute to the problem in addition to doing all the good things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Abigail Zoger followed by Fred Kruger very much for taking this time to discuss this. I don't know about you, but I have been watching the news of Australia with great sorrow and distress at what's happening to people there. But I can't help but have this terribly selfish and self-absorbed thought, which is that's what we're going to be like when we go past 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's what's going to happen here in California. That's what's going to happen here in Sonoma County. Our fires are going to get worse. And we, I feel like we're all walking along like we have time, like we have to 2030 to discuss and determine and coordinate and have a very methodical conversation, which, which are all good things. But if, according to Saul Griffith, who's a MacArthur Genius Award winner and the author of the Energy uh, Visualization Program for the Department of Energy, if we make every single carbon decision correctly right now, every time you replace a car, you replace it with an electric car. Every time you replace a furnace, you replace it with a heat pump. If every single decision was made right now in America in the correct path, we would still blow past 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that's scary because we can look around at Australia and see what 1.5 Celsius looks like when it's too, it's too warm. We have no control over what's going to happen here. And I was so proud of this city council when you passed the all electric reach code. I just kind of, I walked around, that's my town. My city made that decision. We became one of the first cities in the state of California to really act like we really are taking this seriously and having an all electric building code. And I want to ask you to have that kind of leadership and that kind of um, vision and adopt, yes, the the climate emergency resolution the RCPA has put out, but add to it all of the things that are concrete action. We need to do everything we can as soon as we can. And we need to make that resolution as strong and as powerful as possible so that we don't end up continuing to be the poster children for climate change with our fires and our distress here. So. Thank you very much for the work you've done. Please, please take greater action on this emergency resolution. Thank you. Fred Krueger followed by Wally Jurchett. Chert. I want to strongly endorse the importance of this climate emergency resolution. I've had the benefit of attending the last five of the global climate UN summits. I can tell you, the more you study this issue, the more serious it rises up in affecting our future. We've seen fire and winds and heat, and these are only the beginning of the climate changes that we will be facing. This means it indeed is emergency resolution, but my question to you is how serious 
are you going to take this emergency? It's going to require a change, a profound change in how we behave. The scientists are right. We hear it over and over again that this is the great challenge of our generation, but we need to act in accordance with a challenge that will upset many of our cherished behaviors and, and habits. So don't take this lightly, please. This is the challenge of our generation and you cannot get too serious about making those changes that are in accordance with the science. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Wally Jukert, followed by June Brashears. Good evening. I wanna acknowledge that the city council is working very hard to make our city better. Thank you. You've worked on housing recovery from our fires. You're working on solutions for homeless people. You've passed the all electric breach code. You will, will soon be considering Evergreen. As cars in the city fleet are retired, you're replacing every other one with an electric vehicle. You have an active climate action subcommittee and tonight you are considering the climate re emergency resolution. I encourage you to adopt specific actions that can be measured. Climate change will require massive efforts and major changes. I believe that the fossil fuel industry will be the major obstacle. As the climate crisis affects everything, it would re affects every living creature on the planet. I think that we will need a new war, not a war nation against nation, but nations working together to fight and overcome this crisis. Thank you. Thank you. June Brashears, followed by Bill Howiezak. Hi, good evening, I'm June Bershares, and I wanna thank you for bringing this item forward tonight. I'm here to encourage you to please move forward and adopt the climate emergency resolution, and please adopt the version that's as strong as possible. Uh, utilize that language that was submitted by the Santa Rosa Community Group, the Friends of a Climate Action Plan. Um, please do everything you can on this item. Um, Others have already spoken very eloquently on this and this about how this step is a necessary but not a sufficient action, but it's certainly necessary to do as strong of a climate emergency resolution as you can tonight. And uh, I won't take more time so you can move forward even sooner on this urgent item. Thank you. Bill, how are you, Zach? <clears throat> uh, uh, hello, staff. and. Uh, Council people. In 1979 and 1980, I was a student of Sonoma State University studying environmental studies with an, on, with an emphasis on alternative energies. And then we got into a administration that eliminated all resources, education, studies, and decided it was more, it, it was more pertinent to send our aircraft carriers over the Persian Gulf to protect our oil interests. Well, now we're playing catch up about 35 years later. And the gentleman that spoke about the fixed shading device, that was something that's, that's been known since uh, people were living uh, in Pueblos and uh, the Indians were living on rock cliffs. One thing that I don't understand is why we haven't addressed this sooner. I've been noticing that um, Burbank housing structures have been going up for the last five or, or so years, and none of, none of them have been oriented properly to have solar panels installed on them to address the situation of the global, you know, global warming and alternative energies. Also, I think programs simple, as simple as making sure everybody has LED light bulbs and, and fixtures in their houses at very low cost, low flush toilets, energy conservation appliances. These are the kind of things that, that really don't cost people a lot of money, but that would make a great deal of difference. An incandescent light bulb that, that burns 100 watts can be replaced by something that's LED that requires seven watts. 
something as simple as that. You reduce energy consumption by, by 13 times. Also, I think that it would be a good idea to encourage bicycles uh, rather than just playing lip service to it. For instance, all the intersections, major intersections which people have been injured on should be all the same. College Avenue and and Stony Point, uh, Fulton Road and oh, Guerneville Road, intersections like this, all major intersections should be the same. Everybody should know where they should be, why they should be there, so everybody, so nobody feels intimidated by riding a bicycle on the road because everybody knows where they should be in the intersection so they don't get hit, like the poor lady that I, uh, I saw that was the nurse about six years ago that got hit by a garbage truck. This was totally unnecessary, it shouldn't have never happened. Also places to park bicycles, um, curbs, gutters, roadways that are made for, for safe and easy bicycle uh, manipulation and, and riding. So that's about all I, all I can say in the three minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any additional cards? That's it, all right, bring it back to council. Any additional questions for staff based on any of the comments from the public? Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. This is for staff. I have a couple of questions about the, that refer to the, or were brought up when I read the resolution. Um, in general, the resolution is very broad in its informa informationally. It has a lot of great information about our current condition and um, what uh, other elected bodies are, are doing um, to curb the uh, GHG um, effects as far as it goes. Um, but there are a couple of specifics that I'm curious about. Um, on page two, on the bottom of page two of the resolution itself, it refers to carbon-free water. And I'm curious if you can explain to me what carbon-free water is and if you have any sense of, of um, cost. Because I, I know we'll be dealing with, with cost during our budget hearings. Um, and we'll probably get into more of some of the details of what some of these, of what this decision, how this will affect us fiscally. And I'm curious about the carbon-free water. Yeah, so the movement of water is a, a high energy intensive effort and it typically is one of the highest emitters of greenhouse gas through that energy, energy use. Um, we will be talking about that on the 28th in terms of what different energy uses we have throughout the city, both from the enterprise fund on the water side, which is a bulk of the energy use in the city. It's 75% of the city's use. Um, and what that means to decarbonize that. Uh, the, the water agency where we get our water supply, the Sonoma County Water Agency, um, does have an initiative in place where they are looking for a decarb decarbon carbon free water source over time. Um, that does come at a cost, but uh, that's something we're looking at regionally, but also you'll hear about that more locally, um, what that means to take our operation on the treatment plant and the distribution side and what that means to our rate payers um, on the 28th. Okay. Thank you, yeah. and is it, is it true that, 70, that you mentioned 75%, is that not true nationwide? It's, uh, yeah, water, water is uh, one of the water. biggest, yeah, moving water is very expensive, yes. Okay. Thank you, and one more um, on page four, and mentions that the, the very last line of the Be It Further Resolved directs staff to work with the RCPA and coalition members to integrate climate change considerations into all policies. Will we be um, capable of putting some uh, dollar figures to uh, a to a statement like that? Yes, one of the things that that refers to is essentially what we'll be looking at is how do we, uh, when we do have policies in place, um, and, and stepping back is, is we do have a climate action plan in place that has a number of very specific specific actions um, that we do measure on a regular basis. Um, part of that does address policies that the city has in place um, through our climate action plan. We also are looking at updating our climate action plan. We'll be talking about that at the next climate action subcommittee about what that means and what how, what that effort will look like. Um, again, that's on January 29th. Uh, but part of that will be evaluating what policies do we need to look at, what policies do we, do we need to update, um, but in the existing climate action plan, there are a number of policies in there that we do um, are moving forward with to, um, like I said, look at uh, uh, electric vehicles, um, looking at uh, changing out um, to LED or LED light bulbs and other things. Those things are in place and in progress right now. 
Right. Thank you, yeah. and, I, and I understand the concept of damnable torpedoes and full speed ahead, yeah. because we do need to move rapidly, <clears throat> um, but we also, and monetizing this can be painful, but it is something that we, we do need to consider our budgets. I mean, we, as long as we depend on cash to, to run as a, as a, a, a body and, a, and as an organization, um, being able to get a really true picture of, of monetizing these various efforts, I think is important, and I think the community needs to be well aware of the costs involved and, and I on think both sides. On both sides, right. And so I think on January 28th, when we do talk about Evergreen, what we are prepared to do is talk about what the split is of the 75%. 25% of that is the city's general fund uh, facilities, uh, street lights, signals, and what that means to um, address those uh, energy, the, the, the efficiency of those existing facilities that we currently have. And and financial mechanisms to try to make that happen. We're not alone um, in this in, in this issue. Um, so there are a lot of different approaches to financing and funding these type of things to try to see that reduction in greenhouse gas drop. Um, so we'll show you both the greenhouse gas side, but also the cost side, and then try to figure out how to find that balance to, to achieve both. Great, thank you very much. Any additional questions? Seeing none, Mr. Rogers, you have this item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I'll uh, make some comments with it uh, as I make the uh, motion as well. Uh, so I started meeting with community groups probably about a year and a half ago talking about the climate emergency resolution. And I'll admit that uh, for somebody who is a a uh, huge advocate for the council and broader taking action, uh, I wasn't a big fan. And, and the only reason was we talk a lot and I'm more focused on action. And what I didn't want to have happen was to have community groups punch themselves out and get exhausted fighting over an emergency resolution when where I really need your efforts is on the policies and on the funding specifically for what we're bringing forward. So if I push for the, uh, for the resolution to be a little bit stronger than it is, I, I want you all, I'm taking you all at your word that you're gonna continue to be there for the fights on all of the policy discussions as well. Um, and one of those, as we've talked about, is making sure that we find funding because we do know that it's gonna be expensive, but I think this community more than any other knows that the cost of failure is going to be even more expensive for us. And that's part of why I brought up Measure M earlier, the transportation measure, where you are going to see Santa Rosa fighting for more money for public transit, not just better public transit, but electrified pu public transit. You're gonna see us fighting for infrastructure for bikes and for pedestrians. We're going to do everything we can to make sure that we have those dollars because we know that it, especially in Santa Rosa, we need the solutions that we present to rise to the scope and the scale of the challenge that's before us. Uh, so I uh, am the representative on RCPA. We did see this before the board and it was a, a good discussion. And, and now uh, in my seat as a city council member, uh, I am going to offer a couple of amendments to the staff's uh, resolution and the RCPA resolution that I do think addresses many of the concerns from the community. I will tell you right now, I'm not going to put the list of specific actions into the resolution, and instead I'm gonna make a separate motion that, that that comes before the Climate Action Committee where we will then articulate to the public what we're going to do. I wanna make sure that we have some flexibility as new technology emerges and as other solutions emerge for us to be nimble, as nimble as local government can be in addressing this problem. But I will offer on page three of the resolution, uh, right after, uh, excuse me, the th right after the second, be it further resolved. And I'll tell you, this first one actually comes from uh, the discussion yesterday at uh, the Sonoma County Transportation Authority, where it was brought up what the mission and vision sta statement for the MTC, Metropolitan Trans Transit Committee, is. And one of the things that I really liked about it is concludes, and I'm going to paraphrase here with climate change, addressing climate change underpins everything that we do. And I really liked some of that verbiage. So I'm gonna offer there, be it further resolved that addressing climate change underscores everything that we do, and the city remains committed to taking action to mitigate, draw down, and take adaptive measures with the goal of reaching carbon neutrality by 2030. The, the second, uh, amendment will follow directly after that. 
be it further resolved that the city commits to developing and regularly updating a public facing tracker of progress towards its climate goals. Now, part of why I wrote it the way that I did, as I mentioned with being adaptable uh, as it comes to the specific actions that we're gonna talk, it is more appropriate to do that at the, at the, the subcommittee level. I also wanna make sure that the tracker that we develop, we have a chance to talk about and work within staff constraints and talk about what is, uh, both what the specific goal is and what regularly means. I've heard annually, perhaps we'll settle on annually, but I do wanna give staff a chance to evaluate their capacity. And if every two years is a little bit easier for them and that works with the community, I want us to be able to do that as well. Uh, so that's my first motion. And then the second motion is that the Climate Action Committee will review specific actions that we can take towards uh, meeting the spirit of this uh, resolution as well. And it sounds like we are in fact doing that. Second. So let's go back to the first motion just for clarity for yep. our clerk and everyone else. Do uh, any questions about his first motion and is, do we have a second if there it, are no questions? Yeah, I second it. It, it. Would you like me to reread the wordsmithing, Mr. Mayor? Sure, that would be helpful. Be it further resolved that addressing climate change underscores everything that we do, and the city remains committed to taking action to mitigate, draw down, and take adaptive measures with the goal of reaching carbon neutrality by 2030. Be it further resolved that the city commits to developing and regularly updating a publicly fa uh, public facing tracker of progress towards its climate goals. Great, so we got that in, who did we get the second firm? Councilmember Oliveira, second. Okay, so we have a motion, a second. Any additional comments on that motion? Okay, your votes, please. <clears throat> and that passes unanimously. Mr. Rogers, you had a second motion. And my second act, uh, my second motion is that the Climate Action Committee will review the specific steps that we can take to meet the spirit of the climate emergency, and, and including the, the list that was provided to us as well as a discussion point. Second. Great, we have a motion by Mr. Rogers, the Vice Mayor seconded. Any additional comments or questions on that? Motion to second your votes, please. And that also passes unanimously. Any, any additional motions? All righty, thank you very much. Uh, we will now go to our first public hearing, item 16.1. Item 16.1, public hearing, adoption of mitigated negative declaration and master plan for Roseland Creek Community Park. Jen Santos, Deputy Director, Parks Presenting. And while Jen is getting prepared, after this item, council will take a break. We've been at this since 1.30, so at the conclusion of this public hearing, we will be taking a 15, 20 minute break. Good evening, Mayor Schwedhelm, Vice Mayor Fleming, and Council Members. I'm Jen Santos, uh, Deputy Director for Parks. Uh, the item tonight is the Roseland Creek Mitigation uh, Negative de Declaration as well as the Master Plan Adoption. As a reminder of the location for Roseland, just in case it's south of Highway 12, west of Highway 101, and it is high... It is highlighted in the yellow area right in the center, uh, mostly in the center of the map. Uh, this is Sebastopol Road along here. The other key arteries are uh, Stony Point Road uh, right here as well as Highway 101 and Highway 12. 
Uh, zooming in a little closer uh, to the park itself, I want to go through the uh, existing site uh, for you a little bit. It's everything outlined in yellow there. There are actually four parcels that the city owns that make up the park land. Uh, all of them uh, are owned by the city at this point. We recently purchased the one in the southern portion, the middle southern portion right here in 2018. Uh, the rest were purchased in 2011. The park sits across from Roseland Creek Elementary over here on this side of the screen and is surrounded by uh, residential neighborhoods and some farmland to the south. Roseland Creek bisects the park right here, the blue line that goes through the park. There's also all of these green things are actually existing trees and we have we had some existing residential units here, four houses with several outbuildings as well as a uh, water tower and some other things that have recently been removed through the public works engineering program. All of the above ground units were removed, but the below grade uh, structures still remain. Let's see, I wanna make sure I get everything covered here. Um, I just wanted to also remind you that um, if you've taken a walk out here along the creek, it looks like previous property owners or somehow there has ended up with concrete inside the creek. Um, and the uh, plan the uh, plan for the creek is to uh, restore the creek and remove the concrete. Just want to remind you of that. And then uh, regarding the background, just a bit of an overview. There are four par parcels, they're almost 20 acres. The general plan does designate this park as a community park, which means that we're looking at folks visiting for more than 45 minutes, coming from more than a mile away or at least a mile away from the park. Uh, the city also did purchase the uh, land through the uh, Agri Sonoma County Agricultural Preservation and. Uh, open Space District Matching Grant Program. Uh, and those uh, acquisition grants require a conservation easement. So this park will have a conservation easement over it. Right now, we have two conservation easements for three of the parcels, and we are working with the Ag and Open Space District to combine those to have one conservation easement and also a recreation covenant over the land. Uh, so that's simplified for staff at the city as well as the at the Ag and Open Space District. Uh, the Citywide Creek Master Plan was also um, referenced when we were planning this park. As I just mentioned, um, it calls for restoration of the creek side. Um, the Citywide Bicycle and Pedestrian Master Plan was also taken into consideration as we do have a, a, a bicycle plan, a path that goes through the park. And of course we have an environmental analysis that has been taking place as well. So at each of the community meetings we have had, or at least a few of them, we have provided this map as much as possible uh, to residents uh, providing their comments regarding the master plan so that they could make informed decision about what sort of resources they would like to see in their parks. And the uh, park site is located here, in, it's kind of a yellowish color, and everything else in green is an existing uh, city, city park. Also listed on this map are planned future parks that are shown in the general plan. So they look like little Christmas trees, and a little hard to see in this map. They're dotted around here. The smaller ones are, are gonna be neighborhood parks, and the uh, larger one right over here is the next future planned uh, community park. So ultimately there will be three community parks, Roseland Creek Community Park, Southwest Community Park located off of Hearn, and a planned future uh, community park uh, just down from Airfield Park. Uh, there are also seven uh, current parks now with an additional eight neighborhood parks planned overall. Uh, talking about community workshops, we have had a, a lot of community workshops uh, with this master planning process. This started back in 2009, um, where the city was working with uh, the community and had at least five meetings leading up to uh, a 2010 final, final plan. 
uh, it, it, that plan finally went to the Board of Community Service to be heard. Uh, we've had four workshops and numerous, this plan has been before the Board of Community Services numerous times. Uh, they did recommend council approval on March 28, 2018. And this is basically a summary of the previous meetings. Um, we, all, from 2009 to 2018, uh, we also attended all of the annexation meetings uh, for Roseland and this uh, Sebastopol specific plan meetings, uh, some of the community advisory board meetings as well as other smaller meetings. Uh, I wanted to draw your attention to some of the recent meetings we've had in 2019 as part of the Prop 68 grant application we applied for. Uh, these were specifically targeted uh, to these locations at Shepherd Elementary. Uh, we met with the uh, students at a spring camp with their parents, Roseland Prep High School leadership class, the Cinco de Mayo celebration, the senior community, Chelsea Gardens, uh, directly across the street from the park, uh, across on McMinn, and the Santa Rosa South, uh, Southwest Santa Rosa Health Action meeting, as well as a really fun celebration at the Land Pass Garden Celebration. Uh, those are folks working in support of the uh, Land Pass Garden at Bear Park. Uh, some of our uh, outreach has uh, is addressed here. We've really taken to a lot of community outreach, making sure we can hit a diverse group of folks, but we always do, uh, the top one, send out mailers for every standard meeting that we have, and there's about 9,000 residents that we send out mailers to, as well as uh, almost 3,000 absentee folks. So uh, those are going to people who live there, as well as people who own the property. Uh, we also do our e-blast to residents who attend meetings. Um, and we have uh, something kind of interesting. We have a Facebook event page where we also post information and respond. And of course, we always do post uh, signs on site when we're doing something uh, like a public meeting. And then we uh, also, as part of this process, have been meeting with the uh, tribal nations. and. Uh, the two tribal nations that are registered with the city to be notified when we have developments are the Federated Indians of Grattan Rancheria and the Lytton Rancheria of California. I met with the Federated in Indians of Grattan Rancheria and showed them the master plan and asked if they provide comments. Their comments was that they would like to see the Pomo themed village removed from the plan and any, any reference to Pomo removed from the plan. They in turn also requested that the plan include uh, fire as the, in the form of barbecues, water with an outdoor sink, picnicking, parking for their elder as access and proximity to the restrooms, as well as identification of all of the native plant trees along the southern side of Rosen Creek for acorn collection. Uh, both the Federated Indians of Grand Rancheria and the Linden Rancheria have reviewed the uh, mitigated negative declaration as well as the master plan and have no further comments. So for the master plan, this is the master plan version that went to the Board of Community Services in 2010 after the 2000, at about five meetings in 2009 uh, leading into January of 2010. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this plan and then we've got a few updates. We'll only mention the actual things that change and the updates to spare you from going through it each time. Um, but starting up here in the um, northern portion of the, of the park, uh, there are some vernal, vernal pools listed here, constructed vernal pools, as well as uh, a trail system along here connecting uh, McMinn all the way over to Burbank and then into Rosen Elementary School. Um, let's see, I wanna make sure I get everything. <laughs> the pink area here shown here, at the time it was proposed, the proposed Roseland Elementary School had not been yet built as well. There are, um, the, the green stuff in here is existing trees as well as foot trails through the trees. Uh, the white here is a proposed nature center with a parking lot right here with about 30 parking spaces, a turnaround and a vehicular gate. There is a uh, constructed wetland right here with a uh, overlook and a boardwalk as well. Uh, Roseland Creek 
is running right down this center. It's not blue, but that's where the creek is. There's also a portion of the creek, the creek that goes off site right here in this purple area. Um, it's a parcel in between the two residential units. It is operated by the Sonoma County Water Agency, and then it goes under McMinn and continues on. Uh, moving down here towards the southern part of the park, uh, there's an existing gravel, gravel driveway that's being converted for a trail here. Um, we have a playground in purple a restroom in white, and a picnic area in its red circle. And these are just graphic representations letting us know we, that's what the, those are the general locations where we want this. There's also a uh, turf panel, so this is lawn, re regular grass, not artificial turf. Uh, these are the two, these in yellow, these two Pomo villages that um, when we met with the Native Tribal Nations, they want to remove, but on this plan, they're here. Uh, the picnic area also right here. The notes from this time talking about the interpretive village was um, a themed area with picnicking and barbecues uh, potential. Uh, the, the trail system moves on up. There are two pedestrian bridges that cross Roseland Creek, one over here on the eastern side of the park as well as one over here on the western side. It's difficult to see in this plan, there, there are numerous trails, but most of them do a loop around the entire park, as well as exiting right here. Uh, this, the trail on the, that connects from McMinn down the eastern side of the park and out towards Burbank is also potentially a multi-use trail for bicycles as well. Let's see. And up here we have restored native grasslands. And part of the acquisition agreement with the open space district, the city is required to build this northern trail that is connecting McMinn over to the school and the crosswalk by 2021 as well. I think, I think those are the basics of the plan, and I'm gonna move on to the next. So between 2010 and 20, uh, 2015, early 2015, uh, the, there was no work done on the uh, master plan. It was picked back up again in 2015. And uh, before this plan went to the Board of Community Services here at July 22nd, there had been four different versions. So uh, we're only gonna look at this version uh, at this moment as a, as a checkpoint in time. And it is significantly the same as the previous plan. We're only gonna talk about the updates to the plan from there. Uh, the graphics are different, uh, different. Uh, this is staff producing these graphics versus before we had RHAA, a consultant producing graphics. So the graphics have changed, but gen generally it's the same layout. So for identification, this would be the parking area and this here would be the nature center. The new items were a dog park was added right here, as well as the, remo the removal of constructed vernal pools in the northern section was removed, as well as the constructed wetland in this area of the park. Um, the previous plan had also called for three street crossings across Burbank Avenue. And we're not showing any street crossings here because we're still at this point evaluating where is the best location for uh, crossings and how many should we have with the city's traffic engineering folks. Um, all the green stuff on here, all the darker green, is this, it's the same existing trees, just a different graphic. And the Pomo Village is still on here because I had not yet talked to the uh, Grand Rancheria yet. So that's the update for 2015, um, a snapshot in time. <laughs> and then I am gonna talk a little bit about this, but uh, about this next plan, April 6, 2018. Uh, as mentioned, the Board of Community Services had previously approved this plan on March 28, 2018. Um, so this is just the updated version that was prepared on April 6 uh, with their uh, recommendations for updates. 
And I am going to turn, we also hired, let me back up a little bit, we also um, brought on our consultants. We have Design Workshop with us. Um, you can see the lovely graphics that they've produced here, as well as David J. Powers and Associates, our environmental consultant that started working on the, pro on the project at that point. So I'm going to turn it over to our consultant who can talk about the changes here. Thank you, Jen. Uh, good evening, council members. My name is Steve Noll with Design Workshop. Um, as Jen mentioned, we had uh, come on board about 2007 to really take on where the original master plan that we inherited and really um, take it to the next step. Um, I won't get into the um, logistics about the community outreach because I think Jen kind of summarized that nicely. Uh, our first task was, of course, to look at what was done before and from a design perspective, see if it, it was, um, you know, were there any flaws or anything. But by and large, it just seemed to make sense as far as where things laid and relationship and that type of thing. So tonight, I'm just going to talk walk you through kind of the, the updates from the last plan at a high level, and then um, obviously then we'll turn it over for additional information from the environmental consultants, as well as the um, then general public and then comments. Uh, first, there is a small wetlands area here that's been that was identified early on. And um, so in, in the original layout of that pathway connecting uh, both uh, uh, the roads, the um, we avoided that just for that reason. Uh, it's still up in the air. I think we found that it, it probably is in the wetlands, and we'll let uh, uh, w um, the environmental consultant team discuss that. But any, in any event, we provided a way to, to go around that with a walkway. Secondly, we met with the traffic engineer out in the field to discuss how we might um, safely cross that road because this pathway is going to be providing access to school as well as community um, um, access uh, to back and forth uh, between the areas. Uh, School specifically, we moved this uh, walkway, the crosswalk, it used to be up here down to here where it, it aligned with the walkway into the school. At the time, back when the master plan was done, the school wasn't built. What that did was eliminate a double cross, and originally the, the students would have to cross here and then cross the walkway into the school. Now it's bringing them just to one safe crossing right to where the front door is. Um, that was a, a change that was made. <clears throat> The driveway uh, access to the to the nature center previously was a little bit higher. In again, walking with the traffic engineer and just common sense about how you orchestrate movements, we align that driveway to access right across from the school, so it makes a four-way intersection versus a offset intersection. Uh, that driveway does provide access for the um, 16 parking spaces for the visitor center, as well as the picnic area and this outdoor community garden area, which is still part of the plan. Uh, in order to facilitate the movement of pedestrians safely, uh, a split rail fence is, is a proposed along the edge of Burbank Road and opening up where those crossings will be um, with regard to the uh, ultimate crossings for the street. Uh, as Jen mentioned before, uh, the previous plan as well as this one is utilizing an existing gravel road coming into a small parking lot that will serve the access for the playground and some of this uh, informal uh, play area. Um, that was not only a need for the community, but also part of the fire access emergency, which was probably not uh, as strongly represented in the previous plan. Um, this turf area here has been uh, quite a bit reduced from before, primarily for one reason is because of the blue, blue purple grass, I'm sorry, I keep calling it blue, blue grass, purple grass species, which is a, uh, a, 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 a not endangered, threatened species, so I'm not an environmental person, you can tell, threatened species, which really help to do a couple things. It, it preserves that, uh, that plant species, but also provides a bigger buffer between what was a larger uh, open turf area and the, and the neighborhoods next to it. Um, as Jen mentioned, any reference to the Pomo Village and uh, theming was removed from this plan, yet the idea of still providing some opportunities for the uh, Native Americans to visit the site has been reflected in this kind of a small picnic area. Uh, all the proposed development of improvements, I should say, is outside the stream setback zone, except for the bridges. Actually, we have to make the crossing, the connections, and the trails. Uh, there is a uh, the loop road with the fitness center. You can see by the orange and the uh, green dots, that's a uh, fitness spot to exercise, as well as interpretation. So this site offers a lot of opportunity for people to learn about the environment itself. 
in laying out the paths, we actually had a, a full survey done from a uh, surveying company, and we're very meticulous about locating those, and I think uh, ultimately we only are removing four trees, and, and I think that'll be discussed a little bit more in the future. And then finally, as Jen mentioned before, uh, the trail system along the creek is consistent with what the, uh, the bike uh, organizations here would really like have supported uh, throughout the process. Um, Oh, and one other thing, uh, you'll notice that the dog park was removed. That was something that came back as uh, an uh, element that was, probably wasn't necessary in this location. I forget anything? <laughs> I'll just add that um, on the southern section, uh, a sport court was added to the, um, to the plan um, after further community engagement and understanding of what sort of activities the community would like here. I think those are the uh, major changes to the plan. Although again, we've had several versions by the time we get to April 6, 2018. And the uh, Board of Community Services did forward this to be recommended to council for approval. Um, so at this point, what we've done, knowing that uh, we're at a point where we can further evaluate the plan, uh, we uh, brought the consultants on board to really dig in and analyze the potential impacts of the plan uh, and go from there. So I'm going to turn it over to our environmental consultant. Hi, Will Burns, principal with David Powers and Associates. Um, so in order to complete the environmental review consistent with the California Environmental Quality Act, uh, biological resource surveys were initiated on the site in 2017, um, subsequent to the Board of Community Services recommending approval of the master plan, uh, the full initial study effort was begun in 2018. Uh, the initial study analyzed all of the potential environmental impacts resulting from the project consistent with uh, the California Environmental Quality Act also known as CEQA. Uh, the subject areas included in the CEQA guidelines checklist are listed here, uh, above. So following the completion of the initial study, it was determined that all significant impacts of the project could be reduced to less than significant levels through the implementation of mitigation, municipal code requirements, and city standards. Uh, the initial study and mitigated negative declaration were circulated for a 30-day comment period beginning on November 19th, 2019. So over the course of the environmental review process, the master plan uh, was revised to uh, modify the design to avoid impacts to trees. Uh, initially, it was found that there was potential for 89 trees to be removed. That was subsequently reduced to four trees. Uh, it was also found that the original design would require pruning to approximately 270 trees, and that was reduced to 18 through, um, primarily through realignment of the proposed trail. Um, the project is also located in an area uh, designated as critical habitat for the California tiger salamander um, in the Santa Rosa Plain Conservation Strategy. However, based on um, the location of the site and barriers, including major roadways, the project biologists believe that the site is unlikely to be used for dispersal by California tiger salamander. Uh, the city, however, has committed to providing, you know, one, approximately 1 1.4 acres of mitigation credits uh, due to the increased area of uh, permanent improvements proposed. Um, additionally, in terms of biological resources, there's potential for there to be nesting raptors and other special status birds on the site uh, prior to construction. Um, Pre-construction surveys will be completed to ensure that uh, no active nests are present, and if they are present, that adequate setbacks will be provided. Um, additionally, uh, the project site was reviewed for the potential presence of wetlands, both in 2017 and 2018. Uh, 2017 was an unusually wet year, and 2018 was a, a what's considered a more normal um, rainfall year. And during those surveys, it was determined that the three criteria that must be met for uh, a wetland to be present, um, involving vegetation, soil characteristics, and evidence of saturation, 
although some areas met a couple of those requirements, all three of the requirements were not met. So there, it was determined that there are no uh, wetlands present in some of the grassland areas of the site. There is a riparian wetland uh, within the creek corridor, but that uh, would be unaffected by the project. Um, in terms of the cultural resources review, a literature search was completed uh, and there were not found to be any archeological resources present on the site. However, uh, the city through consultation with the Litton Rancheria uh, determined that it would be appropriate for a tribal representative to be present and monitor construction on the site. Uh, additionally, there was a, a potential for a, a prior refuse dump um, related to the, the residential areas, the residential development that was prior, uh, previously on the site. And so that there's mitigation included in the project to address that issue. So uh, in conclusion, the initial study and mitigative negative declaration was prepared in accordance with the California Environment Mental Quality Act, and uh, which covers subsequent phases of the park development. Upon council approval, a notice of determination will be filed with the county clerk for 30 days, which will complete the CEQA review process. Thank you, Will. Um, so in summarizing the community comments uh, that have been received from 2009 through 2019, uh, we do have a split in this community on what they would like to see at this park. Uh, we have uh, folks who would like a very natural state for the park, uh, little to no improvement except for trails and a nature center and uh, parking. Uh, there's other uh, community comments uh, that request uh, amenities such as turf for general play, playgrounds, group picnicking, regular picnics, dog parks, pump tracks, community gardens, restrooms, parking, trails, fitness equipment, basketball, barbecues, an outdoor sink, and a teen center. Uh, we've had a lot of requests. This is mostly just a summary of uh, some of the major requests for the park. Uh, there have also been requests for um, heavy development, such as a potential bicycle velodrome, uh, a veteran center, regulations soccer with lighted fields and artificial turf, baseball fields, and also uh, requests for absolutely no development. Uh, the master plan as it is does pro uh, protect environments that are of special status, such as the purple needle grass and the oak woodlands that are there. Uh, the master plan does leave a majority of the site in a natural state while there are some um, active uses uh, towards the southern part, portion of the, of the park. Um, and as of today's meeting, this is 11 years now with this community uh, without a master plan and well over 20 public meetings and opportunities to uh, provide comments. So at this point, we really have a good understanding of what the community input is. So here's the final master plan that was uh, produced on November 1st, 2019. And this was updated as a uh, graphic that was maybe a little more eye-catching uh, to uh, show that this is our final graphic. Uh, it also is different than the uh, Board of Community Services recommended plan because the wetlands and vernal pools that were formally identified uh, have been determined not to be there as part of the environmental review process, so those have been removed from the plan. Otherwise, the plan is generally the same. The fitness equipment uh, as part of the trail system was uh, concentrated in the southern end as well as part of a request from the Ag and Open Space District. So those are the only two changes. They're not significant enough to return to the Board of Community Services, as well as the graphic has been updated, but otherwise this is generally exactly the same as what happened has been put forth and recommended by the Board of Community Services for approval. Therefore, it is recommended by the Transportation and Public Works Department, Parks Division, that the Council by resolution adopt the mitigated negative declaration and master plan for the Roseland Creek Community Park to include preservation of native grassland, oak woodland, and purple needle grass habitat, in addition to community serving improvements, including pedestrian and bicycle trails, 
community garden or outdoor classroom, nature center, picnic areas with barbecues and sink, parking, children's play area for ages two to five and five to 12, a restroom building, a sport court, a fitness stations, irrigated turf area, two pedestrian bridges, a crosswalk, a looped, looped walking paths, and interpreted signage. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Council, questions, Mr. Tibbetts. I have just a quick one, Jen. Thank you so much for all your work on this. I know it's been a long time. Yes. And I've only been around three years. Um, but uh, is the this master plan, I just want to verify that that master plan is what the petitioners are referring to as the idea, community ideal plan 2019. No. Right. I would... I don't think this is what they're referring to. I have. Do we um, have a, a I, I, after glancing, do we have a copy of, of the ideal plan that they're proposing? I, I do I do not have, uh, I think it's part of the um, comments made for this council item, um, but I have not seen it, so. Okay. If anybody in the audience has it, if you could put it up, that'd be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, there was uh, obviously a lot of things that had been proposed, but one thing in particular caught my attention. Uh, I know early on it was proposed to have the veterans uh, memorial area, and in fact, I've, I've seen a support letter from Congressman Thompson for that concept. It, did that just never make it into the plan, or at some point was that dropped from the proposal, and if so, how come? Uh, I'm going to do my best to answer this, but I ne might need Jason to <laughs> answer in. Uh, so th these are concepts that we can easily put in. Uh, it does; it's not a significant change to the master plan. So uh, I think it's a healing garden, uh, as well as some other components can be added uh, without significant change to this master plan. They came in at a time where the board had already made their recommendation, uh, so, but these are things that we would welcome and can include into the plan uh, without significant, without having to come back to amend it. Any additional questions? Seeing none. Okay, we have a number of cards here, so I am gonna limit comments to two minutes per card. Two minutes per card. So first up would be Trish Tatharian, followed by Patricia Kruger. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. I'm here to speak on behalf of Educational Learning in Roseland Creek Park, an urban micro-wilderness in, in Roseland. The proposed park is in an area with a population of 14,780 people, and that's from the Roseland Annexation Area Work Plan from 2014. We as the community see three main overarching benefits of this park. Community purposes, an area to de-stress and enjoy nature instead of getting into a car and driving somewhere. Educational purposes, instill environmental curiosity, understanding, and respect with access from local schools and nonprofits such as the California Native Plan Society. Ecological services that are important in an urban environment and help with our global climate change. Details of these benefits will be discussed by subsequent speakers. The components proposed within the master plan presented by the city do not support these purposes in totality in ecological services of Roseland Creek Park and will be discussed by subsequent speakers. We need more parks in Roseland. This is a city standard. There is a city standard of six acres of parkland for every 1,000 people. Based on Roseland's existing population, we need to have a total of 88 acres in, of parkland in Roseland. We are asking that you, city council members and mayor, agree with our community developed Roseland Creek neighborhood, neighborhood ideal plan that is strong on education and restoration and connecting people in Roseland to nature. This will allow for one of the only parks in the southwest quadrant that provides recreational and educational opportunities that are nature-based rather than relying on structural recreation, such as sports courts or open turf areas. We're not against recreational parks. We are stating that this unique bit of wil urban wilderness should be saved and enhanced and recreational parks be placed further south in Roseland. This will not be the last area of development in, for a park in Roseland, but it is one of the last areas for saving a bit of unique nature in our urban area. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia Kruger followed by Fred Kruger. Good evening, my name is Patricia Kruger. I must identify myself as a member of the Roseland District School Board. Um, 
Board of Trustees and state that I'm not speaking on behalf of that body this evening, but as a Rosen resident who's worked on this project for more than 20 years. First, I would like to refer to the Santa Rosa General Plan 2035, page 6 14 through 16. There are four types of parks listed as part of a balanced park system, and the fourth one is special purpose parks, park lands generally designated for single use, such as environmental interpretive experiences. Quote, priority should also be given to locations that minimize impacts to sensitive environmental resources. The most sensitive environmental resource areas should generally be preserved for more passive recreation that assures their protection. Council members, I submit to you that the park you're considering today is the very definition of a sensitive environmental resource area, which should be preserved to the utmost. I've already shared with each of you copies of 125 signatures on a petition in support of this viewpoint, along with the community-generated master plan, which emphasizes preservation, restoration, and education. We have the support of a large percentage of the people of all backgrounds who reside on the streets immediately surrounding this park, as well as environmental leaders from Land Pass, Pepperwood Preserve, California Native Plant Society, and several teachers and administrators in the Rosen School District. I think there are maybe others here tonight who would have signed the petition if they had had the chance. We are grateful for those officials in the city and county who have listened to the citizens of Roseland over the last 20 years and worked to acquire and preserve these lands. Please do not let slip away this unique opportunity for preserved and enhanced open space and the multitude of benefits which open space provides. Please treat this as the special purpose park that it deserves to be. Thank you. Thank you. Fred Kruger, followed by Susan Kirks. The neighbors have been focused on building a park. We held off waves of developers. By 2000, we had a meeting with Mayor Mike Martini, and we emphasized the research that we had done that showed that a nature park would better serve our community than a recreation park. And now we have the same services of a recreation park over two and a half blocks away at the Bear Farm. But it's clear that we will be benefited more by a nature park than a park with active recreation. In fact, you cannot have both a quiet, peaceful nature park and recreation at the same time without one obviating the other. It's obvious. And we submitted a petition to the city council in 2006 requesting a nature park in this area, and it was received with great enthusiasm. So the 2009 figure that Jen Santos cites is only because when there was the economic downturn, there was no institutional memory of the, uh, the Mark Richardson Park and Recreation Department. So we have a long history, and at that time we were assuming a 40-acre park. But we had a great rapport with the Park and Recreation Department of that time, and it was felt that a wilderness park in the city would really be cutting edge rather than simply mixing uh, 10 different things all going on at the same time, which loses the peace and quiet. So listen to the science, listen to the psychological and sociological studies, which show we will be benefited more by a nature park, which quiets and calms the, the stress of the city than by the city. Besides, this will save money. We Susan Kirks, followed by Brian McCune. Hmm. There, you're live. Oh, thank you very much. Um, good evening. I'm Susan Kirks. I am president of Madrone Audubon Society here in uh, Sonoma County. We're headquartered in Santa Rosa. We have been in the the county for 53 years, and we enjoy a really good relationship with the city of Santa Rosa with our West 9th Street encroachment permit in our seventh year of providing nesting support and hopefully alleviating some potential issues for the city of Santa Rosa. And we also host the annual Bird and Nature Festival at 
Lincoln Elementary School. So since I only have two minutes, and I know that you're going to be hearing a lot of what I would have said, and I know you've had a very long day and appreciate your attention. I wanted to note in your uh, climate action item something that I think we, we must consider in this agenda item. Climate change underscores everything we do. So even though the first parcel was purchased in 2010, and I was actually in the advisory committee meeting for open space when that recommendation was made. So I know this, the area and property very well and have served on the open space district advisory committee from a different district. Um, it's very important that in this plan that you're considering and your environmental review that we consider climate change and have that interface in every single decision and action. I know that the staff is under a timeline with the Open Space District matching grant requirements to put in the northernmost trail by 2021. I understand that and I understand that the conservation easement is being written uh, to combine the two into one and I've had an opportunity to review those as well. So what I'd like to propose to you is that Madrona Audubon Society is prepared to assume a leadership role in an advisory group that should be formed uh, to be comprised of many of the people in this room tonight, but interested organizations and community groups to advise on for this. So I really appreciate that and I've, I've spoken with Jan about it um, and we would like to do that if you can Great. do a condition. Thank, thank you. Brian McCune, followed by Melissa Kianta. Hello, thank you for hearing me. Uh, my name is Brian McEwen. I am a combat veteran of two tours in Iraq and uh, one tour in Kosovo with the Special Forces. Um, I'd like to speak to you about this issue because uh, I work with the VA, advise and consult with the VA. Um, I'm also uh, the Vice President of the Benefits Fund for Veterans Locally. Um, as well as the AVVA and past commander of the Veterans of Foreign Wars and AMVETS. Um, I, I believe they said 11 years now. Well, that's just, that's it's madness. Um, you know, I'm looking at this letter that I submitted to you guys from Congressman Mike Thompson, and uh, conveniently enough, I was having lunch today with Stephen Gale, those of you who know who Stephen Gale is, wonderful uh, gentleman that works for Congressman Mike Thompson. This letter, uh, we, we took note of, if you look at the ad, uh, date on it, November 1st, 2018. So I'm just curious when the council decided to start ignoring sitting U.S. congressmen, because this letter has been in the council's hand for some time now, but yet it was never brought forward for some reason. And Mr. Mike Thompson cared so greatly about this letter that he actually crossed out Mr. Glenn's name and hand wrote it with a little handwritten letter. But conveniently, veterans was mentioned in the, the final plan once, that's it. Not to mention there's been bullet points submitted. So when we say we've had 20 meetings of community engagement, excuse me if I don't believe you. I think some things have been omitted. And it sounds like we're not, we're talking about multiple plans at this point. So moving forward, if we ignore the veterans, will they go away? No, then we won't. Furthermore, those of you that aren't aware, there's gonna be a new VA facility out off Corporate Center Parkway, maybe a mile away from this park. Why wouldn't we want to endorse that, embrace that? Just, just curious. So while we're tearing down homes, hopefully we can create some more. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa Kianta followed by Virginia Hutz. Is Melissa here? Okay. Uh, Virginia Hotz followed by Tim Luelas. Steen Hoven. I'm a Roseland resident. I live about 10 blocks away from Roseland Creek Park, known as the neighborhood by many people who work on the project for 20 plus years. Um, I'm also a board member of the California Native Plant Society, although I'm not speaking for the CNPS this evening, 
but as an interested resident. I'm also a former naturalist and uh, environmental educator. I work with the California Academy of Sciences and I'm co-chair of our education and outreach program. We've had several contacts with um, the Roseland schools and uh, we, in fact, there are, as a result, the teachers at, uh, there are two teachers at Roseland University Prep, as well as the principal and teachers at Shepherd School who are very interested in this park as a resource. Um, I feel that it's a far better investment for the city to allow conservation, restoration, and education to be the focus of the park in its entirety in that um, we're facing this horrendous climate crisis. The valley oak trees that are represented by a juvenile oak woodland in the park um, are uncommon in terms of it being a juvenile oak woodland in the Santa Rosa Plain. There are not very many left of those. And the habitat in, uh, represented, all the habitats, the meadowlands, the juvenile oak woodland, the riparian corridor, represent heat reduction, pollution reduction, um, a, a chance for the schools to have access to environmental education activities without having to charter a bus, which is extremely costly. Schools right now are walking to the parks, residents and members of the business community, veterans, everyone can walk to this park and not get in their car and jump in. I encourage you to, re to uh, reconsider the uh, extensive development of the Southern Acre. Thank you. Tim Luales, followed by Catherine Kirst. Uh, my name is Tim Llewellyn. Uh, I'm a resident uh, in the Roseland area for the last eight years. I attended many of those meetings, the planning meetings um, regarding this open space um, and I don't recall anybody at, at those meetings wanting sports arenas, barbecue pits, um, exercise trails. It was all nat nature. Uh, we want an open nature park. Uh, it's the best use for that area. If you got feedback from the community that they wanted all this construction and things, I guarantee they don't live within our community. They're not in the Rosen area because they won't have to deal with the riffraff, the late noises, um, the traffic on our streets, which are horrible to begin with. Um, you know, um, we want an open natural park. We want as little development uh, as possible. Um, and I don't think that's asking too much. It's the best use for that land. Thank you. Kathy Kirst, followed by Suzanne Retta. I'm Kathy Kirst, and I'm also known as the Pickleball Ambassador for Santa Rosa through the National Pickleball Association. I would like to address adding pickleball courts to the sports court section of the park. And indeed, I was not aware of the controversy regarding the community park, but here goes. <laughs> to be closer to our granddaughters, my husband Ken and I moved here eight years ago from Virginia, where we had learned the game of pickleball. The week before our arrival, pickleball had been introduced in Windsor through the Rec and Parks program and we joined in the fun. Within a year, pickleball began at Finley Community Park and through Rec and Parks, several of us <laughs> volunteered to teach pickleball on five successive Saturdays. And fast forward to today, overall participation at Finley and at courts at Howarth Park has grown over to 200 players. Mornings we see 24 to 30 players at Finley, I'm there every day, and large numbers of Howard as well. We have a website, Facebook page, email list to connect players and publicize local winners of tournaments throughout the country and the world. I would like to make just two points. One is that if the city can continue to grow pickleball, many of us would be willing to again volunteer our time at Saturday, on Saturdays to teach new players through Rex and Parks promotion. And secondly, I want to emphasize that pickleball is a sport for all ages. When I ask my granddaughters if they want to go get ice cream, do a puzzle, work on an art project, or play pickleball, they invariably exclaim, pickleball! Through building more courts, Santa Rosa can lead the way in promoting family fun, learning and exercise, and walking through the park. 
Thank you. Suzanne Retta followed by Sylvia Langan. Can I have one point, technical point? I've been sitting here since five and I sort of didn't like that you dropped the three minutes to two minutes, but I'll try and talk as fast as I can. And if I go over just a few seconds, I hope you'll indulge me, okay? Uh, y quería hacerlo en español, pero no tengo el tiempo. Hacerlo doble, en una idioma y otra. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, I should say, Mayor and the members of the City Council. I am Suzanne Retta, a member of the Madrone Audubon Society of Sonoma County. I have been a member for 32 years, and currently I serve as the treasurer. I am here in support of the community effort to ensure that the Roseland Creek 20 acres remain protected and available for the public to enjoy. The preserved property is a lovely location for peace and passive recreation in the middle of the Roseland District, which has few natural open spaces in the area. It is like cultivating a central park, similar to the famous one in New York City, here in the heart of the Roseland. But this requires a coordinated and careful effort to ensure the property, the preserve itself is not damaged and the birds, wildlife and people will have the opportunity to enjoy this special place long into the future. Our Audubon chapter wants to be a leader and continue to collabor collaborate with the city to ensure the preserve is not damaged. We also understand other voices in the community are calling for the preserve to be made into sports courts and playing fields. Perhaps a search for a more suitable location can be made to address the need for a recreational sports field that is also important to the Roseland community. We understand that. I can think of three possibilities right now the old airport area next to the abandoned KBVF radio station property and adjacent to the other property owned by the Santa Rosa JC, which abuts Wright Road. Although I hesitate to suggest any other open areas that have birds and other wildlife living there, probably wildlife that has been displaced by development elsewhere in the city. I know that there are California quail and perhaps burrowing owls living amongst the broken concrete piles of the airport. Our Madrona Audubon Society the advisory group to address how the plan may be implemented and changed, working with all concerned entities to assure. Okay, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to move. All right, thank you, Suzanne. Sylvia Langan, followed by Bill Halusak. Ma'am. Sylvia? Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Okay, please, we have others that would like to share their thoughts with us to Sylvia. Please turn them. Dan, could we please ask her to please stop so we can listen to the other, please? Go ahead, please. I just want to see if my card's in there, Melissa Newfer. I turned it in before Sylvia Langan, so I just want to make sure. I'll, I'll check. Go ahead, Sylvia. Okay. Good evening. My name is Sylvia Langan. I, I am a teacher at Rosaland University Prep. I have worked for the Rosaland School District for the last 22 years. Uh, I know Rosaland. I am here tonight to express my support for preserving restoration and education of the Rosaland Creek Park. Uh, with my AP classes, I have had the opportunity to visit the Rosaland Forest and put in practice what we are learning in class about ecosystems and the importance of the forest to mitigate the effects of climate change. Students can read about all these concepts, but having this direct experience is precious and priceless. These are experiences that they will never forget. Rosaland Creek Park is a little oasis in the middle of this urban community. We are so blessed to have this treasure in our neighborhood. This is a treasure that we have to embrace and nurture back to its natural beauty and health. Trees heal our bodies and minds as they give us oxygen and help us relieve stress, among other benefits. 
in the name of progress, we humans have covered the land with concrete. We have a great opportunity to make a stand in favor of nature. We have a great opportunity to set an example for future generations and tell them that we care about nature. Let's preserve the park for families and their children that attend local schools. Thank you. Bill Howuzak, followed by Melissa Neufer. Hello, City Council. I'm affiliated with uh, Sonoma County's Trails Council that provides access to out of, out of the way places. I'm a uh, member of the Pepperwood Preserve. I work with Sonoma County Regional Parks. I volunteer with them and community bikes. This being said, I think it's a, it would be a missed opportunity to, to embellish or try to gild the lily, so to speak, of, Sonoma, of, of Rosen Creek Park. It is a, it's a jewel. It has oak trees. It has uh, other native species that it joined. It has a riparian corridor. It, it's going to have a bicycle path. And I didn't see anything in the in the plans about bicycle racks, by the way. That it's it's just such a it's it's unique to the center of Santa Rosa to have a, a wilderness like this so close that can be walked to. That this could be non-ambulatory uh, accessible. It's flat. It's just it's just beautiful to, to to put anything concrete or steel or that would create noises and things like that. It's just is just, I think, consider a travesty. So let's let's leave the thing beautiful like it is, or maybe just enhance it and make it available for people who can enjoy it uh, with with little effort. And it's like I said, it's right in the center of Santa Rosa. What could be better than that? Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Melissa, followed by Paige Hotkiss Needleman. Am I on? Uh, thank you for being here and listening. Uh, I teach biology at Roseland University Prep High School, and I want to preserve the area uh, as a nature area for educational and environmental restoration, education and preservation purposes, and uh, not develop it in ways that don't align with these goals. Sonoma County Ag and Open Space District helped purchase this 20-acre location, and their mission is to protect natural spaces and scenic open space for future generations. In the city plans for this park, is there is no discussion of natural resource conservation happening on an ongoing basis. Adding turf and sports courts will negatively impact accomplishing this goal as it will disturb wildlife, introduce light, noise pollution, use excess water, and, and such. We just declared a climate emergency. Why not use this park as an environmental education facility and nature preserve so that we can help achieve these goals? As a biology teacher in Roseland, I often take my students to this nature area, a 10 minute walk, we have class for the day. We learn about the impacts of climate change, interactions of ecosystems, importance of biodiversity. We currently use this 20 acre park to collect data in order to answer their own scientific questions. They presented to local biologists from the community. Students can work to collect data for citizen science projects that study phenology in the area, and students from the high school are now working on creating curriculum for the local elementary schools to help engage them in experiencing nature. In 2005, Richard Liu wrote that our youth are experiencing high levels of nature deficit disorder. They're not spending enough time outside in nature. Why not let the Roseland students learn the value and importance of nature? This leads to more adults who become conservationists, and this aligns with our goals of climate resilience. We could create a model of nature park that promotes the principles of climate resiliency, like the Sustainable Water Conservation Project here at the City Hall, completed in 2015. Students can help create interpretive signs and help them. Thank, thank you. Paige Hotchkiss Needleman, followed by John Murray. Hello, my name is Paige, and I grew up right next to this park, leaving from my backyard to walk through to this park. And I just want to emphasize that this is a small piece of land. This is not a very large piece of land, and don't believe that it can really fit all of the proposed um, amenities, especially the central outdoor nature center or community farm. That is a very small area that actually has mostly trees. So it's a lot of trees and some grasslands in the north. So I just want to emphasize that it is a very small parcel, and I don't believe that it can um, support all of the amenities that have been proposed. 
However, whatever the community wishes, I do believe is the best. Um, although this has been a refuge for me and for many others that I know, it is already a park and it's already a place where people come for all kinds of uh, reasons, such as a refuge amidst a busy city. And I want to mention that just below this parcel, right next door, is a, uh, a couple of farmland parcels that were mentioned earlier, and those are slated for development of 146 acre um, units, 146 units that are proposed to be developed there. And I just want to say that that does not align with the master plan of the city of Santa Rosa. It's going to create a lot of traffic. It's going to create a lot of problems for the neighbors all along the McMinn Avenue. You have to realize that this park borders people's backyards, and so there's going to be all that type of commotion in the park, and not to mention this uh, this um, this here housing development that I recommend all you folks please come out next Wednesday, January 22nd at 5 p.m. to speak on behalf of yourselves and your communities in regards to this development. There's just been a development right next to that with several units and another development right across the street one block away as well as another development down the street and five total developments within a half acre. So I just wanted to say that this is a beautiful park. Whatever the community wants, I support, but it's we need more park space in Roseland. Thank you. Thank you. John Murray followed by Anna Munoz. Yes, hello, uh, John Murray here. I'm uh, chiming in in agreement with all of the other people that are proposing the nature park that we've uh, gone to meeting after meeting after meeting. I think we've missed a few meetings, but it's been more than 12 years now. Um, some of us, uh, myself, for example, I've commuted and I lived in my truck, and when I do get a chance to get home, I like to take a nice walk. Uh, my current, one of my favorites is walking the creek over by uh, a place to play, a huge park over there. It has a totality of one bathroom and a couple of porta potties. And uh, I'm thinking that we have an excessive amount of restrooms that will be presented to uh, whoever. Granted, we need to have a restroom if we're going to have a, uh, you know, some kind of a, a developed park, which was never the intent all along for our perspective, from the neighbor perspective. Um, others, I think, had different wishes. We went to the Bayer Farm uh, proposals and listened while everything was proposed, you know, everything under the sun for Bayer Farm Park. And I think that we can see what we have now at Bayer Farm Park. They, they've got a lot of concrete. Um, again, back to the Roseland Elementary, or the Roseland Creek Park, we're trying to make that, uh, as we always were, we're trying to make it a nature park, something calm and soothing. and. Uh, Oh, that's about it for me. Just a, a vote of uh, what you've already been hearing here. Thank you. Thank you. Anna Munoz followed by Tatiana Peavy. I'm over here. <laughs> My name is Anna Munoz and I am a resident of Roseland. And um, I am like to say that it is a shame that city council being temporary positions have uh, no memory of things that have been going through the years with regards to this property. The, the people of Roseland have time and time again requested because of the stream that crosses that land that provides a beautiful place for animals, plants. We ask that they put in natural plants, native plants, so that they enhance what is already there and save the million dollars, the million dollars that they want for, what do they call it? Mitigation, somebody is out to get a million dollars so that we can put a parking lot in the place so that we can put a playground that we don't want. It is, I think it is a shame that having a piece of land that has a wonderful park, a beautiful stream going through it that provides a natural habitat be destroyed because it will be destroyed. There is, uh, I, I am a walker and I normally walk through the park I cross the street, there is a uh, walkway that goes all the way to Stony Point. And unfortunately, along that uh, road, there are a lot of people who camp. And it is becoming impossible to, to use that area for just walking. 
And so instead of spending the million dollars for mitigation, bring more natural plants, turn it into a botanical garden of sorts. And uh, please, we do not want to have people have been imported to be homeless in our land. We are the people that you represent. We voted to you to represent our needs. And I think it is important that you remember, we are the ones that pay your paycheck, not the people that come from uh, Missouri or, or Alaska. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Tatiana Peavy followed by Jim Bray. Hello, I'm Tatiana Peavy. I am a four-year resident in Roseland, um, and it's a wonderful community. Um, and it's a community that is in development, um, and parks are a wonderful addition uh, to our neighborhood. But I believe that the changes on how the Roseland Creek Park is being designed will be a detriment to our community. Building of structures, bathrooms, lots, trails is an invitation for overnight visitors, such as the growing homeless population less than a mile north. I believe the original plan for the park was to have a place for um, and to show our native plant species, uh, unique Burbank hybrids, um, you know, and of course our family of uh, fearless turkeys that we have living there. This is also a path that children used to walk to school or used to walk um, to the already existing park over at Roseland Creek Elementary. Um, I think if we take a look at Olive Park and the park across the street from Shepherd Elementary, both of those parks have structures that are aimed towards family and community event usage, um, but after 4 p.m. those structures serve as a meeting place for drug users and bench campers. And I already saw a man sleeping on the, um, on the area that was recently destroyed over on um, McMahon. There was a house that was there and it's just a foundation that was left over. People are already sleeping there. Um, I'm opposed to the proposed structures uh, in our neighborhood. Like a gentleman said earlier, more trees, less concrete, um, a natural park, preserving the flowers, plants, trees, and wetlands is welcome, but excessive spending on structures and unnecessary, um, it's, it's even negligent when that money could be better spent helping our current homeless crisis. Um, and instead of creating a new Joe Rodota camp in our literal backyard. So please, no park structures, it's the green choice and it's also the family friendly choice. Thank you, Jim Bray followed by Jim Gillooly. My name is Jim Bray. Uh, I moved to the Roseland area 10 years ago and right away discovered this wonderful uh, woodland that was three blocks away from my house. And so my grandchildren and I, on our weekly walks down there, we, we called it the Wild Park. And so when I started attending the meetings uh, that were being convened to talk about what to do with that space, I always thought of it as a Wild Park. And I really support those elements of the plan that in, keep it as a wild park. I've also attended all the meetings, at least I think I have, over the last 10 years about this. And I have, I, I want to commend the city staff for the job they did in bringing together different elements of the community. I don't like all elements of the plan, however, I never heard this much opposition at any of the meetings that I attended. And therefore, I think that the city, plan the city planners have done a really good job of bringing together the different ideas that over 10 years have been put forth. It's a compromise. And I think we have to learn to live with those compromises. So I'm going to say that I endorse the adoption of the plan because I think that they've done a good job of getting the feel of the entire community. Thank you. Thank you. John Galuli followed by Amanda Tottenmeyer. Uh, hello, my name is John Galuli and uh, I'm a relatively new resident of Santa Rosa. I live uh, right at the very edge of Roseland and I have walked through this area, this park area several times. Now. My role in coming here is to talk to you just a little bit about the experience of being in a nature park in the middle of the city, the coolness of the ground, the green colors, nature, just walking through it and the peacefulness of it. Now, at the beginning of the environmental movement a long time ago, one of the statements was that uh, the land or nature didn't have anyone to speak for it, that people had to do that. 
And there's this whole idea that you have to develop something, put something into it, manipulate nature to make it better. There is something about an original piece of land that is as it is, just as it is, the way it is. And I think by preserving this as a nature park, which I, from what I've read and seen, almost 20 years went into this by very devoted people who wanted that. And also the people that ring the park, those that would be most affected by who use the park, also want it to be a nature park. So uh, I think that's important. And a, a last item, and this is somewhat different, is that I live near Olive Park and I have walked through there and I wouldn't, I wouldn't take my wife or child into that park. It's like a, a center for homeless camp encampments or walked along the river road where millions of dollars were spent on that river restoration in downtown and it's filled with garbage. Uh, it's not maintained. I, I don't think it's right to create another park that may fall into the same kind of disuse that I see in our city parks that were meant for people. Thank you, John. Amanda Totemeyer, followed by Lima O'Brien. Yes, my name is Amanda Totemeyer. I have lived in, uh, on Burbank Avenue in Roslyn for 40 years. Uh, love the community. The park designation is about seven minutes walk at the most. Um, I am, I'm hearing everybody, but I am talking for, regarding the dog park. I am an owner of a dog. I walk her on leash. Everyone walks up and down Burbank, has their dogs on leash. I can almost guarantee you if you build the park, you're gonna have unleashed dogs because it's roaming. They're not gonna hold on to them. I think a dog park, if you go through with having an actual park there, is uh, it, you should have a dog park. It's a great area for dogs to play and get together. People can communicate with their dogs and talk. And I just, I do, I highly recommend a dog park. Also, this is only the second notice and I've lived there 40 years. I received one last year. I could not make it to a meeting and I received the one for tonight to come here. That's the only two and I've been at the same residence for 40 years. So I don't know anything about all the schools, all the meetings there. I knew nothing about them. I was never uh, offered uh, to voice an opinion. But anyway, I'm here for the dogs and um, we need a dog park. Thank you. Thank you. Lima O'Brien followed by Larry Hansen. I am interested in just having a natural park, a healing park. And since we live in Roseland, maybe a little bit, somebody could plant some roses out there for a little natural gardening. Other than that, I think um, less is best to have a nat natural, natural area for us, which is, like I said, uh, a special place in our area. We don't have too many of these kind of places left. And less cement. We have plenty of cement in the city. So if anybody wants cement, they can go to the city. You want, we just want a nice uh, nature park where you can retreat in a quiet little place and meditate. And so let us just preserve the land that we have. We don't, we don't have that much land left. So let's just enjoy what we have and let nature take over. Thank you. Thank you. Larry Hansen followed by Alicio Pachuca. Hi. Uh, so, um, you know, Roseland is uh, dear to my heart. I uh, was a, a teacher here in Roseland District uh, for over 30 years. And uh, one of my uh, main emphasis was on uh, environmental education. And, uh, and so at the time, you know, we had the, the money to uh, go on field trips. So I took my, uh, my uh, class on field trips all over the place. We'd go to Annadale Park, we'd go to, you know, Sonoma to uh, Bouverie and uh, various other places. Um, but we all had to kind of get on a bus and travel someplace. And uh, 
here, there's an opportunity for uh, Roseland School or even uh, some of the other schools in the vicinity to come and, and visit a natural area. To, for the kids to experience what a natural area is like, urban kids really uh, oftentimes don't get the privilege of spending time and, and having some guidance in a natural area uh, that they really need. Uh, but in the, so anyway, today I'm representing uh, Forest Limited. Uh, so today, you know, I kind of head up an organization where we uh, protect forests and uh, we do major uh, tree planting. Like last uh, last week, we planted 1,400 trees uh, in two operations on Saturday and Sunday. So we're very, uh, you know, um, aware of how important it is for natural areas, for, for uh, trees and forests to be here. Uh, and uh, so I have participated in many of the um, uh, sessions in which, you know, we invited the public and come and talked and, and uh, we, and I would, oh, <laughs> there it goes. And anyway, I, uh, we, we support the nature park here. Thank, th thank you, Larry. Elsie Opechuca, followed by Virginia Lazo. So hello, my name is Eliseo Pachuca. I've been in the Roseland District my whole life, 15 years. And frankly, I just find it kind of weird that we're trying to create a Frankenstein of parks. We already have Hearn Park and the Lopez Park, the community park, and we also have Bear Farm, each of which provide the features that we are trying to put into this new park. Um, those parks also have a problem, which is we don't put enough maintenance in the already existing parks. If you just go and take a walk in Hearn Park, you will find that the concrete's broken, the fields aren't taken care of, and they're just not very friendly. So, yeah, I mean, it's just irresponsible of us to create a whole new park and not just take care of the ones that we already have. Also, I find that we should uh, protect what we already have there, which is nature. We don't have a lot of nature in Roseland, and we're destroying what little we already have. As students of RUP, we have been visiting this preserve and we have found that it's beautiful, that it has lots of nature. It is a host to many species of animals and plants. Destroying that would be just hypocritical of us because we've emphasized that we are very eco-friendly, yet we're turning our backs on this park that already exists. I believe that we should preserve it and just keep it going as a nature preserve and not turn it into a park. Um, yeah, just let's keep it a park and not turn it into just what we're doing right now. I mean, yeah, it's nature. Let's keep it that way. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Virginia Lazo followed by Audra Lehman. Um. I, I am not able to explain in English, and the teacher is going to help me translate, okay? Uh, I have four points. <laughs> Tengo cuatro puntos que voy a explicar. El primero, eh, estamos viendo en Roseland muchas construcciones de vivienda y edificios. Esto está causando mucho tráfico y contaminación. Now we are seeing in Roseland a lot of building of uh, buildings and traffic, and this is causing a lot of traffic, a lot of congestions, a lot of problems. Pollution. Mm -hmm. uh, the second point, uh, we need to conserve the natural. We don't want to more edification, buildings, no, please, natural, we need natural. We need air. The third point, uh, queremos que el parque sea un pulmón de oxígeno. We need uh, the, que no haya más contaminación, por favor. Uh, we want the park to be a um, land of oxygen and we don't want more contamination. No pollution. Y mi cuarto punto es una preocupación acerca de la calle que está cruzando donde se va a construir el parque, se llama Purban Avenue. Por favor, manejen en esa avenida. Las familias que caminan sobre esa avenida no tienen el sidewalk, o sea, ellas caminan, el tráfico, los carros caminan a la par con, las, con la gente. 
por favor, hagan algo con esa calle. Necesitamos que los recursos lleguen a, y construyan algo adecuado en esa calle para las familias que están caminando allí. So finally, she's talking about um, Burban Avenue. Uh, the families are walking in the street apart with the cars, uh, and it's very dangerous, so they need sidewalks to be safe. And so if you go and drive on those uh, in Burbank Avenue, you are going to see, or if you walk in Burbank Avenue, you are going to experience the problem that is walking in that part. So we need the resources to go and help the families to be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Audra Lehman, followed by Cindy Crowder. Hi, I'm a resident of the Roseland area for the past few years, um, and I, I feel like I'm just going to be very redundant given everything that you've heard already, but I would just echo the sentiments and support of keeping that area uh, for conservation, for restoration, and education. I think the residents of Roseland deserve all the amenities that uh, residents in more affluent neighborhoods deserve, uh, but this is such a gem. Um, it's a place where you can go and just feel the earth and the water and that creek. If it got restored, it would be, it would just amplify the positive effects. Speaking as a physician, I can just say that time in nature is incredibly healing. It's calming for the autonomics. Everybody needs it. And it's a sweet gem. If we look at what we have and, and really nurture it and support it and build it out, as it can be with native uh, plants and flowers and the grasslands and not build it out with concrete and structures that aren't necessary there. And I just want to present the, the considerations of how it really interacts with the issues of homelessness in our community and gang activity. Um, please, let's protect that area from, from those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Cindy Crowder followed by Alex Sebastian. Thank you for your efforts in this area. Uh, much of what I've said, uh, much, much of what I would say has been said, but we do support uh, the natural environment. We do not support uh, hard spaces or more room for meth addicts and homeless people to take over. Um, I know it sounds harsh, but I'm quite tired of paying for parks that I cannot use. Um, I do recommend um, that we spend any savings on the roads. We make sure that the traffic that would be coming there is not impacting the schools and also uh, no lighted fields. I live just right across from Cook Junior High School and having those not lighted at night means, makes our neighborhood safer. Thank you. Thank you. Alex Sebastian followed by Jeff Bodwin. It's light on. Oh, there we go. Um, I concur with the sentiments expressed by the, by the vast majority of others uh, regarding keeping this park natural. I think we have enough other parks that offer the things that could be eliminated from this park to achieve that uh, natural goal. I would maybe have the exception of a restroom because without one, you know, we're going to have some degradation of the environment or people who hopefully are only walking to the park would uh, be pressed to uh, relieve themselves without one. Um, again, there are a park just down at the other end of Burbank Avenue with plenty of parking and all those type of facilities uh, that aren't really needed at this park. Um, but traffic, I think, is a huge problem already on Burbank. I didn't buy into the conclusions of the EIR for the Roseland School. I can't even get out of my lane at times. I can't get past the school at times. And if you have two more parking lots to have people who really should be walking to the park, because it is a local park, then we're gonna have more congestion. You got people parking in the bus stop where they're not supposed to be parking. You got people parking on the shoulders, tearing up the mud. I'm not sure what the improvement plans for the edge there, but hopefully it's not curb and gutter consistent with other elements of your plans regarding the scenic corridor there. It may not be the technical term, but I think you know what I mean. Um, so we really uh, think you need to keep this park natural, and uh, we have an opportunity for this park to not contribute to climate change, which was obviously the focus of your earlier agenda item, and it could continue its job as uh, carbon sequestration 
uh, while the natural environment there. So I think you'd be remiss in approving the plan as it stands based on the preponderance of comments uh, supporting it as a natural park. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Bodwin. Hello. Hello, my name is Jeff Bodwin. I'm a 36 year resident of Moreland Avenue um, and I had the opportunity to uh, be on the board to build Andy's Park and that consists of um, 10 tent meetings and then monthly meetings um, from the start of it to fruition. And we had to battle to get the things that we want wanted there. And it seemed to work out at the end. The funding kind of fell at the end. But I don't think you're hearing these people because I don't hear anybody saying, we want concrete, we want basketball courts. So, um, I mean, you put that blurb up there, how many people or how many, how many meetings you've had. And it doesn't say what these people are saying tonight. So I think you're serving them an injustice by not listening to what they're saying and uh, giving them the opportunity. You gotta take another year. I think you should have the community come out and address that. If not, you should listen to these people here that are speaking on behalf of nature because it is a climate crisis and uh, these people need to, um, you need to hear what they're saying. So I thank you for the opportunity. Um, public service is the most amazing thing I've ever done. Um, the three years I get to spend um, working with uh, the people from Bear Farms, um, that's what that's what really got the passion for me. I was going over, I was riding my bike back from Santa Rosa. No one had told me about Bear Farms, you know, when we were building this project, we were like two years into it. And I went there and it happened to be a day where the, a Friday where they were having appreciation for um, people that worked in that garden. And that place is freaking amazing. People get together in nature and it's real and it's tangible and we're going to ruin it if we, we pay them. Thank you. Those are all the cards I have. Do we have any more, Dina? I'd like to speak. No. Could you fill out a card, Dwayne? It's a public hearing, sir. I'll do that afterwards. Actually, it's... It is. Public hearing. So hold on just a sec, Dwayne. Do we have any additional cards? Okay. Go ahead, Dwayne. Actually, I'll come down front. My name is Dwayne DeWitt, I'm from Roseland, and I wanted to say that you should continue this item and do an EIR, an environmental impact report, for the road building and parking lot construction project, which is actually being disguised as a park project. Essentially what's being proposed by staff is lots of concrete and lots of development. I also submitted over 150 signatures on a petition for our community ideal plan, which was done in July of 2018 and staff didn't give it to you. Excuse me, July of 2019, staff didn't give it to you. So <clears throat> close to 300 people have signed petitions against your plan. City staff have neglected to put the letter from Congressman Thompson from November of 2018 into the packet, though that was delivered to you earlier also. We veterans are volunteering to do the community garden the city is forcing onto the site. No one asked for that. The city said we had to have it. Land Pass says they can't do it. Jonathan Bravo at Bayer Farm says they don't have the capacity. So 1400 Burbank Avenue was bought for a bike path. That was the original reason over 10 years ago, City Councilman Wysocki attended the meetings and we will do the Veterans Trail there. This is where we could have the healing garden and the grove. The demographics of park equity map right behind me up there show that our area needs to have more nature, just like the other nice areas of Santa Rosa have nature. So <clears throat> in closing, people in our area are also afraid of the homeless. You remember that story about Kiwana Springs Community Park and the homeless? There's homeless out there right now at our park and we veterans go and ask them to leave when we can. Sometimes they ignore us. They're still out there. Last but not least, nature parks are healthy for both people, animals, and our climate. Save our nature, save money. The ideal community plan was turned into you in July, 2019. Staff chose to ignore the people. We're asking you to let local people this project. 
Thank you. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone else who would like to address this item, this topic with council? You don't have to fill the card. Please identify yourself and go ahead. Okay. My name is Carol Cleso, and I just wanted to uh, bring attention to the, the city council that in your email boxes today is a link to Andy's Unity Park video. And for anybody here who would like to see some hope in their life, they ought to watch that because what this video talks about is it talks about what can happen when people from the community, neighbors, uh, city council members, uh, nonprofits and businesses in the community come together and they build something really important. So there's a lot more that can come out of uh, creating a park when you offer the opportunity for all people to uh, participate and uh, relationships can be made that will last forever. You could bridge the gap between old people, young people, and people of different ethnic groups. And uh, I'm really proud to see what the people of Moreland have done, not just with the park and Andes, but in their community because they work together. So thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council on this item? Hi, I'm Oshi Ingram and I live right next to this park. Um, it's a beautiful park already, <laughs> and we would love to keep it that way um, for a few reasons. One of them is financial. Um, I don't know what the cost would be for putting in the different fields and bringing in water for the um, proposed farming area, um, as well as the bathrooms and so on. Um, but it seems that since we had a climate action um, earlier today, it might be nicer to not have those resources be diverted, um, such as you know water. We know that the cost of bringing water somewhere is expensive. Um, so hopefully that will be considered um, when you're thinking about this potential um, park. And also just that the community is using this park already. Um, it's kind of an existing beautiful walking space. I know there's veterans that go and enjoy this place as a natural space. Um, and we would hope that that could continue um, and not have, you know, um, fields and so on that are already in Roseland and other areas. Um, and we, I would like to say that um, Thank you to the Parks Department for pursuing this. You know, it's been a long road for you guys. Um, and and I know that there's been a lot of opposition to um, certain things that you proposed. Um, and, you know, I really appreciate that there is a lot of open space on the existing plan, and I think that's great. But I do think that the community at large um, would like to just keep it as an open space area um, and not have much more development on it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council? No, you only get one opportunity. Thank you for asking though. Anyone else? Go ahead, sir. I'm Harold Goldman. I'm a veteran of the Korean War and I spend a lot of my time with Vet Connect here in Santa Rosa. And I'm appalled that this council or any council has destroyed four houses on this piece of property that we're talking about that could have been housing veterans that desperately needed. And I think you guys ought to think carefully about that kind of stuff. Our veterans need you. You ought to help them. Thank you. Anyone else like to address the council? Go ahead. Step right up. Hi, my name is Michael O'Brien. Uh, just a, a really quick blurb. Uh, I have timed the, walked from the, the park to the uh, end of Burbank uh, um, Avenue to the large park that has all these amenities. It is like uh, practically on the dot for me, a, uh, a 10 minute walk. All right, thank you. Anyone like, else like to address the council? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing, bring it back to council. Any questions for staff? Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Jen, one question that I had was, if, if we were to entertain something that is a little bit more back to nature, 
What would that do to the environmental, to the basically the process and timeline for you? Let's see, I'm, I'm trying to look at this other plan I, I received. And so um, as, as far as a timeline for environmental, uh, right now it'd be uh, more development, but I kind of I want also want to look at Will to see if there's anything additional we would need to do if there was a, a reduction of amenities on site. Uh, the, the initial study prepared for the project, you know, looked at what was proposed at the time, and if you're doing a uh, more limited development on the site, then this the initial study that's been prepared already would address kind of the maximum impact that um, might be expected from development of the park. Okay, um, thank you. Mr. Dowd. I, I appreciate the work that staff has done and I, as I listen to the comments and the presentation by staff, it's been 20 years plus or minus on this uh, moving this thing along. And I guess my reaction to what I've heard this evening is we got a ways to go before we can end up with something that uh, there'll be a majority of the community uh, appreciates and wants. And so I guess my question is um, can we put together a, a motion to continue this and do some further work on it because I think that's necessary. Okay. Any other questions, Mr. Sawyer? Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> We've heard very clearly from those in attendance today, um, this evening. I'm curious, um, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, Jen, and, and your predecessors, but where did, if, you know, I, I have to believe, in fact, one, one person did mention it. He said that he didn't experience all of the controversy when he was at the prior meetings, and he mentioned that he had been to most of the meetings and did not experience this single-mindedness of, of a nature park. Not that that's a bad thing, but that there was more compromise and there was more activity or more conversation around um, some of the, um, the more active uses. Not that it's the majority of the park, clearly, but I'm wondering where are those voices tonight? Uh, they were clearly there in the past. Uh, we heard from one young man. The rest of the people in the audience tonight are adults. Um, so I'm curious, where did the where did the other ideas come from? And I'm sorry that they're not here to explain themselves this evening, but I I, I find that their absent their absence um, makes me scratch my head a bit. And I'm wondering if you have uh, a sense of the past and why they not why they are not here, but where these things where these other elements came from through your experience. I, I will do my best to try to answer that. It has been a long time with a variety of staff members over the years. And uh, uh, there, what we have seen at almost all of the community meetings and other, we have had online input as well as specific, specific meetings uh, with folks is a, a division in the neighborhood uh, that is clear. Um, I, nece I can't necessarily speak to people who aren't here, but um, anecdotally at the last garden uh, group meeting at Land Paths at Bear, uh, collecting feedback, uh, folks said that they felt, you know, when we asked if they would attend future meetings, they were um, said that they had already provided their comments and feel like they have done their uh, duty to provide what the what they want and they're tired of coming to meetings. But again, these are just some comments we're hearing. I don't have an overwhelming, uh, you know, big uh, picture view of why folks wouldn't necessarily attend the council meeting, uh, but there has been a lot of attendance, a lot of participation over the years uh, from a variety of folks who uh, clearly want active uses in the in this particular park, um, as we've identified here. So this, these things that you see here are coming from comments from uh, the community. It's not necessarily a staff production. So the st staff did not 
um, come up with a program and say, this is what we're thinking of doing, um, what do you think? This was, the, these ideas came from the community. Right, that is the evidence when you look back at the community documentation of meetings, there's been uh, links of summaries uh, before, from 2009 to 2010, lots of summaries that say, uh, that document this division in the community of folks who live closer by, who would uh, like a less developed park with uh, folks who would uh, like more activity, uh, closer to what you see here in, in the park with some picnicking, uh, restrooms and things like that. Um, as well as trails throughout the site. The nature center seems to have been a thought that has been put forth by the community that seems to be accepted by both groups. Uh, that's what their uh, evidence points to. Uh, with the rest of the uh, community improvements, such as the picnicking area um, and playgrounds, more 50-50 uh, split between those that really would like to see this here and, and um, uh, wonder why the city hasn't put in more active use spaces. Uh, to those who want uh, <coughs> nothing improved here. Uh, so it's been, it's been difficult for us to try to find a balance or a, uh, a place for some active uses in these parks. It's, it's not been something that we can, you know, I can only speak to the time I've been here at the city, but also looking at the documentation. Going back to 2009, this plan is supported by that documentation to say we would like, the community would like some active uses as well as uh, preserving the nature that is there with trails. So this is supported by the documentation. You. And um, you know, it's, I can't think of one park on the east side that is a nature park. I mean, there's state parks, um, Annadale and Spring Lake Park, um, county, county and state, but I can't think of one city park on the, on the in, in fact, in the city that is a nature park. Um, they are, as far as I know, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, as a lifelong resident in Santa Rosa, I don't, I can't think of one nature park where they don't have some kind of active uses, if not a, a fairly high level of active uses. So I, I find it, it's just, um, I find it interesting what we're faced with this evening. Thank you. Mr. Rogers. Piggybacking a little bit on uh, Councilmember Dowd's comments, you mentioned that as it pertains to the open space and ag grant that was used, that we have to construct at least some of the trail network that's here by 2021. Can you give us a, a little bit more specifics on what, what uh, in terms of a time constraint that we have, what aspects of the plan are under a time constraint and give us a little more specifics on, on that. Sure. Uh, in order to construct anything at this park site, the master plan and the environmental document must be adopted by council or we cannot construct anything. And I'll clarify that this trail here connecting McMinn to Burbank is the trail that's required to be constructed by 2021. Um, we have, as a city, asked for at least three extensions to the timeline we've had. We've been given by the Ag and Open Space District to uh, construct this trail. Uh, so uh, we have, <laughs> we would very much like to construct this trail. It is being used for students walking to school. Uh, it's not necessarily designated as a safe route to school, but we would like to uh, provide this improvement as well as the crosswalk to the school sooner than, sooner than later. Mr. Olivares. Yeah, I, I wanted to also uh, pay back on uh, Council Member uh, Dowd's comments about um, having a relook at this in some way. I mean, we just received this other alternative. Uh, so I'm interested to know what similarities and what differences are, are there really between these two plans? I, I don't know what that is. I think we need some time to see what that is. But we are, uh, from my perspective, dealing with a very unique piece of property and a very unique uh, community as well. Uh, I don't know that there are others like that, uh, Council Member Sawyer, but this is a unique piece. I think we have an opportunity to do it right. Uh, but, and, and, I, and I get that, I think both of them show that, that walkway, so I don't know that that, I don't know how that can happen, and, and maybe it can happen before uh, 2021, but as far as the other elements, 
Um, and again, not knowing, not, not having been at these processes to ask somebody what they, what they want in a park like this, yeah, you will get people to say, I want a place to play, I want this, I want that. Uh, but uh, somebody else had mentioned it that, also mentioned that some of these amenities are available in other nearby parks too. Uh, so uh, again, I think we have one shot at this thing. It's been uh, coming along here for over 10 years now. Uh, the young man was five years old when I think when this thing first started. So there's, a, and we, we heard from other students as well on, on some of this issue. So I'd like to see w what this actually looks like combined. Are, are we really that far off? Uh, and what processes and what uh, deadlines that we have to meet before we make a final decision on this. Ms. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Santos, you mentioned uh, earlier that the proximity of one's residence to the proposed development weighed heavily on um, the outcome in terms of the preference for uh, more unimproved, the closer one lived, and more improved, the further away one lived. Can you talk about, uh, and I know this is a difficult question to ask because it's much of it is probably anecdotal, how close the correlation was between proximity of residents and preference for an unimproved uh, uh, park? <clears throat> I think the distinction was really clear for, uh, earlier in the plan, in the process. Uh, the more we reached out to more diverse groups, uh, senior citizens, uh, elementary students, as well as high school students, uh, the more we saw um, a, core, uh, a more of a mixed view throughout the community. Uh, but early on, there were folks considering themselves uh, neighbors. Uh, that would that were more preferential towards a completely passive park or a park without any or very little development. So there there isn't necessarily a you know a radius or anything like that, but uh, very close to within the park. Uh, early on, we collected addresses of folks uh, that were participating in the community meetings, and so we could kind of see a radius around the park. Uh, but again, the further out we went away from those earlier meetings, and the more diverse we got with the community input process, uh, we could see more of a mixed uh, mixed association with it. Do you see um, a, a preponderance of individuals who live nearby, what we, what we would just, without operationalizing it, call within close proximity to the park wanting um, an active use? Uh, we, we don't necessarily see that completely, except for at the elementary school. <laughs> we did collect a lot of input from the elementary students who would like a playground and more active use. Yeah, I can imagine that. Yeah. And then the further away you get, do you still see, do you start to see an increase in desire for active uses? A little bit, yes. We do see an increase again. It, more of that evidence is closer to 2009 and 2010. Uh, but yes, uh, we, we tend to see uh, the farther out you go, more active uses and less desire for active uses the closer you are to the park. Thank you for your close attention to that. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to follow up on Councilmember Sawyer's comment, I can't think of any city park currently that uh, is a nature park, but I do know that a parallel that we could draw from was our experience around the Southeast Greenway. Mr. Tibbetts. So it sounds like we're in the comments section, so I'm gonna make some comments, but there is one park that's pretty nature on the east side, and that's Flat Rock Park. Um, over uh, near Rincon Valley. Um, and, I think, and I think that it is important that Roseland has a park of similar status as well. Um, I, I think that you've got one heck of a tough job, Jen, because you know, I, I know how these situations go. The community meetings get held, the, the paper goes up on the wall, the dots go up on the wall, and then your job is to try to make everybody happy based on all those comments. And I actually wanna give you a lot of credit because you know, the proposal that you brought forward looks vastly different from what you and I and um, then Director Nutt uh, discussed probably a year or two ago where there was a lot of plastic features and, and different things that was clearly to me a hodgepodge of one of those community exercises or a series of them. And what you've brought to us tonight is um, what looks to me to be actually a pretty strong response closer to what um, a lot of the people in this room have been driving at, and I can understand why you, you know, it, it may not have gone all the way, but, um, 
you know, for me, what I see is a lot of folks in these, this room who are very organized, who are very passionate, who currently occupy the space and will likely occupy the space well into the future. Um, and I, and I want to thank the Roseland uh, educators and, and the neighbors that put this petition together. It was very, very informative. And as I look through that petition, you know, it was all the, all the addresses and names of people that I would, I wanted to see for a park. And that was McMinn Avenue, Sunset Avenue, Burbank, and it's, and so on and so forth. So I don't, I don't know if it's a matter of, um, I have the motion. Um, if I should put forward a motion recommending that uh, we go back to the drawing board to get closer to um, the, the quote, ideal community 2019 plan. Um, it sounds like that wouldn't be too burdensome. It sounds like the EIR would support it and we wouldn't have to make any significant um, changes to it. Uh, so I don't also see any further delays to that community getting this park or at least not substantial ones. So I, I look to staff for direction about how I should formulate this motion to move in that direction. I did. I, I Excuse me, let's point of order here. If you have a question for staff, ask it of staff. And uh, yes, you could, uh, if you would like, you can uh, offer a motion to continue the item and direct, with, with direction to staff to come back with uh, uh, your preferred uh, plan. Okay, so I will uh, move a uh, the resolution of the council to uh, direct staff to look at the community's presented ideal plan um, and bring it back to council. I would second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, just confirm, are you making reference to this document that we were handed out as the ideal plan? Well, I believe so. Um, yes, this is it. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, maybe to slightly amend that motion, uh, Jen, if you and your staff have the time, maybe reach out to some of the folks in this, this petition, maybe somebody or a handful of folks from the neighborhood, um, Roseland educators, and if there's any youth available uh, to contribute to that were on that petition to really hopefully lock up that, that vision. If, if okay. I may, um, yeah. just for purposes of the record, um, the uh, just to confirm that the plan that you are looking at is entitled Roseland Creek Neighbor Neighborwood Preserve Master Plan Proposal with a date of July 2019. Is that the correct it, um, it, it, I've, plan? This is that what you I are think referencing the, the yeah. petition references, but I just want to be sure that it does because it's okay. All right. That's what it is then. I simply wanted to, to clarify in the record what you were referring to. Thank I, you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Mayor, can I, can I add something to that? Absolutely. So let's go over. So we have a motion. Mr. Dowd had a second motion. Go ahead, Mr. Oliver's. Yeah, I wanted to ask when this comes back that, um, you know, I think when we've seen this, we've seen these these diagrams, uh, inception items here that are that are that give us some idea of where things are. But looking at the Rosen Creek Community Park um, plenary report, the, the study, there's telling pictures. I think that's that would be beneficial to us as well to actually see some pictures of the, this piece of property, real life pictures, because the ones that we have now are great. They, they you start to question some of the things we may want to do to that park because it is a beautiful nat natural place. So I think that they think that we can come back with some photographs as well so we have a better idea of what the terrain looks like. Okay, are there, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any additional comments before we vote, Mr. Alvarez? Did you want to add anything other than what you just added? No, I, I, I would encourage us to make physical visits, obviously, on our own, but I think for the purposes of the presentation, to have photographs here. That's all I had to say. Great. Mr. Sorry, you have any additional comments on the motion or process? No, I will voice that I am, um, I think there are a lot of young people that are going to be um, missing some opportunities in this space. Um, I'm not sure that we've heard their voices, and that does disappoint me. I'll move forward with, with the continuance and for, for more information. I'm not expecting the uh, sentiment to change much from what we are hearing, uh, what we are receiving, seeing this evening, but I think we are not hearing all the voices that were in the uh, development of this plan. 
and that's disappointing. Mr. Dowd, any additional comments? Well, I, I, I will say this, is that I, I want us to see us as a city do something for the area where this park is planned. Uh, I just think we need to get some more assurance that the plan that gets created is something the community wants uh, and we as a council can support. Thank you. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this discussion actually reminds me a lot of the uh, Roseland Village conversation that we had. Uh, on the one hand, we have a community that is clearly yearning for attention and has been neglected for a long time, and it'll feel really good when we actually move forward and have something to deliver. Uh, I, I am very cognizant of the fact that this is a community park, and what we are hearing from are the neighbors, and it's not a neighbor park. So I, I'm fine with us continuing this item, and in particular, I will tell you, because I am also really aware that you cannot undevelop a natural preserve like this, and I wanna make sure that we get it right, uh, but I do wanna make sure that part of the conversation does include the broader community's need and the broader community voices as well, uh, because I do think that this is an area that would benefit from additional parks as we have seen. Uh, I, I will support the continuation or uh, the motion uh, at this point, but I do want to make sure that when we come back that there is room for that conversation about uh, what the need is of the youth in the area. Mr. Chibbets. I just want to briefly say I, I appreciate the point that Council Member Rogers just brought up. You know, I, I like the approach that we're taking. The people who are here in this room tonight who have clearly put a lot of effort into organizing around this issue, um, we're listening to them, but we are also creating a future for additions. Um, that's how I understand it. We do have a master plan with an EIR that I, I believe could be called upon to an extent if um, I'm seeing you wanting to speak, sorry. It's an initial study, so all of the impacts of the project are mitigated to less than significant. Okay, so I see. Got it. Um, but uh, I still think that the, the concept stands that, you know, we're, we're keeping this close to, you know, what it essentially is today. And as generations change or, you know, people kind of start to access that park, they then too have the opportunity to organize and kind of come reach their council members. So I, I do like the direction this is going and thanks for bringing that up. Ms. Fleischmeier. Yeah, I, I suppose I differ a little bit from my council members in that I know just how important it is to have a park within walking distance when you have a young child and we're trying to become a city that is less dependent on bikes, I mean more dependent on bikes and walking and less dependent on cars and I think that this type of a park could really be a huge benefit to the community and that there has been extensive outreach done and it sounds like the community, not the community who came here tonight and I appreciate every voice that came here tonight and voice your opinion, but I don't see, as Mr. Sawyer pointed out, I don't see the kids. And I know just how hard it is to live in a neighborhood where you can't walk safely to a park. Up until six months ago, I didn't live within walking distance to a park, and it made my life so much more difficult that I had to wrangle a small child into a car seat and drive and park and get out and how much that depreciated from our enjoyment of the beautiful community in which we live. And so with that, the, the other consideration that I, that I take here is that staff has done a tremendous amount of work and we put a huge burden on them and I would be very willing to ask them to go back to the drawing board if I thought that the work hadn't been done. I believe the work has been done and I'm not willing to support kicking the can just because it's not politically expedient in this moment in this room. So, so for me, I, I will be supporting the most motion, but it is with reservations. And, and I'm thinking back to the community conversation we had, much shorter time frame. And I do apologize that, Jen, you've been put in this position and everyone in the neighborhood that it, it's taken this long. But I reflect back to the, the way we dealt with Coffee Park, where we had the number of community meetings, the input, and having been at those meetings where there's not one clear solution that everyone jumps on board with. And unfortunately, what I've heard people who've been at some of the meetings regarding this process over the 
the years that sometimes it's been adversarial and it's very disappointing to me that neighbor, you know, I know this council, you know, I'll speak for myself, but I'm pretty sure the rest of us, we want to do the right thing. What's in the best interest of the neighborhood and we don't want to mess this up. And I would just ask that if we, as we do continue this, to continue to try to collaborate and work with and actually hear what your neighbors are saying and not just it's my way or the highway. Because quite frankly, some of the conversations I've heard and the way it feels right here, it's like you want us to make a decision, but there's gonna be someone in the neighborhood that's not gonna like it. And again, thinking back the way we did the coffee park, I remember the one gentleman saying, you know, it's not perfect, I don't like it, but it was the best process here and we're gonna come out with this good product because this is gonna be a neighborhood for all, whether you're a neighbor here or you're a couple blocks away, it's, it's an asset for the community. So with that, we have a motion. Um, I need a point of clarification because I, I need to make sure staff understands it because as the motion sits right now, it's to go back and bring back something that's closer in alignment when, Roseland Creek Neighborhood Preserve and consult those folks that were part of the petition. That's the motion because I'm hearing different things from council. So I want to make sure that's clearly the motion because staff has spent a lot of time on that and I don't want to have them come back with a less than complete uh, enterprise. So I just want to make sure that we're clearly stating because that's the motion that the council member made and so it's very focused and I want to make sure that that's, that's what the intent is. So I'm, I'm open to interpretation from council if we want to cast a broader net. Um, I'm fine with doing that uh, beyond just this petition. Um, I think that would be a good idea, but I also want to be mindful of the workload and the workload that's already gone into this. I think what might just be the best outcome is if we do, and, and also the best outcome I believe is if we probably just bring back a plan closer to what is materialized tonight. Um, and then hopefully that becomes an opportunity for the folks who may have been at these community meetings to then say, it changed, I need to show up and voice my dissent for that change, and then we make that decision that night. I just want clarity so staff understands the assignment. Okay, Mr. Rogers? And I think following up on the vice mayor's point, I also don't want the staff plan to be scrapped entirely. So if there's a way to bring back uh, some form of a middle ground option that staff would be interested in, uh, after talking with the folks looking at this, uh, as well as bringing to us some more uh, of the need from the public for those amenities that were there, the, the voices that are not represented in the room, so, so that the council can really balance and weigh uh, this decision, and, and I will. I will say I'm. I am concerned about the delay uh, that, that that would cause. Um, I, I'm. I'm concerned that this is a community that has been starving for amenities, and I want to make sure that we also deliver on that. So once again, that's not the motion. So I, is the motion am amended at that point? I mean. I no. The, the motion was to bring it closer to the plan. Yes. So a middle ground is closer to the plan. Okay. Mr. Dowd? I, I concur with uh, Council Member Tibbetts and Rogers. My comment was not rubber stamp either one of the extreme plans, but it's let's work and see if we can find some greater opportunity for consensus. So it doesn't have to be either A or B that we've seen this evening. It can be something in between. So, so I understand that, but I'm, I'm struggling with timetable. I mean, I, I know this is, this is what staff's struggling with too. So is there an expectation of a, a minimum amount of community meetings? Is there something, is there some threshold that staff can meet in this exercise without us blindly going out and trying to say, are you, are you saying do three more community meetings? I'm just trying to get some clarity on, on what, what would reach council's desired outcome because as you heard in the room, I, we don't know, it's speculative, we don't know why folks wouldn't come out who have a more vested interest in particular amenities. So if, you, if you're just asking us to shoot in the dark, I'm having a hard time measuring that. So are we talking about three more, two more community meetings, one more community meeting, and a focus on the plan? I'd love to hear some kind of measuring stick from council on this. 
Mr. Tibbs, yeah, if you would clarify your motion. Yeah, thank you. For the sake of clarity, and I, I hear what we're, we're saying about the middle ground, but when I actually look at these and I look at what Jen has presented us with tonight, I actually am seeing that as the middle ground from where this was two years ago, because two years ago, this had a lot more amenities. Um, there was a lot more, if you all recall, in those, those meetings with staff. So I would suggest that we view that as the middle ground. Then we use this community proposal that was done tonight and then we, we just bring it back at a council meeting with those two and we do outreach in the community to support or look at these two proposals. I wanna make this easy and clear. Um, and so that, so that will be my motion. If somebody doesn't think that's the best motion, um, I would encourage them to put up an alternative. But I, I, I just very, um, you know, what we're even looking at here aren't even that different. It's really coming down to a picnic area, a multi-use field, and another bathroom for the most part. So how much, and, and I do, okay, the, the parking lots, but so my motion is please bring back this one with the other one. There you go. And we, we will do additional community outreach, uh, several community meetings to bring, I, I'm. For, for me, one that is well advertised okay. and outreach, particularly right. through the neighborhood in Roseland okay. Unified School District is sufficient. Thank you. So the two maps we're talking about was the one that you just referenced and the one that's attached in the staff report, correct? Those are the parameters. So it was your motion, Mr. Olivares, do you still concur with that second? Okay, any additional comments? Your votes, please. And that passes with four yes, three no, the no votes being to uh, Vice Mayor Fleming, Mr. Rogers, and Mr. Sawyer. All right, um, that motion or this item is done. We're now gonna take a 20 minute dinner break. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back, Mr. McGlynn, item 15.2. Item 15.2, report, review of the fire department staffing needs assessment. Tony Gossner, fire chief, introducing the item. Hello, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Tony Gosner, Santa Rosa Fire Chief. Uh, we're happy to be here today to present uh, the City of Santa Rosa Fire Department Staffing Needs Assessment that ESCI was uh, contracted to provide for us. To my right, I got Kurt Latipow, uh, Randy Parr, and Joe Parrott, from, all from ESCI. And they're gonna run through uh, 29 slides. Uh, in fairly short order, and uh, we'll get to some questions. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Kurt Latipow. Thanks, Chief. <clears throat> and thank you, Council, for letting us make this presentation to you this evening. Uh, and Tony already kind of queued it up for us. There it is. All right, so we have pre prepared this for the city, for the department, and here are the main points. That one, okay. We, uh, in accordance with the project scope of work, which was rather extensive, the study contains the following that you see in those bullets in front of you. I want to emphasize this is a snapshot in time that was taken about a year ago with minimal updates uh, as we move forward. And since that time, the department has continued to move forward, which is not unusual for... Could you get the microphone just a little closer? There we go. Thank you. How's that? Okay. Let me start from the beginning. Okay. <laughs> As I was saying, it's not unusual when we do these studies, the department continues to progress, they continue to make changes, they continue to implement uh, other programs. The study contains an evaluation of the level of staffing that existed within the Santa Rosa department when we started the study and pretty much is held true today. It's a needs assessment that we hope will assist in planning the future and provision of comprehensive services. The Great Recession has taken a toll on lots of cities within the state of California. There were a lot of cutbacks made at that time, and it's been a long time coming for agencies to come back up to speed, and it's no, been no different in Santa Rosa, what we found during the study. So the key findings that are in the report, I'll go right to the meat. The chief officers are assigned numerous collateral duties, not unusual when you compress the organization, when you eliminate positions. Uh, organizational restructuring, in our opinion, can enhance span of control, accountability, and efficiency. The current daily staffing uh, exceeds the recommended span of control for one battalion chief. There's 11 units that they're supervising. Typical span of control we recommend is five to one, six to one. The workload is greater than normal for an urban community. And in fact, uh, at the time we did the study, one of those re uh, response units was already exceeding the maximum unit hour utilization that we recommend, which once you start exceeding, it means that unit is not gonna be available for additional calls in certain periods of time. And here's the breakdown. Now I wanna clarify at the time we did the study, uh, these are 2018 statistics. So engine five was actually operating out of station one because of the loss of the station during the Tubbs fire. That engine has now been relocated to temporary housing. So if we were to run the data today, what you would find is not only is engine 11 exceeding max, uh, the recommended unit hour utilization, but so is unit one. The Fire Prevention Bureau staffing uh, during the recession, you started to down staff. The workload has increased by 51.3% between from 2014 to our end study year of 18. And some folks will account that to the Tubbs fire, some of it is. However, we started to see the increase in 14. Emergency Preparedness Coordinator, one of uh, an extremely important position in the city. The workload responsibilities exceeds the capacity. This was actually captured in the after action report for one of the fires. Use of overtime to maintain staffing is extremely high. Obviously that leads to expense. Uh, we have found when you have excessive overtime, it does in fact contribute to firefighter injuries. 
can in fact uh, impact decision making. And we're actually starting to see studies now that demonstrate it does have an impact on behavioral health. The department has insufficient extra personnel to minimize overtime expenses. In 2018, the injury leave required was an equivalent of four full-time positions. All of your anticipated, the, the anticipated annual time off is 15.14% of total work hours. We'll get into that a little later. Approximately 58,000 hours are needed to be backfilled every year. The finding is it's important that the department fill the current vacancies as soon as possible, and that when all those authorized positions are filled, uh, we're projecting another 14 firefighters would need to be uh, hired uh, to minimize the overtime. We were in fact asked to, uh, to review different work cycles, and at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Randy Park. Thank you. Uh, we were asked to review a uh, work cycle of 42 hours a week and also a 36-hour 30, work cycle similar to that used by the Santa Rosa Police Department. Uh, and then again, obviously, the, the current work cycle. Uh, the current work cycle is a 56-hour uh, plan. Uh, currently, there's 126 line positions authorized in the department at this point in time. Uh, overtime is uh, $3,514,000, and the total cost, salary, and benefits is uh, $36,442. We did discover uh, uh, a calculation error on the, um, the CalPERS calculation, which would reduce this by about a million dollars, down to about $35 million. On a 42-hour work cycle, um, it would take uh, 160 line positions to um, um, produce the same level of, of coverage uh, that is currently being handled by the uh, authorized 126 uh, positions. Uh, in addition to the 34 new positions it would take, we would recommend uh, adding an additional 28 positions uh, to reduce that overtime amount down to $175,000. Uh, the total cost uh, of the salaries and benefits uh, on this uh, alternative is uh, $41 million. A 36-hour work cycle also uh, creates uh, an additional 74 new positions uh, plus an additional 52 positions to achieve the same results as the, uh, the prior uh, work cycle, uh, the 42-hour cycle, and then compared that to the 56-hour the cycle. Again, the, the total uh, salary and benefits uh, for the department would be $50 million at that point in time. If we were to take the, the existing 56-hour work cycle uh, and fill all the positions that are authorized, up to the 126 positions that are currently authorized, we could add an additional 14 positions and reduce the overtime down to the $175,000. Uh, again, all things being uh, comparable uh, and absent uh, a major incident such as another wildfire or any other large uh, large scale disaster that would uh, recall, that would cause uh, additional firefighters to be recalled. Uh, this uh, would result and the uh, total salaries and benefits for the organization being $33,600,000. A quick comparison, uh, and again, we're comparing just the line positions, but um, we're also comparing the total cost of salary and benefits for the line positions, the prevention division, uh, and the, uh, oper the um, administrative positions. Uh, I know it looks a little strange to see going to 140 uh, line staff and reducing the cost of the organization uh, by a couple million dollars. Again, you're at $3,500,000 in overtime, and we're gonna leverage that overtime, uh, those hours on the overtime into full-time positions is, will be the recommendation that we're, we're making. 
Kurt, I'll turn it back to you. So as we, uh, I know, gotta get the mic, sorry. As we breeze through the findings, uh, it's you know not rocket science here, the findings in many cases translate into the recommendations. So the following recommendations we're, we've made, we believe will improve in our opinion service and create efficiencies uh, and, the recommend, and the recommendations are broken down into short term and uh, longer term recommendations. The short terms obviously are ones we would recommend you attempt to accomplish fairly quickly and then the midterm to long term a few years out. You already heard from Randy, we recommend that you consider implementing alternative three by filling those vacant positions and increasing your authorized numbers. This will give the department uh, flexibility to uh, move forward with some of the other recommendations. It will relieve the excessive overtime and based on experience, personal experience, I believe once you relieve the excessive overtime, you'll also see some relief in your work comp cases. We talked about sick leave utilization. We talked about injury reports. One of the recommendations is that you audit, and, and I understand the department has started this already. Uh, take a look at those reports. Take a look at the uh, sick leave issues, the work comp issues on a monthly basis. On your emergency operations program, uh, our recommendation is you cross-train senior officers of the department to support the emergency preparedness coordinator and incorporate staff from other city departments to develop, to participate in the development and operation of the city's emergency program and the EOC. Um, our recommendation is always at least three deep on those EOC positions. I understand that's what you attempt to do now. We believe this recommendation will reinforce uh, that policy. We believe you should review and consider updating all the current fees intended to offset the cost of fire prevention personnel. During the fee review, we would recommend that you include the cost to fund the additional recommended personnel, those positions in prevention, which we believe based on our analysis and based on our interviews and looking at the workload are needed in fairly short order. This is a carryover, some of the fire prevention recommendations as well as this particular one in front of you is a carryover from your 2016-2017 standards of cover. At that time, you were already seeing a lot of growth in your call volume. You were already getting kind of crossways with your span of control. We recommend that a second battalion chief per shift be added for a total of, of three positions. So that gives you two 56 hour uh, battalion chiefs on shift every day to manage the workload and to manage 11 units and to manage growth as you move forward. We're recommending a second deputy chief uh, and that the admin bureau be restructured to accommodate current and future workloads. At the beginning of the findings, we discussed the collateral duties that were assigned and they're compressing. The collateral duties are to a point where you're starting to see lack of a loss of efficiency in your admin department, in your admin positions. The emergency services position, the EMS position is extremely critical, particularly in the state of California. The regulations are coming hot and heavy. The reporting requirements are, well, I won't go there. They're, they're pretty extensive. And uh, this is an extremely important position for you uh, as you continue to run your uh, EMS division. Training and safety is another critical function in the department, and I know there's been some recent changes that we didn't capture in the report. Our recommendation is, due to the mandates, the workload, the expectations, and the expected accountability, that that position be reclassified to come more in line with the division. In the future, as, the, as your growth continues, as the workload continues, you may wish to eventually reclassify your fire marshal to division level as well. We talked about the fee analysis. We believe that three additional personnel should be added to the prevention division and that they, wherever possible, recovered, be recovered through fees. We're also encouraging 
that a wildland urban risk reduction program be stood up as soon as possible and that one of those prevention positions be assigned to that and that where possible the engine company crews be cross-trained to assist in those wildland urban interface inspections. In your 2016-17 standard of cover, there was actually a rec another recommendation relative to your interface as well. Mayor and Council, thank you. Again, my name is Joe Parrott. Um, my role on this project was evaluating service delivery uh, in, the, in the fire department's capabilities in responding to emergency and non-emergency responses. I'm also the author of the 2016-17 uh, standards of cover and deployment plan that Curtis mentioned a, a couple of times. Uh, the department is doing very well in terms of response. It's feeling the stress of growth uh, and increasing call volumes and, and call activity. One of the things I did in the analysis was to review uh, you use a tool called queuing analysis, uh, which is used in evaluating waiting times in networks, uh, retail, uh, restaurant, computer networks to decide if, if there's impediments uh, within the system. The results of that are up on the screen. And what essentially this analysis does is based on workload by time period of day, what is the likelihood that a response unit in a particular station would not be available to cover a, an incident occurring within that station's area. In other words, it's already busy doing something else, so a, a response unit from more, from more distance, from farther away would have to serve that call, increasing response times and potentially affecting incident outcomes. Um, the current unit staffing is shown on the left column, current units day, current units night. The current probability of wait is that calculation that says for example, in station one with the two units, there's a 3.4% probability that there would be no units available in station one to cover that next incident, that next emergency. Uh, we try and keep those probabilities down at, at, at or below 10%. Uh, any, any lower than that, it gets prohibitively expensive. It's a reasonable number. Uh, it matches up with the 90th percentile response performance objective that the, the organization uses. We did see, however, uh, in three stations that current probabilities of wait were in, ex in excess of that 10 percent. Station four, station six, and particularly station 11. Um, so as we, when I added units during those busy times, the daytime periods, we found that if we add one unit to station four from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., one unit in station six from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., and one unit in station 11, same time period, the probabilities of weight decreased down to, to what we consider to be reasonable levels. Uh, these would not be full, full fire engines with three-person staffing. We're recommending a smaller, more agile unit with two people that can handle a, a bulk of the emergency medical responses and some other minor call types, leaving those that bigger equipment avail, more available for uh, fires and other more significant emergencies. And so that would be our recommendation is that three additional units during the day be added to manage the growing workload. And I need to correct myself. I don't know why 11 was locked in my brain. I kept saying span and control 11 to one, it's actually 12 to one, uh, which makes it a bit worse. So in conclusion, uh, before we open up for questions, um, this has been an interesting study for us to do, as you've seen in the document. It's extremely calculation intense, financial extent intense, which is why we have a CPA on the team. Uh, and we'd like to acknowledge that without the assistance and support of the chief and his staff and the council and other officials during the interview process, we couldn't have been as successful as we believe we've been or as thorough as we think we've been. So with that, we're open for questions. Great, thank you for the presentation. Council, questions, Mr. Dowd? My question has, and it just didn't jump off these charts uh, for me, and that is if you have a huge incident like the Tubbs Fire of 2017 or Kincaid, Kincaid Fire of 2019, um, it seems to me you're still going to end up getting a lot of overtime just because you've got to have people out fighting this massive fire. 
How does that get factored into this so that, because uh, I, I, I didn't see any real accounting for that huge, huge emergency situation? Well, it, it would be very difficult and cost prohibitive for any organization to be able to staff for a, a, a major incident such as that. Um, so as far as trying to make a calculation for this projection and this project, we, we just could not do that. Uh, the, um, we are working through the, the data to try to develop the most cost-effective system uh, as well as the most efficient system that can be designed for you all. In, a, in addition, Council Member, the Tubbs fire uh, was in 2017, the Kincaid in 19, and the financial data that was based on the approved 18 budget. Yeah, and real quick, so you're right, There, you can't eliminate the overtime budget. Those big events, so we recalled the entire department uh, twice in the last three years. Uh, and they were on duty for, in, on the Tubbs fire for four or five days straight. And for the Kincaid fire, it was a day and a half to two days for the all call. And then again, we uh, recalled probably 40% of the department on another wind event. So it, it's, it's hard to say, you, you can't really, it's hard to calculate. You can't get rid of all the overtime. The reason why overtime is, is excessive right now is because we haven't been able to have the ability to hire uh, when we need to. Uh, we are just now getting to that point. So we had, for example, we just had a test. We had 85 people or so. Uh, apply for the city of Santa Rosa. Out of those 85, 50 came to the um, to the interviews, and out of those 55, we got 12 for nine positions. Out of the 12, we were able to hire five. So we still have positions that we have to hire, which is making us look at our hiring practices. Uh, we are looking at. Uh, um, having an open recruitment. We're working with academies more than we ever have. We're working uh, to make things speed up so we can fill these positions. So part of this was because we just find ourselves in this cycle from 2017. We couldn't hire the positions that were available due to a freeze. Now we can hire them. It's a difficult time to hire right now because everyone is hiring uh, firefighter paramedics. And on top of that, we have been working our workforce like crazy for the last two years. And with that comes injuries. And so we have a significant amount of people out on injury. We're trying to get them healthy. We're giving them the time they need and the, and the support they need. But it just, this is a cycle that we're in. So we need to get to full staffing, we need to get our people healthy, and then once we get back into the rhythm, then that overtime will decrease. So a, for a layman like myself, then, your analyses of the cost, given the number of uh, staff members you have, is based on normal type business and emergencies that come with that, but not the extraordinary type Correct. Catastrophic one. Okay. Yes. Well, and often those, uh, council member, often those catastrophic events actually actually have some outside support to help us make uh, ends meet. And it's also why we have the reserve policy we do so that we can cover those costs up front and then hopefully re recoup some of those costs through other other resources and the state has been very good about providing pre-positioning dollars, um, which we take advantage of uh, frequently. I think the story is that we, we need to um, expand staffing and the chief is talking about uh, quickly recruiting, but we also have to have a longer range strategy um, about uh, tapping into our community and starting to get folks that may not have considered a, a fire service to start to consider the fire service in a different way. And you're gonna start to see some conversations about if we can bring folks um, uh, in who may not have had considered that, we actually start to see some reward on our long-term pension liability because we can see that effect um, that in the, um, I wouldn't say the immediate term, but after, um, unfortunately, the number is going to be similar to when we talked about climate emergency 2030, we actually start to see the benefit of that change substantially in, in the forecasting. So it's not an immediate reward, but one of the great things about being, bringing in folks and, tr and training them up is that uh, they carry a different uh, pension liability for us in the long term. Thank you. 
Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so I appreciate the uh, breadth of conversations that you had with folks uh, to get information to create this report. Uh, did our rank and file have an opportunity to see the recommendations beforehand and comment on what would be recommended to the council? Yeah, so I shared that with uh, union leadership uh, probably a month and a half ago, and then I shared it to the full e-board about a week and a half ago. So that has been shared. Um, you know, we can't move forward without labor in any of these discussions, so they are an integral part of, of what happens next. Uh, and they were also interviewed, we interviewed, they interviewed over 40 people, and a large majority of that was the labor force. So um, they've been through this process from the very beginning, uh, and they have seen uh, the recommendations. So they've seen them, did they agree with them? Uh, I haven't had any feedback from from anyone other than, all right, it looks like it's a, a typical staffing study report and how do you think council's gonna go? You know, it's like, well, let's take it to council and and see. So there, there, there wasn't, uh, I haven't heard any outcry on uh, the f recommendations or findings. We've been talking about squads for the last couple of years, uh, which is, you know, I think it's a, a worthwhile resource at looking at uh, because it's a little bit cheaper than a three-person engine company and it allows us to upstaff whenever we need it. Um, so we've been having those discussions, or we have in the past, and so we are waiting for the staffing study to get done before we continue any other discussions. But I have not heard any outward cry that this is a bad report, if that's what you're getting at, or they don't agree with the recommendations. Yeah, no, in particular, what I was curious about is there are, in the interviews, there are recommendations that were made by rank and file that don't conflict with these recommendations, but also don't entirely include them. Uh, so I wanted to ask a couple of questions about, about that. Um, one of the comments that was made was that we have poor location of where our stations are if you're trying to distribute the workload uh, effectively. Now obviously we've had these conversations before about uh, response times, uh, what it would take from each of the stations to have that acceptable level, level of coverage. But do we ever include in that conversation uh, a more equitable distribution of calls for service between our stations uh, when we talk about the positioning? Well, we looked at, look at that all the time, and it was looked at in the standards of coverage report, right? So it talks about moving stations, it talks about adding stations, it talks about adding resources. Um, so yeah, we need to move station eight. Yeah, we need to build station nine. We need to build station 12. We need to move station six to, to equalize some of that. All these stations have been in place for the last 30 to 40 years. The city has changed a tremendous amount. Yeah. When I started 29 years ago, the call volume was 8,900 calls a year. And today it's closer to 30,000 calls a year. So the call volume has increased. We've added uh, an additional an, an additional truck and two engines since uh, I got hired in 1990. The fact of the matter is we're not keeping up with pace and what we need to do is redistribute some stations, add stations, and we need to add uh, some squad type vehicles to help with those very busy areas like 11, like six, six is a, is a very, has a large second due, um, like station four, and that will help decrease our response times. So you say squad, is that similar to they proposed in the, uh, in the interview, a rover? Uh, they're, well, so if it, depending on who you're talking to, it could be an engine or a squad. So we used to have engine 26, which was a three-person engine company. So we had two of them housed out of station six. Uh, when we opened up station 10, engine 26 became engine 10. So we lost that rover, that floater engine. That engine back then was designed to fill holes for training, call volume, or whatever needed to happen so we can keep our response times as, as good as we could. Once we added that station, we lost that. So the, the other option is we can hire another three-person engine company to help with that, or we can hire two or three two-person squads to do the same thing. It's a little different model, and it's something that we've talked about in the past, but you know, there's, there's, we need to do some work on that uh, front, but depending on who you were talking to and or reading on, on, the, on the report, it could have been a three-person engine company or it could have been a two-person squad. Okay, and 
I'm, I'm not surprised to see reflected in the report that there is a increase in calls related particularly to homelessness. One of the suggestions that was made was a better streamlining of our services that allowed particularly care facilities to call for EMS support without also needing to call for the fire support. Uh, and in particular for falls, having firefighters there just to help pick people up when you also have EMS there might not be the best use of services and also might lead to injuries for rank and file firefighters. Have, have we looked into that as well? We have and we do look at that. So every new facility will require people to have lift teams so they're not calling a, a fire engine every time. Now that doesn't mean that person that took fall wasn't hurt, which means they will get a fire engine and an ambulance whether they have a lift team or not. We have some facilities in the city that are med F facilities, which means they have nurses on site, and when they call 911, sometimes they get us. If it's critical, uh, heart attack, stroke, things like that, fire will always go. If it's simply a fall and they need a ride to the ambulance, uh, just, to the, just the ambulance, they need a ride to the hospital, just the ambulance will take them. We call those med F facilities. There's a very stringent uh, criteria that have to meet for the med F criteria. So not everyone can do it, but where we, we leverage all of that moving forward where we didn't in the past. Okay. Um, all right, real quick, I think, did you have something to add? Just, I don't wanna let him forget. Just a couple of things, just to reinforce the, the discussion about squads, that, that actually is the type of vehicle I mentioned when I talked about peak activity units, it would be that smaller squad type vehicle. Uh, the homeless issue and, and the workload that that creates for the fire department, I addressed in the, the standards of cover document along with the recommendation. Um, and that standards of cover document really is a companion piece to this report. Uh, and so the two actually work well together. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I am also, you know, everybody at the city is overworked. I know that we are talking about employee morale and in particular uh, preventing injuries long term. Are, are, fi are our firefighters able in their time off to use things such as cannabis to help them to cope with the, whether it's PTSD or injuries that they've received on the job? No. No. Look at. Um, Great, it, cannabis is legal in the state of California. We fall so, under DOT regulations. That's also not a staffing study conversation. So if we're gonna get into working conditions, I would recommend that we have a separate item on that particular item. But I, I'm happy with the question, but we can't go too far afield from staffing study to cannabis usage. Yeah, I'm not trying too hard to go into that. I am asking as it pertains to uh, our officers, uh, our public safety officers being out for extended periods of time or uh, having access to other treatments that might help us to retain that staffing. And I understand that, but we would have to, that's a full human resources conversation. And so human resources staff is not here this evening for that particular conversation. So while I'm okay with a little bit of that conversation, we, we can't go too far down that particular. I'll, I'll just express comments then that, that I would yes. be interested in having a conversation about that at some point uh, with our rank and file to see if there's an interest uh, or a desire. Uh, the last one that I'll, that I'll say is kind of more of a, a comment, but there is also a theme that sort of runs through some of the rank and file comments around distrust of, of the economic picture of the budget dollars, as well as an overall theme of poor relations between rank and file, as well as city leadership. And, and I would hope, part of why I'm asking if they've been involved in these conversations is I think that there is an opportunity for us to heal some of that. Uh, and I think that it'll make our department a lot stronger if we do fix some of those relations going forward. Don't disagree. Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you. Um, I'm, I mean, I really appreciate, gentlemen, uh, this staff report, and I think it has a lot of good information. And I personally, I mean, we'll listen to public comment, but I'm prepared to support it tonight. But one question I did have was around the fee structure. You know, I, I heard that you mentioned that there should be an increase in fees. My understanding is we're not doing that here tonight, um, but we will be getting that at some point in the future to be able to understand those fees and make selections as to which one to increase. Well, as, as you know, council member, this is a, this is taken a little bit in isolation. It needs to work its way into the entire budget. And there are always ramifications to other initiatives that the council is pursuing. So I would just say as a recommendation for a place to look, it isn't necessarily where the city would end up going to because it might 
have a, a other consequences. So, so we, we look at it in, in sort of a departmental need perspective and then we apply that to the overall budget process. So yes, you're correct, it's not happening tonight and we'll have additional conversations about res where resource allocation can come from. Okay, good, I, do, I look forward to having that conversation probably during the budget process it sounds like, but I do wanna say that I very much support the extra staff concept, looking at those metrics on the high utilization rates of a lot of those stations. Um, I got to imagine that's taking a toll on the men and women in those stations. So I thanks again for this report. Mr. Alvarez. Thank you. I want to go back to uh, the uh, comments you made earlier related to staffing and current vacancies uh, in the department. I think uh, number of nine was mentioned. Is that the current number today? Uh, today it's uh, five. It's five? Okay. Yeah. So can you give us a little bit of a historical perspective on those vacancies maybe within the last I don't know, five years or so, is what's what's been the peak, what's been the low, have yeah. we ever been up to full uh, we, staffing with authorized staffing levels? We have been up to full staffing, and what we typically do, we like to have academies of three, six, or nine. They work as units, so when we have nine extra people, which we, the 126 is nine extra people, three per shift, we treat those as floaters. So when uh, our department allows four people off on vacation, so when somebody's on vacation, we move a f uh, floater into that position, and they they can act up uh, as an engineer or a captain if they're qualified, and that lessens the overtime burden. Uh, so we got down to about six, and then we had the fire, and then we couldn't hire anyone, which turned into 10 uh, with retirements that, that happened. Um, so it, it's very cyclical. The last time we were in this space was probably 2005, 2006, and it was tough back then, and I think it's worse today than it was back then. Uh, and we were 15 people like back then, but we didn't have the injuries that we do right now. So literally, when I would go off work, you'd get a phone call and you'd say, sorry, you can't, you gotta go cover station X. And that's what we do, we call it mandatory overtime. It's overtime that we don't sign up for, it's something that nobody has signed up for, so uh, on a rotating basis, we fill it through mandatory overtime. Right now, that is the world we are living in uh, and have for the last year and a half. And part of it is because of where, with the injuries, uh, we really are try doing our best to keep our, our folks uh, healthy, um, and, but that takes time with some of these injuries. You just, you know, shoulder surgeries, knee surgeries, uh, back injuries, uh, different injuries that we all experience on the job, it takes takes time. Uh, so with that, we're able to hire five in the last, they just came online. We had a badge pinning last Thursday, uh, and just the other day, the, the newest firefighters were online with the Santa Rosa Fire Department, and today I was looking at the roster, there was no mandatory overtime. That's the first time I've seen that in a while. So if, when we hire these additional five positions, we'll be at full staffing, that will help. And once we get some folks back off of injury time, uh, that will help as well. But we're in this cycle right now that we're, it's a tough spot for everyone, especially the people that you know, are running, running engines and trucks, it's busy. And it is my experience, having done a lot of recruitment and uh, testing, et cetera, for the police department, that uh, the trends change a lot as far as why people get in the job and the numbers, you talked about large numbers of applicants coming down to a small mm -hmm. number of getting in. So my, my, the question is, ha have we done some analysis of exploring our current uh, recruitment, testing, and hiring pro processes to see what we can do to improve them, because it is competitive, yep. it's competitive out there. Uh, so giving somebody the reason to come here as opposed to someplace else. So I would encourage that we do some kind of analysis of what we're doing related to uh, the recruitment, uh, testing and hiring practices as well. We are doing that as we speak, we're with, working with HR, they're coming up with a, a nice color brochure pamphlet where we're gonna offer lateral positions, we're gonna, uh, we're not gonna wait for three or four people for an academy, if we get one good person, we're gonna put them through a shorter academy and then provide training another way. We're looking at all options and it's something that we have to do because I'll tell you in July, we got another five or 10 people that may retire. Mm -hmm. And in December, there's another five or 10 that may retire. So we're gonna be in this cycle. We have to be very proactive in hiring. But I'll, I'll tell you this, we gotta hire the right people. But I'm we're not, also, not, uh, but the chief is also, I mean, there's a great 
great urgency to hire folks, but we're also trying to build relationships with other parts of our community that have not considered traditional work in the fire department. I'm actually, the chief. The chief's team is gonna be shadowing the police department on some of the work that they've done already. So we're, we're, not just, we're not just looking at laterals, we're not just looking for recruitment, we're looking at building deeper community relationships, and you're gonna hear a lot more about that from the fire department over the next six to nine months. So it's gonna be a, a significant change. And again, you hear the chief's urgency because you see it in the report. We've got some real issues to make sure that we're staffed correctly and we've got folks, but we can't rely on those methodologies anymore. And a, a, a brochure will go so far, but it won't go fully into to working on the relationship. So we're talking about, as you heard, the chief, how can we support folks to get the education they need to actually step into the position. So you're probably going to see some inventive stuff from us coming forward over the next six to 12 months about exactly this. How, how do we build relationships and how do we get people where we need them to be um, who may not have considered a, a, a career in the fire service Thank before? You. I greatly appreciate it because it's not just a matter of putting up the now hiring sign. It's actually going out there and not expecting them to come to us, but going to them and recruiting people out in the community. Thank you. Ms. Weissner. Yep. Thank you so much for all your work. Thank you, Chief, for coming in today. Sorry I missed you at the badge pinning last week. Um, you were, your absence was noted. Um, at any rate, uh, your team did great without you, so I'm not sure how you want to take that. Um, I'm curious to know, I appreciate the, the notion that if we staff up that we're going to save money on overtime and uh, sort of free two birds from one cage by improving employee morale and improving response time. I'm wondering though if you can speak at all to, and I know this is a little bit out of your wheelhouse, but I'm wondering if you or the team can speak at all to the long-term fiscal impacts on our per pension liabilities of hiring versus using overtime. And I know there's a cost to not doing it as well in terms of injuries and morale. Yeah, that I, it is a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but I will say that the, the people that we are hiring today are going to be at the lower pension rate. So there's the legacy, there's the classic, and then there's PEPRA. So most everyone will be hired at the at the lower rate, which helps us today. That means that people can't retire until they're 57, which won't help us on the long run. Um, so the older you get, the more injuries happen. I can tell you that uh, Randy might have some 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 discussion points on the pension issues. Well, um, I, I will also say that this is one of the things Chuck's looking very closely at and weren't running and we're going to be uh, having this conversation w initially with the long-term finance committee and then you will also get a look at, the full council will get a look at it on the 28th about where, how some of the higher practicing practices today will help offset some future li liabilities for us as we look at different styles of recruiting and we can already see that impact on the miscellaneous side. Um, we have work to do on the, on the, on the uniformed uh, side of the conversation, but we're, we're making headway everywhere. And I, but I would just say that is a long distance conversation, not a short distance conversation. We start to see the benefits to the liability start to happen um, past 2030, um, which is uh, over, is a decade away. So let me clarify, I'm not trying to erode the um, rank and file or the union. Um, leadership or membership in any way. That's not where I'm going with this. What I'm trying to do is understand when um, a cost savings is presented to us as a number, are we talking about a number for this year or, and are there hidden costs in terms of, and I understand, I'm not asking a press on you to answer that, but I do want to have um, that analysis from our CFO because I think that it's, uh, it's in our, uh, it's this, our responsibility to the public to, if we are going to increase long-term costs, we do need to let them know. We shouldn't just say it makes sense today. It needs to make sense in 30 years. The last thing I want is in 30 years, a council to be sitting in a worse position than we are now. Absolutely, and that's what the, that's what Chuck and his team will be doing, looking at exactly the staffing report moving forward. How do we how do we meet the needs in the report, but balance long-term fiscal sustainability with those? Okay. The second thing is, and again, I'm not trying to bust your mustaches here. I just I just want to say that I I know Tony. Sorry about that. Um, 
<laughs> what would it take, maybe a week or so? I, I did have the opportunity to attend the pinning, and it, and it is really clear to me what a great family you guys have, but that it is a family and that it is, I don't believe it's incumbent upon the recruits, the potential recruits to imagine ourselves, and we're talking about women and people of color. And I've heard firefighters in this meeting today referred to as he, him, and men, and it's unacceptable. And the reason it's unacceptable is because that type of perspective prevents people from believing that they can be in the fire service. And so, again, I have a lot of respect for you, I have a lot of love for you, we've had some good times, but I need you to convince me with more than a flyer what you're gonna do. Because I know that people like me, who are social workers, who are women, who are typically highly educated and low wage workers, would jump at the opportunity to become a firefighter and make the kind of wages that your guys do. And I say guys intentionally, I know you got a couple of women, but we gotta do better and I need to hear from you why we should hire 140 people without putting the incumbency of seeing yourself as a firefighter on those little girls because it is not on them. Our media is saturated with images of male firefighters, and we cannot have that from the city of Santa Rosa. Please help me see how we can go forward. Understood. Ms. Rose, did you have a question? Uh, well, I actually, I was gonna make a, a comment on the long-term pension uh, liabilities that it, it also would depend on whether or not it was in the final years of service for a public safety officer because that's typically what the pension is actually uh, based on. So I think that that might be part of it, the calculus since I don't see uh, Chuck in the room. Uh, but uh, I wanted to go back to, to the vice mayor for a second. I, th I wasn't sure if she was asking a question there uh, that she had an answer to. I, I was. So to answer your question, we, um, we, try to recruit from many different levels. We go through our HR department. It goes through many different avenues. Uh, to give you an example, the last time that the 85, we had one female apply. That one female was brought to our interview. She was one of the 12. And that female chose to go to another place to work because her girlfriend also got a job in the other community where she was working. So we try very, very hard to recruit women, people of color, add diversity. Um, and I, I gotta tell you, it's, it's difficult to get the people to apply knowing that you need a firefighter one and you need to have a paramedic license in hand to get into the door. Now we're trying to change that by working with the Santa Rosa Junior College. For example, if somebody's fresh out of paramedic school, they got first right of refusal go to uh, fire academy and we can hire them as a trainee right there and then they become property of Santa Rosa Fire Department and we help them through the academy. That's something we've never done before because we've never had to do that before. We typically have hundreds of people that apply, but this isn't just a problem for the Santa Rosa Fire Department. This is a problem for the fire service and everything we can do to make a change is a good change, but the people have to be there as well. And we're just not seeing the numbers that we'd all like to see. Thank you for um, answering my question. And um, the thing that, I, that I'm hopeful of is that, that you'd consider that um, if women and people of color were exposed to the type of work that you do that goes beyond you know, rescuing people out of cars and structure fires and wildfires, that I believe that a lot of women would be attracted to the fire service given the nature of your day-to-day -day work. Okay, a couple questions, and unfortunately or unfortunately, my questions are based on more on your report, not the slides, and so I'm gonna be making reference to some pages in it. <clears throat> on like page three of your report, you, know, you mentioned all, uh, of all incidents in which the department responded, emerged in 2018, responded to 90% in six minutes, five seconds or more. Is that priority one calls, emergency calls? Those are code three calls. That's correct. <clears throat> so my, my, my question is the general plans <clears throat> says you should, you know, our goal is to get to those type of calls within, is it five minutes? It's four minutes, it's an add a minute for, for ring down. Uh, so we say a five minute response time. So my question is, because what, what I didn't see that if that's our general plan expectation, what staffing, what level of staffing would allow us to meet what the general plan says is what our goal should be? It's moving stations and adding stations and adding the squads or engines to, to saturate those busy areas. 
right now, engine 11 is so far off the charts because not only do they have a, a busy first due, they have a very busy second due. So when engine three is on a call, they're going to district three, which leaves engine 11 open. When engine 11 is open, engine one comes in. So we got a lot of movement throughout the city and it, it boils down to putting units in the peak hours that uh, Joe Parrott spoke about. Right now, it's he mentioned nine to nine. Um, that seems to be the the when peak call volume is. So adding units to that time frame would help us lower our response times to meet those standards. So I guess because the other question I have is the general plan expectation realistic. And how do we come the general up with that? plan? Yeah, it's through. Because NFPA. we've never met it as long as I've been. Uh, very look at um, NFPA 1710 is the standard that we follow. It's a national fire protection standard. Um, that is something that we all should be striving for, and that's what we strive for. Every year it goes, it gets a little bit less for us because we become busier. The city is more congested, and it's just harder to get around to where we need to get around. The way you combat that is you have to add resources into those more dense areas. And so 1710 is a standard. It's a nationwide standard, and that's the standard we, uh, we try to hit. So yeah, I'm not sure I, Totally get it, because I, I didn't read anywhere in the plan here, and I, I will go back to that other slide with the staffing, because I have some questions on that. I, I, what I was looking for in the staffing report saying, if you want to achieve this response time per your general plan, these are the resources that, you, you know, that, that you're going to need to add. If I may, that uh, that information is all included in the standards of covered and deployment plan that we produced a few years ago. The, this was more focused on okay. pure staffing. The other one talks about station locations, station relocations, additions, alternate response units, and and other things more directly associated with your what you're interested in seeing. Okay, so one of the other things, <clears throat> too, Chief, that, um, again, coming from the police perspective, there's some discretionary things that you do, so you either need to add more resources or not do everything that you're doing now. And I know that, that there may be a balance. And on um, page six of the report, it talked about the service demand projections um, based on our 1,000 population. It said we're higher than uh, typical cities our size. Uh, tourism influence on the department workload and other factors not yet fully understood. And I, I, I don't understand what you mean by other factors not yet fully understood is the reason that we're a little bit higher than other communities. Any other, can you give me clues to what we're talking about there? Other factors not yet fully understood. One of the things we saw when Affordable Care Act came into effect was a significant increase in emergency medical service workload. Uh, people who did not have coverage now did. They didn't have primary care doctors, so the emergency room became their primary care source. And ambulances were, and fire department responses were the quickest way to get in the door. And so that is one of those influxes. We did not deal specifically with trying to evaluate whether that was an effect, but it likely is in this community. Uh, the homeless situation, I spent some time addressing that in the standards of cover. That's obviously an issue that is increasing within not only your community, but all over the place. Um, so, the, but they're not easily quantifiable, so that's the not easily understood portion of it. So with those categories that you just said, a strategy we may employ is rather than have firefighters respond to this unique set of circumstances, actually having other resources to do what we are currently having our standards of firefighters do. And again, also discussed to some extent in the standards of cover. Okay. And so then, um, Chief, do you have, you know, you had mentioned uh, this 90% in six minutes or five seconds or less going code three. Do you have routine response calls for service that San Rosa Fire responds to? You know, those police departments got level one, two, and three. Three is discretionary, and they're certain you need to get there by 45 minutes. Does the fire department have some, what I would call almost discretionary? Not well, those are code two calls. So it takes us, uh, no lights and sirens. Um, we go code two, it takes us longer, so we don't count those into the response time. On other incidents, like the bigger fires that we've had, there have been times where we, uh, for example, for an alarm in a building, we'll send an engine and a truck. Uh, if it's a high rise, we send three engines in a truck. If it's an extrication, we'll send two engines in a BC. But when we have high call volumes due to the tubs, to the Kincaid, or 
another example, earthquake in Napa, what we do is we alter our response uh, to those. So instead of sending two units, we'll send one, unless it's a confirmed fire or if it's a confirmed extrication. So it depends on the, the uh, the subject and what's going on around yeah. us. So. What I'm looking for is the more day-to-day -day routine things, not the Kincaid, the tubs, the earthquake. Again, using the police analogy, private property collisions. We send police there, we're not mandated to do that. So if we stop doing that, that's gonna free up those officers to respond to the types of calls for service that you're doing. Does the fire department do things such as that that is not mandated by anything, it's not public safety, it's more of a thing we choose to do versus that we, uh, by law, were required to respond uh, to. So we go to all code two calls. We don't have to go to code two calls. Uh, there's an EMD process where we can look at, uh, do we want to go code two to other calls than right now that we go code three? Uh, our thought process is we got to get there as soon as we can to assess. We do have a process that in, while we're responding code three, we go, we get dispatched, we respond code three. If the dispatcher gets through their information and says, you know what, you can go code two, then we reduce to code two. If we're going code two, we can upgrade to code three based on the call information and based on traffic patterns and hey, we, we gotta go code three because we're not gonna get there for 15 minutes. So it depends on, on, the, on the situation and our company officers have the discretion to do that in some cases. Right. So what I'm hearing you say is everything you respond to, we have to continue to respond to. We can't change the type of calls that we go to. Yeah, no, is that fair? Yep, that okay. is fair. Then on um, page 35 of your report, it talked about that uh, the fire department determined the minimum acceptable department staffing uh, number is 42 operations personnel required for each shift. H how was that number determined? That no, no, number is determined. We run three people on an engine, four on a truck, so we have 10 engines, that's 30 people. We have two trucks, that's another eight. And then we have a battalion chief, that's 39. And then we have three extra firefighters per shift that float. That adds up to 42. So can you pull this slide where you had the, 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 the chart if we added additional units? I think it was 28, 27, slide 27 or 28. Uh, that one, Oop, that one. So there you're talking about, I was trying to reconcile the 42 number with the numbers we had here. So could you kind of define what I just heard the chief say about 42 as minimum staffing? And then here we have your, what I'm get, gathering from there is going from 12 to 15. So those are units. Okay, so correct? tell me what's the difference between personnel and unit. So station one, it has two units. Where it says current unit day, there's two. That's an engine and a truck, so there's seven people there. What that doesn't show is there's a battalion chief there too, so there's eight people at the station. At station two, again, an engine and a truck, so there's seven people. Station three, one engine, three people. Oh. So I would, it'd be helpful for me to read this if you put bodies or personnel to that so we know, you know, the 42 gotcha. to 42 versus okay. translating that. Because once sure. I heard you explain that that, that, that makes sense to me, just trying to uh, correlate those two. And then with the different staffing studies, I know you provided four different options, one of them with SRPD. Um, so on um, page 53, you showed that calls for service of the report. And the question that I had, um, and I heard you say that, Chief, that you'll add additional personnel during the, those busier hours, and that's what you know. my thought was, well, shouldn't the personnel re reflect the calls for service? And sometimes I know at the police department, they have more than just the 36-hour shift. They have a 5-8 shift, a 4-10 shift, and a 3-12 shift, and you can fill in those gaps for greater service. Did the staffing study look at that, like during those peak hours of calls for service, we could do a 5-8 shift versus the traditional 36, you know, 48 hour shift. Well, that, the slide that's on the screen right now, that's precisely what that's doing. It's saying we don't need 24 seven staffing at 15 units. We need 24 seven staffing at 12 units in order to, to manage the workload that occurs during that time period and be able to provide what the chief referred to for those multi-unit responses, building fires and others, where it takes more than one unit in order to deliver the effective response force. This is suggesting that during those peak periods, that daytime, which is when we have the greatest amount of activity, we need some additional help. Uh, the analogy, McDonald's doesn't staff their counter with the same number of people at midnight as they do during the lunch hour. 
the same same concept. So with these figures to get those peak staffing models, they may not be the typical shift that currently exists within the fire department. It is not intended to be that. For those one units, right? Correct, that's what I'm saying, just to fill the gap. Again, if you, correct on the staff, we're on page 53 where you had that curve, right, that correct. arc, and you wanna have more staffing there, you don't need them the whole time, you don't need them all 24 hours. Yeah, these are intended to be 12 hour units. Okay, great. Uh, and have there been any other studies, again, correlating to the uh, police department where they measure the, their use obligated, unobligated time? In other words, the time that they're doing things that you know the, the administration wants versus times where they're proactive. Are there any other type of studies or has anyone in the fire service looked at that type of evaluation of efficiency? Yes, um, it's essentially any standards of cover and deployment plan I've ever done. That is part of the discussion, the unit hour utilization, you know, trying not to have them in emergency response mode more than about 10% of the time, but the other 90% is available for training, equipment maintenance, uh, for proactive public education services, uh, wildland fuels mitigation as the chief's proposing, and other ancillary duties. But we wanna make sure they've got enough available time to respond to emergencies to meet response performance objectives. Oh, absolutely, but, but you hit on all those things, just what I was talking about, again, if, if you're a police officer going call to call, you can get burned out there, you wanna kind of equate that, and quite frankly, I think this community would want more, they don't wanna high buy, boom, they're gone, to do some of the things that you're talking. So is that more in the 2016 study that you mentioned earlier, that type of? It, it's part of that discussion, um, and, and part of, and frankly, this discussion in, in the unit hour utilization concept and, and the recommendation to use engine companies as part of the wildland fuels modification effort um, and cross-training them to do that. Uh, yeah, the fire, firefighters a long time ago quit sitting around the potted, pot belly stove playing checkers, scratching spotted dog. We have, all organizations that I've worked with are out there doing the other kinds of things that you're talking about. Did you time this? You see that? I, 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 they're I, I saying know, hi. Going, going, hi, <laughs> hi, engine one. <laughs> the mighty engine one right there. <laughs> All right, those are my, any other questions from council? Okay, we have one card on this item. Mr. DeWitt. It's Dwayne DeWitt, and when I was young, I was fortunate to be a first responder and I did it with many women who were well-trained because they served in the military. And I do believe that one of the recruitment pools that you could be using right now are veterans and reaching out to them through our veteran service organizations here in our community. And then also tonight, many young people from Roseland came. They spoke about the different things that interest them right now. They were 10th graders. I had never seen any of them before, talked with them. They came on their own accord because some interest, something sparked an interest on their part. I believe if you reach out to Roseland University Prep, Roseland Collegiate Prep, to those young people there, that you'll find a attentive audience to the message you're trying to bring. And you'll especially find that many of them want to excel in professions such as what you're talking about. So that's a way to do it. I believe Ms. Fleming was correct tonight when she spoke about this. And the only way you will change the culture of typically male-oriented professions and occupations is to go to those people in those recruitment pools. I have friends in San Francisco and Oakland, women on the police force and in the fire department, and they like those jobs. They're staying in them and they'll retire from them. But it's up to us to change the culture. And it will only happen if in this report, which I hope you'll accept and I hope you'll follow the recommendations of the chief, you here state that is what you wanna see also. It needs to come from not just one council member, it needs to come from majority of the council that you say yes, you want people of color, and you want people of different gender, and it might be somebody who's gender fluid even. Let that happen. It only starts with you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dwayne. Any additional questions? Um, Mr. Sawyer, you have this item? Uh, 
I move recommendation um, that the council receive the fire department staffing needs assessment dated October 2019. That's prepared by the Emergency Service Consulting International. And wait for the reading. Does that do it? Well, I don't know. I'll tell you if we get a second. <laughs> I'm not reading. Right? Second. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any additional comments that anyone would like to make? Um, the, the one comment I would like to make, I, I do appreciate the recommendations and it may be a question to you for the city manager. So based on these recommendations, come budget hearings, will that be factored into all of the recommendations that if you want this, this would be the cost? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, then the one additional thing, um, I really am interested just because I know the impacts and I've talked to several of the firefighters calls for service out of Sam Jones Hall, Red Gospel Mission and some of our other encampments that I think there's an opportunity because I know some of the hospitals and I know Mr. Sawyer is aware of some of those, they send um, nurses out to some of the different sites and I think uh, the intent is to reduce the calls of service of you know our fire department. So I'd really be interested in looking at that model where we either contract with one of our local you know, medical providers or look at another methodology that reduce the workload for our Santa Rosa firefighters. Uh, we're already underway uh, in the police department. We will do corresponding work in the fire department. Great. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Your votes, please. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, on to our second public hearing of the night, Mr. McGlynn, 16.2. Thank you. Item 16.2, public hearing, TEFRA, public hearing and issuance of bonds by the California Municipal Finance Authority in the amount not to exceed $20 million for Boyd Street Family Apartments, 811 Boyd Street. Frank Kazimoff, Program Specialist, presented. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members, jurisdictions are required to hold a public hearing and approve a tax exempt bond issuance prior to approval by the state. This public hearing is called a TEFRA public hearing because it complies with the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act and the Internal Revenue Code. The bond issuance is for Boyd Street Family Apartments. This is an approved project. It, there are 46 total units and it is located at 811 Boyd Street. The project sponsor is Danko Communities and they're based in Arcata. 45 of the 46 units will be restricted to households earning between 50 and 60% of the area median income and that's always adjusted by household size and one unit is non-restricted for the resident manager. Rents are set at 30% of the applicable, applicable income range. The total project cost is approximately $22 million or $480,000 per unit. The maximum amount of the bond issuance uh, uh, being authorized is $20 million, but it is anticipated to be less than that. The Housing Authority approved a loan for the project in the amount of $200,000 and will enter into and monitor a regulatory agreement restricting the rents and incomes of the tenants for 55 years. The state's bond allocation committee and tax credit allocation committee will also each have their own 55 year regulatory agreement and restrictions with the project. Um, Boyd Street Family Apartments is anticipated to be completed by April of 2021. This project is in compliance and meets the council's tier one goal to meet housing needs. The issuance of tax exempt bonds has no impact on the general fund as all the obligations and costs of, and repayments are the responsibility of the borrower. Following the public hearing, Approval of the resolution will allow the bond application to be considered 
by the California Debt Limit Allocation Committee. The committee will now consider the bond application without the council's approval of the resolution. Likewise, the project would not receive tax credits either as the allocation of bonds and tax credits are linked. Uh, in that case, the project sponsor would have to seek alternatives to finance the project. And I should note also that just this evening, uh, we learned that the staff of the California Debt Limit Allocation Committee has recommended uh, approval of this project in the upcoming round. Uh, and it's a competitive round. It's the first time in a, in a long, long time that the bonds that in the past have not been competitive, they're starting to be competitive this year. And so this project uh, is, is slated to receive an allocation. It is recommended by the Housing and Community Services Department that the council conduct a public hearing under the requirements of the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act and the Internal Revenue Code and by resolution approve the issuance of tax exempt multifamily housing revenue bonds by the California Municipal Finance Authority in an amount not to exceed $20 million to finance Boyd Street Family Apartments located at 811 Boyd Street. But happy to answer any questions. I'd like to point out that Ron Lee of Jones Hall, the city's bond council is uh, here. If you have any questions uh, along those lines, as well as Anthony Stubbs, who is with the California Municipal Finance Authority, the issuer of the bonds. Great, thanks for your presentation. Mr. Rogers, you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Kasimov. I had, uh, one is a point of clarification. You said that the units would be 50% of area median income. My understanding was that eight units would be 30% and then 37 units would be 50%. Is, is that not correct or? Well, there's, there, that's a, um, when the housing authority saw this project, it, it was in an earlier time. The housing authority saw the project, as you, as you mentioned, with eight at 30 and the rest at uh, 50%. Uh, that was contingent upon uh, additional financing, which did not come through. If you have additional financing, you can lower the, the affordability, make it more affordable. Uh, so in this case, the project had to adjust in order to have an actual financeable project. So at, at this time, the project moving forward is a mix of 50% and 60% of AMI. Okay, and uh, some of this is questions that we also got from the public, but it's directly related to that. As the project moves into the construction phase, uh, some of this additional funding that we're hearing about that they're recommended for, if they don't get it, is there any certainty of the level of affordability that the project would deliver? If they don't get the funding? Correct. There's, there's no certainty, no. I mean, if they don't get the funding that they're applying for, like right now, as I mentioned just a moment ago, it, it, it looks good for the, uh, for the bond allocation and that goes hand in hand with the tax credit allocation. So it's actually looking good for it. So with that funding and all the other funding commitments that they have, the project will move forward. Uh, without the funding, then they have to reassemble and, and find new, new financing. So but, in the event that we uh, approve this, if that financing falls out and the project ends up becoming, call it market rate, it, would it come back to the council to reconsider whether or not we want to support the bond? I'm not sure if I understand the question, but if if the council moves forward on this, the, the project would be moving moving forward unless there some, something happened to, to, to stop in its tracks, but it, it would have enough financing to move forward. But so uh, financing to move forward, yes but as we're talking about these other pots of money that they're being approved for, those sorts of things, is that a certainty if the council approves this? And if not, is there a chance that the level of affordability that they're able to build is, uh, call it, reduced? Uh, so, so we might approve the bond financing with an understanding that it's 50 to 60% yeah. area median income, but that's right. also contingent on other funding that hasn't come in. Right, so if, if it doesn't come in and the project is reconfigured, uh, it would, and they, they're looking for more fine, bond financing, it would come back to you at, at a different time. 
if I may interject, Megan Bassinger, Housing and Community Services Manager, this particular project is structured to be affordable. So the applicant is taking a very diligent steps to pursue all financing associated with affordable housing. So if this particular round of bond financing wasn't working, they would restructure it. It's highly unlikely that it would become a market rate project. Um, the housing authority would have to rescind their commitment to the project as well. So there would be various steps and the council will be notified, but I wouldn't anticipate that occurring. Okay, and then the 50, 60, 50 to 60 percent uh, AMI level, is that consistent with the project that was approved? Uh, when it went through planning commission and, and, and council? We'd have to go back and see what the information was included in the planning commission. Generally, they're just identified as affordable housing units in planning documents. And it's not that uncommon for initial funding at the housing authority to have to adjust as the project um, financing comes into play. Okay. But the, the ceiling on our financing is generally 60% of area median income. Okay, so, uh, and help me understand this, and I apologize, it might be a basic question. So somebody who meets the 50% area median income uh, income level can move in. What then is the rent level for that individual? So the rents are structured at 30% of the income. So it would be 30% of 50% of income based on household size and the size of the unit. Okay, and that's locked in in this discussion? That is set in the regulatory agreement that will be executed with the housing authority. And as Frank indicated, if the applicant receives tax credits and bonds, there's um, subsequent regulatory agreements with those agencies as well. Great, thank you so much. Ms. Vice Mayor. It seems like you might have answered my question, but I'm curious to know if there's any uh, ability for us to have this be, any of these units be um, higher than 50 or 60 percent or lower, a, a greater mix to prevent a ghettoization of 46 families at 50 percent of AMI. When you say greater mix, you mean higher income levels? Higher, lower, mixed. So introducing lower income levels, that generally takes more subsidy at the local level, so it would require greater contributions from this, either the Housing Authority of the City of Santa Rosa or in this case, the Sonoma County Community Development Commission has also committed funds to the project. Can we introduce higher incomes as we know that having five or six percent of people, you know, between 80 and 120 or higher increases the outcomes for children living in low income situations? They, the applicant would need to restructure their application with the California Debt Limit Allocation Committee as well as the tax credits because there's a certain range of units that they have to maintain in order to maintain compliance with tax requirements. Thank you. All right, any additional questions? Okay, this is a public hearing. Open the public hearing. Do we have any cards on this item? Okay, you don't have to fill out a card if you'd like to address the council on this item. Would anyone like to address the council on this item? Seeing no movement, we'll close the public hearing. Bring it back to council. Mr. Oliveras, you have this item? Thank you, Mayor. Move a resolution of the Council of City of Santa Rosa approving the issuance of qualified residential rental project bonds in an amount not to exceed $20 million by the California Municipal Finance Authority in accordance with Section 147F of the Internal Revenue Code and the Joint Exercise of Powers Agreement related relating to said authority. And wait for the read of the text. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional comments? Ms. Vice Mayor. Thank you to you and staff for coming and bringing this uh, forward. I understand that this policy goes probably beyond our city and our housing authority. I continue to be troubled by the uh, clustering of low-income families through housing policy and it keeps me up at night that we, this is the way that we've seen to uh, discriminate against our families by clustering them together and this is adversely affecting our future generations of Santa Rosans and I hope that we find a way to get creative and do better than having all affordable low-income projects for families. Any additional comments? Okay. We have a motion and a second in your votes please. And that passes unanimously. Thank you for the presentation. Mr. McGlynn, item 16.3. Item 16.3, public hearing, state legislation zoning code text amendment. Amy Nicholson, presenting. I should always look up Claire. No. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council. I just want to do a quick introduction to this item. 
Can you hold on just a sec? Someone has to abstain. All right. Go ahead, thank you. All right, as we get the PowerPoint up, um, just a acknowledgement that this next item is part of sort of this ongoing series that we've been bringing to you. Um, if our efforts to make our local city ordinances in compliance with state law, uh, State law will prevail and uh, supersede uh, local ordinances that are outdated. However, it is in our community's interest to update our local ordinances. So we offer the greatest clarity to our applicants, to staff, so it's quite clear how the city fits in with those state laws. Um, so as you know, um, 2018 and 2019 had uh, just a peak period for new legislation specific to housing. Um, the city's already adopted uh, accessory dwelling unit ordinance. Uh, we've updated our density bonus ordinance. Um, Amy Nicholson has brought us our objective design standards, which wasn't just to address the single state law, but a series of state laws that under various circumstances have by right housing. They do allow for objective design standards, so we've set our city up for that. And tonight we bring you uh, compliance uh, efforts for supportive housing daycare. Uh, and we will continue the series this year. So uh, I, I believe we'll be in late February, early March, we'll be updating our accessory dwelling unit ordinance again. So with that, I'll leave it to Amy Nicholson. Thank you, Claire. And good evening, Mayor Schwedholm and members of the council. Uh, the item before you is a zoning code text amendment. It is in response to some recent state legislation regarding uh, housing and family daycare homes. And it incorporates uh, requirements from uh, two assembly bills and one Senate bill that are uh, each in effect now. So Assembly Bill 2162 is a bill that addresses supportive and emergency housing. It requires that uh, specific supportive housing projects are streamlined and ministerial. And what that means is that they uh, cannot be subject to any sort of discretionary review. Um, our zoning code currently allows for supportive housing as a by right or permitted use in all of our residential zoning districts. Uh, however, this bill requires that uh, a local agency permits specified supportive housing projects within any zoning dr district where residential uses are allowed. So what that requires is that we update our zoning code to allow supportive housing within seven of our eight commercial districts in addition to our business park industrial district and our open space and recreation district. The, there is an ordinance before you that has some red lines on it, hopefully. Um, we added some last minute clarification as to uh, the instances where the supportive housing projects would be permitted by right in these new districts identified on the slide before you. And this is only if a supportive housing project meets each of the requirements under Assembly Bill 2162. Um, those are outlined in the staff report, but to summarize, these projects um, include units that are subject to a 55-year affordability agreement and have specified funding sources as well. Assembly Bill 2162 also uh, prohibits a local agency from requiring any sort of minimum parking for supportive housing units that are located within a one-half mile of a public transit stop and public transit stop has been defined in this bill to mean any bus stop or train station. And so these clarifications would also be added to the city zoning code. Assembly Bill 3194 limits a local agency's ability to restrict or deny housing projects in various circumstances. And essentially the bill prohibits the city from requiring a rezoning for any housing project in order to achieve general plan consistency. So to give you a scenario, there could be a housing project that comes in proposing 30 units per acre on a site that's designated for medium high density residential development. And so if you look at the chart, it shows that 
um, 30 units per acre is consistent with that land use designation. However, the zoning of that site might be general commercial, which isn't consistent with the general plan, but it, it does happen from time to time. Uh, typically, uh, prior to any sort of development, that site would need to be rezoned to be consistent with the general plan, so to uh, an R3 zoning district. And this requires a recommendation from the Planning Commission and approval by the Council. So. Um, after this bill went into effect, and, and um, this is clear in our zoning code, these projects would be more streamlined in that we would apply the uh, standards from the implementing zoning district of R3 without requiring that rezoning. So reducing cost, time, and also opening the housing project up for additional CEQA streamlining measures. And then Senate Bill 234 addresses the need for more daycares within our residential neighborhoods. It would require that um, large family home daycares specifically, so those are daycares uh, which provide services for eight to 14 children, that those be permitted by right without any type of discretionary permit. Um, we currently allow for small family daycare homes as a by right use, but not large. However, um, back in 2018, the council adopted our Resilient City Development Measures Ordinance, which does allow for essentially what the first bullet point shows, that large family daycare homes can be allowed by right, but just for a three-year window. And so that sunset date is coming. So this bill will codify that in, in perpetuity in our code, unless uh, superseded. Um, in addition, there's just some kind of clerical updates that are required based on Senate Bill 234. We would remove any language related to large family daycare facilities because they would no longer be regulated by the city. Um, they would be regulated by the state and, and the license that the state provides. So each of these amendments are exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15061B3, which is the general rule that these amendments are unlikely to have a um, potential to cause significant effect on the environment. They're necessary to conform our city code to state law and that any conceivable impact would be speculative. And so with that, the Planning Commission and Planning and Economic Development Department recommend that the Council introduce an ordinance amending the zoning code sections listed on the screen, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you for that presentation. Council questions? Mr. Rogers? Just a very quick one, Claire. Um, obviously, AB 2162, which focuses on the support of housing, there's a nexus to conversations that are happening right now at the county with some of the purchases of, of properties. And I just want to clarify for the public's sake that whether we adopt this or not, that zoning, the by right nature of it is now state law. So whether we update our ordinances or not, we're still subject to that by right nature. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, if the proposed use qualifies for the state definition of per permanent supportive housing, then they would have a by right um, ability to locate at a residential property. Any other questions from council? Okay, this is a public hearing, so I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any cards on this topic? Would anyone like to address the council on this item? You don't have to fill out a card. Seeing no movement, we'll close the public hearing. Um, Ms. Vice Mayor, you've got this item. Thank you, um, and it's uh, my pleasure to move anything forward that makes childcare facilities easier to open and operate within our fine city. And um, although it's uh, unfortunate that it has to come down in the form of a mandate, I do appreciate all the work that you and your staff have done to make to interpret this and to make it um, digestible for us here on the council. So with that, um, it's my honor to move an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code by modifying zoning code sections 20-20.020 
20-22.0030, file number res 19-011 and blessedly waive further reading of the text. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, can, can we get that motion again? <laughs> Didn't we do this with Mr. Sawyer a couple Second. weeks ago? Uh, who seconded that one? And, and if I may, um, two clarifications that the motion is to introduce the ordinance uh -huh. and that you are referencing the red line version of the ordinance that was uh, provided rather than the original. So to be clear, I just read the one that was in my packet. Is that a deviation from what's being recommended by staff? That, that should be the correct one, there, the hard copy. There was a red line version that, that um, added some clarifying language to the footnotes. Um, you were provided with both a red line and a clean copy of the correct version of the ordinance. Um, and I would have to ask staff or the clerk if the prior version had been removed from your packet so or I'm, not. So I have the one that was provided to me. I'm, um, I wouldn't say happy. I will oblige a reading of the proper one if this is not the right one. <laughs> the, 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 I can Madam clarify. Secretary. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, in your packets today at the dais, I submitted additional. You had the original ordinance that was published with the agenda. You have a red line version of the modifications that clarify additional detail on the ordinance. And then you have the final version of the revised version in your blue dais folders. Can, can somebody tell me which one I'm supposed to read here? You read, the title that you read is correct. Okay. The only changes that were um, amended on the red line version were just clarification points to um, further provide additional detail to the ordinance. I accept whatever the most recent version of the text is, and if the city attorney would like to tell me what to say, I would happily add that. I would simply um, reference that your motion uh, is intended to address um, the, uh, the corrected version um, as explained by staff, uh, the correct version of the ordinance. So moved. Um, Mr. Dowd, do you accept that amendment to the motion? Thank you. So apparently Mr. Dowd is our seconder, not Mr. Rogers. Okay, uh, we have a motion and a second. Are there any other comments or questions? Seeing none, your votes please. And that passes with six ayes with council member Tibbet recused or abstaining, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Mr. McGlynn, item 16.4. 16.4, public hearing, Journey ends, Journey's End Mobile Home Relocation Impact Report, PRJ19-040, Claire Hartman, Deputy Director, presenting. All right, uh, good evening. The item before you tonight is a request to approve a uh, relocation impact report for the Journeys End Mobile Home Park. And this is in compliance and prepared in compliance with our Santa Rosa City Code 20-28.100 subsection J. And I'll talk about that ordinance in just a moment. So the subject site that's before you tonight associated with this relocation impact report is Journeys End Mobile Home Park. It's at the northern end of the city, in fact, that's how it got its name. It, in 1958, when it was created, it was the northern end of the city of Santa Rosa and uh, the end of a old stagecoach line. And so that is the name of the park. As we all know um, all too well, uh, the city and surrounding area suffered a tremendous series of fires, um, which damaged and destroyed many residential structures. Um, all types of structures, including um, and very specifically three mobile home parks in the city of Santa Rosa, the worst of which was hit was Journey's End. 
Um, Journey's End suffered a 73% loss of the park, uh, which were totally destroyed. And then the remaining units um, were without infrastructure and had other issues relating to the, to the site. In total, the mobile home park had 160 units or coaches uh, and one manager's unit. This is uh, the location of the mobile home park in relationship to the Tubbs fire in 2017. And as you can see, it's surrounded and it's in an urban area. And this is a closer lo look at the park post fire. So as you can see, many of the coaches were destroyed completely and as you can see, some were remaining. So in direct response to the fires, immediately after the city passed a resilient city combining district ordinance. Um, this was to provide immediate relief to um, and uh, expedite rebuilding of the area. Uh, one thing that what wasn't anticipated was what to do with a mobile home park under this circumstance, which has um, a number of state laws uh, and we have local ordinance, um, chapter 667 and the city code that has very protective deliberate measures for what you do with a mobile home park should uh, the owner wish to, to close the park. Obviously unprecedented and unanticipated that you have total dispersal of the community upon which you're supposed to negotiate, provide notice um, and um, provide adequate mitigation for relocating um, residents. So, um, so I think I skipped this too quickly. So um, it was uh, last October where we realized we really couldn't use that um, standard ordinance for processing mobile home parks, but the city passed an alternative version of that that reflected the unique um, circumstance of having this dispersed community and working with them. Um, the amended process still provides for notification and public review, um, but it does clarify how do you connect with a displaced community. The um, purpose of the relocation impact report is to address the fact that it is, the park would be closing and that there would be uh, mitigation through the form of conditions of, a, of the conversion that would address the impact of the, um, to those residents of for relocating. Uh, the process includes a series of notifications, notice of application, uh, notice of informational meeting with a copy of the relocation report. Uh, uh, part of the process is to hold an informational meeting which was held last December. Um, and we had about 20 uh, residents attend that. Many of them are very far displaced, so it's really important that this notification doesn't just include these meetings, these are in addition, but um, really reaching out to wherever they have relocated to and making sure they're part of the process. And of course, notice notification, standard notification of uh, this tonight's public hearing. So the key finding that the council has to make to approve the report is that the mitigation measures as proposed um, following an analysis uh, represent the cost of relocation, um, that the uh, summary includes a, a comparable housing study of, of uh, housing that is available within reasonable proximity, comparable housing within reasonable proximity to the city, and that uh, an, an acknowledgement of significant higher costs of other types of housing in the immediate area. The ordinance has a series of report requirements. Uh, the report before you has met all of those requirements, otherwise we wouldn't be here tonight. Um, so it includes the status of, and there's a variety of different statuses of resident types. As you can imagine, some own their own coaches, some rented coaches from people who own those coaches that were offsite. Um, some of the coaches were owned by the park owner himself. There was a manager's unit. So there's a variety of different circumstances and all that has to get vetted through this report. And there is a subset that is specifically addressed in this report and I'll talk about that. Uh, the determinations and conditions, it's a balancing. Uh, the report, the mitigation must address uh, 
a mobile homeowner's ability to find adequate housing and it's balanced with, it has to be a reasonable cost of location, but also can keep in mind what other resources have been available to support the, the resident finding, um, being able to relocate. So other resources can be considered. And the ordinance provides some examples, but uh, examples include uh, various forms of payment, uh, setting aside, if you redevelop the park site into some new housing, um, setting aside of affordable units for those that are replaced or displaced, I'm sorry. Um, and then uh, also just vari var variations through the form of a direct agreement with the park owner and the resident. So 160 homes, one manager's unit. The subject report that you're acting on tonight addresses specifically 88 owners. So a, um, a little bit over half of those coaches. And these are coaches where the, the homes were directly impacted. The residents own their own homes. These were the homes that were totally destroyed. And they also represent those that have not entered into an agreement already with the park owner. So 88 units, is that's what you're acting on tonight. Oops. The mitigation as proposed is in the form of a payment. Uh, the, there's analysis in the report, so essentially it was um, uh, surmised uh, to equal about six months average rent space plus one uh, month security department deposit, I'm going to security deposit, so $4,500 per household. Um, but in addition, um, in recognition of it's been two years and there's been a lot of efforts uh, across a lot of different resource groups and including the park owner in terms of other um, assistance. So for example, rent and utilities forgiven by the park owner immediately after the fire, insurance proceeds, benefits. And in addition, the um, landowner park owner is granting priority status to those residents that will qualify for the new affordable housing should there be new affordable housing developed on the site. So that's what the mitigation you would be acting on tonight. That's the package. Uh, the, this, is a, this is a summary description of those that aren't specifically subject to this report, but it doesn't mean there hasn't been assistance provided to them. It's just that they're not, they didn't fall into that last threshold that needs this report accomplished to move on. So 24 of the units resided in mobile homes that were destroyed by the fire, but they were not subject to this report. They're subject to standard landlord-tenant law. There's 44 households whose mobile homes were not destroyed. Those were more complicated, not destroyed, still on the site, still had issues in terms of being able to locate them. Um, they did enter into agreements with the park owner, so that's why they're not subject to this report because they've been addressed in other ways. And then four of the homes in the manager unit was under the park ownership itself, so that is why it's not subject to the report. So with that, uh, the report before you is uh, not a project, not, not a project per CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act. It's also a common sense exemption passes for this action. And tonight you have recommendation to approve the mobile home park relocation impact report. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for the presentation, Claire. Uh, council, questions? Seeing none. Uh, this is a public, oh, Mr. Dowd. Um, my, my concern is that I drive by that uh, former Journey's End mobile home park and it's been cleaned up except I, I don't count the number, but there's still 10, 15 uh, or so mobile homes still sitting on the site. And I've never been able to figure out whether those owners of those are uh, were maybe the park owners, or whether those people uh, have lost or have been unable to get their mo motor homes out of that area. Does anybody have an answer for that? Well, we do have an applicant representative here tonight. Um, they can give a status, but part, as mentioned, um, there were homes that uh, were not destroyed, but were deemed uninhabitable since there's no infrastructure that, is, that they can use on the site. And then uh, many of them were found to be not in a quality that would survive a move. So that is, 
So the, and part of this process is to go through this entire process and to a point where they can move on, they can clear the site and move on with the next phase of Journey's End. And certainly I want to see that happen. I'm just concerned about the people whose, whose might have been their motor homes, this $4,500 or whatever, is that enough money for them to look for additional housing for themselves in this region or are they uh, part of our homeless problem now? I guess it's my, kind of my concern. So the report before you tonight is just the 88 that lost their homes entirely. Um, the, um, so the 44, the 44 households, coaches that were not destroyed, they entered into agreements um, with the park owner already. Okay. Okay, any additional questions from council? Okay, this is a public hearing, so I'll open the public hearing. We do have a couple of cards here. Is Kendall Jarvis still here? Okay. Uh, Virginia Twofold, followed by Michelle Trammell. Is Virginia here? All righty. Uh, Michelle, are you here? Michelle Trammell? How about a Jeffrey Hoffman? Scored, uh, followed by Linda Adrian. Uh, goodness. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, and members of the council. I'm Jeffrey Hoffman. I'm the directing attorney of the Santa Rosa Office of California Rural Legal Assistance. And um, I'm here on behalf of CRLA and our clients to voice our uh, support for the relocation impact report. Uh, I can just say a few things. Um, since the early uh, weeks after the fires in 2017, <clears throat> CRLA along with uh, Legal Aid of Sonoma County and the Suzy Foundation have been working to assist the residents, uh, the Journeys End residents. Uh, and uh, we've also worked uh, along with Burbank Housing um, to try to, in the process of coming up to a solution for what's going to happen, this was a, a real tragedy and kind of an unprecedented situation and how that could be addressed. Uh, and so uh, um, it really was a long, uh, it's been a long process and I think that uh, Burbank Housing has made a diligent effort to uh, look for ways of providing uh, assistance and has actually provided assistance to the residents. Um, and I think that's addressed in the report. Uh, there are various ways that uh, there was work done, including finding a temporary apartments, getting FEMA benefits, uh, helping with insurance, um, which our office in legal aid has helped on, um, along with all the other benefits that were available post-fire. Um, Again, it's, it's been a long process, but it's time now, I think, to move this to the next, uh, to the next step. And we're, we're very encouraged that there's plans for affordable housing on the site, hopefully for very low income folks, and that that'll help to replace the affordable units that were lost, you know, when the, the park was destroyed. So again, we offer our, uh, our support for the relocation impact report. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Adrian, followed by Ramsey Sado. Uh, Ramsey, are you ready to go? Yeah. Sure. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Ramsey Shuido. My family has owned and operated the Journey Zen Mobile Home Park for more than 50 years. Since its opening, the park has provided a source of affordable housing in Santa Rosa and offered welcoming community for senior for our senior residents. Unfortunately, the 2017 Tubbs fire changed everything for our closely knit community. It took the life of two of our beloved residents and it destroyed the park and its infrastructure, leaving our family with a difficult decision on how best to move forward. 
The qualities of affordability and community are important to me and my family, and we continue to, and it continues to guide our decisions. We understand this has been an extremely difficult process for our residents, and that the park provided a vital source of affordable housing in the community. It has been important to us that we assist our residents as much as possible, and since the fire, we have partnered with numerous service providers, including California Rural Legal Assistance, uh, Legal Aid Sonoma County, the Tzu Chi Foundation, and Burbank Housing, all of whom are here today, at least I believe they are, I see most of them, uh, to help ensure that prior residents have access to the resources that they need. Through our work with Tzu Chi, we know that the majority of the prior residents have been permanently rehoused and have received assistance from numerous, numerous public and private sources, including FEMA and insurance. Those statistics and benefits are summarized in the report for you. We've also been able to assist those households whose coaches remain standing. You had asked about the 44 homes that are still left there. Uh, by providing them with housing assistance payments to, e to help ease their recovery process. And the council's action tonight will enable us to move forward to the next step with providing housing assistance payments to the remaining households whose coaches were destroyed. The assistance offered residents, which I want to clarify is also being offered to the 24 former residents who rented mobile homes from, directly from the park, so not just if they owned their mobile home, we're offering the same uh, assistance to those 24, home, uh, 24 residents is equivalent to approximately six months average space rent plus one month security deposit in the park and is in addition to the rent and utilities forgiven immediately following the wildfires as well as the insurance proceeds and other benefits prior residents have received over the past two years. We ask that the council support the proposal to close the park such that we can assist the remaining residents and also further the process to re-envision the property in a way that will hopefully restore not only the affordable homes lost, but also help address the community's larger housing shortage. <clears throat> I'm joined here tonight by Karen Tiedemann, an expert in mobile home closure law, as well as others familiar with the assistance that has been provided to the residents. We're happy to any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Linda. Okay, um, I'm probably gonna get emotional because I just, you know, I'm one of the 88 that lost their home and I just, it just, it just is. Um, I'm also president of the Santa Rosa Manufactured Homeowners Association. And I mentioned that in perspective because Ramsey and his family is, is unique in the ownership of mobile home parks because normally they're owned by corporations or companies that only consider residents dollar signs. And he has never done that. I remember, because I've lived there for like 25 years, and he always was a friend of the residents. You know, he, he uh, his family, you know, they took care of us. We were people to them, which I thought was very helpful. He's been, he's tried to work with us as much as possible. And I do think you should support this. Uh, one thing I will mention, I wish Burbank Housing would hurry up and build the apartments on, on the new, um, on the land, because I'd like to get into one. But I just wanted to mention how good he's been. If we lived anywhere else, we would have all been on the street. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Linda. This is a public hearing. You don't have to fill out a card if you'd like to address the council on this item. Is there anyone who'd like to address us? Yes, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. 25 years ago, a group of concerned citizens worked to save the Journey's End Mobile Home Park from being destroyed for a Home Depot store. I met Miss Adrian back then. I met many people from Journey's End. I already knew people there. I had friends there. I'm glad this is going forward. There have been many people in the community concerned about what occurred to those folks who had to move. Apparently there's 44 mobile homes still there on site. 
not burned. I was reassured tonight by the owner of the park, Ramsey, that he's willing to donate those mobile homes. And that's one thing that could be helpful. Mr. Dowd had mentioned his concerns about what's occurring in the homeless situation. This is perhaps a chance where the city could collaborate with the county and those mobile homes could find another spot. It's something that should be at least explored because he mentioned to me that he feels some people cut through the wire fencing there and actually go in and stay in those mobile homes. So if it's good enough for people to come into now and stay, if they can be moved, it'd be much less expensive than buying houses out in the community, especially if he's donating them. I hope that you folks will look into that. I'm here to also support this approach that's being taken by Burbank Housing. I see that Mr. Carrillo, the former supervisor from the district that I'm in, is here as a representative for Burbank Housing. I believe he probably wants to solve this problem and get the housing built there as soon as possible. The best way for that to happen is if you approve this, and you also put on one of those stipulations you like to do that says, let's get it done as soon as possible. Let's explore donating those units there. He's, Mr. Ramsey has said that he meant the ones that he owns, but apparently all of them might be up for play in a sense. This is the time, it could be quite helpful. I hope you'll look into it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council on this item? See no one raising, I will close the public hearing. Bring it back to council. Any additional questions based on any of those comments for staff? Mr. Tibbetts. I, I just want to um, say thank you to, to staff for for bringing this forward and I think echo the sentiments that was made by um, Mr. Hoffman, Dwayne and Linda, which is time is of the essence. And I hope that, you know, I applaud the planning department on how how much you, you try to get things through the hopper as quickly as possible. But I think that this project is of the utmost importance given its significance to the community and the fact that we're gonna be, we're about what, two and a half years out almost from when it went down, and I know a lot of that's outside of our control, but I hope we can just go, go, go. Mr. Rogers, you have this item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and I wanted to start off by just acknowledging kind of how sad this, this item is. Uh, in a lot of ways, I, I know that in every community, but in particular in Santa Rosa, mobile home parks are the last bastion of affordable housing for seniors, and it weighs heavy on us that we have to close one of those homes. Uh, I do want to thank Burbank Housing and folks who have been engaged in this process to take care of the residents that were there, as well as offering them a first right of refusal to come back because it is a community, and I know many of them are anxious to do that. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that this is one of those mile markers that we talked about not too long ago in recovery, that, that this is uh, something that the community has been uh, watching, supporting, and I know going forward, they're gonna to continue to do so to make sure that our residents are taken care of uh, and that they do find a place to, to, to be. So with that, I will move the resolution of the council of the city of Santa Rosa, approving the Journey's End Mobile Home Park Relocation Impact Report, prepared in accordance with city code section 20-28.100.J, file number PRJ19-040 and waive for the reading of the text. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional comments? I just wanted to make a, uh, a couple and just show my appreciation to Burbank Housing. We have some reps here who are working towards this, specifically uh, Kendall from Legal Aid who uh, is not here and Howard from Suchi. Um, the work that I've been doing with uh, the Rock Sonoma County, uh, Kendall and Howard's name comes up regularly. I know the the benefit behind the scenes that you, you and Kendall are doing to support the folks from Journeys In along with the whole team and Ramsey, same thing for you. It, it has been um, you know, a very tragic situation that people have really stepped up, uh, neighbors helping neighbors. So really, I thank you for all your efforts, and I think this is our next step for what well, eventually we're going to see this wonderful project. Uh, Efren, as soon as you leave here, start a building, sticks in the ground, okay? So with that, we have a motion and a second. Your votes, please. And that passes unanimously. Thank you so much.
Okay, we have no written communications, but we do have some cards for public comments on non-agenda items. First up, Pat Mitchell, followed by Alex Krohn. Is Pat here? Pat is not. Alex, you're up. Is it on? Hello? Yep. Oh, is there a timer? There it is. Okay, thank you, council members, mayor, vice mayor. I'm here, I don't know, hopefully it's worth my while spending this much time here. The last study session we had on December 10th on the current deployment status of small cells on PG&E and city light poles, we talked about all the deployments, right? The, the, the maps and everything. We forgot to mention the seven that AT&T is now getting permits for on pg e poles. How come those weren't brought up? And I'm wondering, did you guys know about those seven poles? Um, I think four out of the seven were permitted on 1120, a couple weeks before. One was permitted two days after the council meeting and then six days after the council meeting. Um, most of them are in residential zones. I talked to Gabe, Gabe is a great guy. And I know, uh, you know, he's, he's doing his job. But why weren't those brought up? Did you guys know about those? He talked about the, the five sample ones they're gonna do on the light poles, but never mentioned those. So anyways, Gabe told me that AT&T supposedly submitted that they had notified people and he asked me, I told him that I'm gonna go let people know because I feel like I have the duty to do that. I, I need to do that. And no one has been notified so far. I went to the one on College Avenue 2328, it's someone's address who has kids. They weren't notified. Um, the one on Buena Vista, there's a cotting that lives right there. She didn't know about it. Um, there's one right on the JC on uh, uh, Emer Emeritus and Elliot on a PG new pool right there, right in front of student housing. So anyways, um, that hopefully we can get a code passed I know that was kind of your direction to, to staff. There seems to be some, what of a disconnect between the city staff and the council. And, and there were, everybody from the community who spoke were opposed to these. There were 30 plus people at, at the study session. The two that spoke in favor of them were Verizon employees. They had an engineer who shares an attorney with Verizon come talk about health. I hope you guys heard what he said that his standard was 70 years old and it was based on them cranking up RF and having primates be averted from food. And then they set it five times lower than that and call it good. We had doctors here tell you at the cellular level what's happening to our, what's happening to people from RF exposure. The smoke is gonna clear and we're gonna see the truth of this very soon. And don't be stuck with these things all over next to homes, please. So let's get a, a code passed. Other cities have done it. You can make it a discretionary issue. You can zone out of residential zones and not allow them there. It's been a year and a half. These were supposed to be on pause and now more are being permitted out. So anyways. Thank you. Okay, no other items on the agenda. Meeting adjourned.